Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. Each week at this time, the Kraft Cheese Company presents for your enjoyment, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Evanson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But right now, here's a message of very great importance for today's menu makers. I don't know how much you housewives actually know about modern margarine, but there's probably been no time in the history of America when it was so important for you to have the true facts about nourishing wholesome foods for your family. So I want to tell you about Parquet. Parquet is the new quality margarine made by Kraft, a delicious spread for bread, hot rolls, and toast. Now, of course, the fact that parquet does taste so good probably accounts for its popularity as a spread in millions of homes. But this is even more important. Parquet margarine is a protective food with exceptionally high nutritional value. It is one of the best energy foods you can serve and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. There are 9,000 units of this vitamin in every pound of parquet. So tomorrow, ask your food dealer for a pound of parquet margarine made by Kraft. The whole family will like it because it tastes so good. And you'll know that you're giving them an economical, highly nutritious food made to the craft standards of quality. Just say Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now for the adventures of the great Gildersleeve. Wistful Vista. You say Wist- this is... Oh, Wistful Vista, where Pippa McGee and Molly live? Yes, madam. Oh, my. Do you think I'll be able to see them from the train window? No, lady. The McGees are on their vacation. Oh. But say, there's a next-door neighbor of theirs, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Where? Where? That portly gent with the mustache on the platform, the one making a speech to his employees. How do you know they're his employees? Because every time he goes away, he gives them an hour off to come down to the station and wave goodbye. Oh, so that's Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, I never thought... And furthermore, I can't tell you how touched I am to see all the employees of the Gildersleeve Girdle Works down here at the station to bid me goodbye. (laughs) It's indeed... Uh, by the way, is there only one left at the plant? Uh, well, uh, no. What if some orders come in? Who'll take the phone calls? Uh, Mert. Oh, Mert, eh? <laughs> yeah. As I was saying while I'm away, I expect every one of you to uphold Gildersleeve girdles to the best of your ability. And don't forget our motto. If you want the best of corsets, of course it's Gildersleeve. <laughs> Very good, T.P., Very good. Thank you. Thank you. You'll get a raise. <laughs> and though it's necessary for me to go away and attend to other enterprises, the one thing closest to my heart is the Gildersleeve girdle. How long will you be gone, T.P.? At least three days and maybe till the end of the week. <laughs> uh, before you go, T.P., the Gildersleeve Girdle Workers Guild wishes to present you with this handsome leather briefcase as a token of our esteem for you. Yeah. Yeah. Me? I don't know what to say oh, except... Yes, all aboard? Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Out of my way, everybody. Where are my bags? On the train, T.P. Thanks. I forgot to buy a ticket. Where do I buy a ticket? On the train, T.P. Oh, yes. Let go of me, boys. Where are you pushing me? On the train, T.P. Goodbye, children. Goodbye, children. your ticket, Mr. Gildersleeve. Sorry I haven't any berths left. Uh, couldn't you squeeze me in somewhere? I'll try, though it'll probably be a tight squeeze. <laughs> yeah, tight squeeze. <laughs> Side splitting, isn't it? Going to be in Summerfield long? Oh, no, just three or four days. I'm taking over the administration of my brother-in-law's estate. They're going to run it for my niece and nephew. Yeah, but that's quite involved, and I'm hungry. Which way is the diner? Why, an old, experienced traveler like you should know where the diner is. Huh? Oh, of course. No matter where you are, the diner's always at the other end of the train. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Uh, 
Excuse me, madam. <laughs> Yes, pretty crowded in this diner. By George, I'm so hungry I could eat the waiter. <laughs> yes, sir. Is it all right if I sit at this table? Uh, yes, sir. Sit right down, sir. If this gentleman doesn't mind reading his paper on his own side. I said if this gentleman doesn't mind reading his paper on his own side. Uh, excuse me, sir. Does you mind? Yes, I do. I'm particular whom I eat with. <laughs> you are, eh? Well, I'm not. I'm hungry. Waiter, bring me a steak. A nice, juicy, double tenderloin rare. Waiter, where's my milk toast? I ordered it 15 minutes ago. Yeah. I'm sorry, but milk toast takes time, you know. And, waiter, I want a big, heaping plate of French fries. Yeah, French fries. And a cup of strong coffee with lots of cream. Yeah, I'll get it right away. Sir. And bring me my milk toast made with gluten bread, remember? Yes. Bread. Oh, that reminds me. Some hot biscuits and a little pot of jam. Gluten bread toasted and a cup of hot water. Uh, and then apple pie a la mode with cheese. Yeah, with cheese. Yeah. I can't stand this. Listening to you is giving me heartburn. <laughs> yeah. It is, huh? A uh, waiter. Uh, don't forget the steak sauce, ketchup, piccalilli, and relish. Bring me a glass of bicarbonate of soda, quick. <laughs> yes, sir. Right away, sir. I'll be back. Of course, it's none of my business, mister. And don't stick your nose in it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. That's the way you feel about it. I was just going to tell you you're getting your newspaper in the mustard. I don't use mustard. No, I guess you don't need any. <laughs> but what I was going to say was... Never mind, never mind, never mind. Okay, I won't say it then. That mustard from your newspaper is all over your sleeve now. I don't care. What? Of all the messes I... Uh, 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 water only spreads it. <laughs> you see what they tell you? I'll thank you to mind your own business. What's the big idea of jumping down my throat? What do you expect addressing a perfect stranger? You're far from perfect, stranger. <laughs> From now on, I'm going to make a career out of ignoring you. Uh, here comes my food. That's pretty snappy service, waiter. Uh, yes, sir. Well, where's my milk toast? Yeah, I'm sorry, sir, but the chef, he's all out of glutton bread. <laughs> he wants to know, would pumpernickel do just as well? No, pumpernickel wouldn't do just as well. And why keep me waiting all the time while you serve this big buffalo the minute he sits down? Huh? No, look here, mister. I don't want to look here. I'm sick of the sight of you. The idea. An overstuffed ox like you, guttling and gobbling and gorging yourself like an ostrich. <laughs> I've got a bad case of indigestion already just from looking at you. Why, you dyspeptic little dodo. Just because you're mean to your stomach and your stomach talks back to you, you bellyache. Excuse the expression. <laughs> you're not suffering from indigestion. You're just green with Epicurean envy. I won't sit here. Uh, here's your bicarbonate of soda, mister. Take it away. Take it away. I need something stronger than that now. I've got some pills down here in my briefcase. Just a minute there. What are you doing with my briefcase? Your briefcase? This is mine. It is not. My employees gave it to me just this afternoon. Take your fat paws off of my briefcase before I... Before you watch, you dried up little crab apple. <laughs> Now, now, wait a minute, gentlemen, please. Let go of my briefcase. I will not. It's mine. All right, the idea is... Oh, yes, ma'am. Waiter. Waiter. Did you see anything of my briefcase? I left it... Oh, you gentlemen have it. Thank you so much. Well... Mr. Gildersleeve, I've located a berth for you at last. Oh, that's fine, Conductor. I was getting tired of sitting around here in my pajamas. Where is it? It's uh, upper nine in the next car. Upper nine? Oh, my goodness. The last time I was in an upper berth was, uh, let me see, uh, 50 pounds ago. <laughs> the porter's making it up for you now. Yeah, thanks. I do hope that porter gives me a wide berth. Uh, 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 it's a dark in here. Oh, uh, Porter? Uh, Porter? Quiet! Yes. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Must be sleeping. Oh, Porter? Yeah, sir. Have you got up or nine ready yet? Yes, but I didn't anticipate no gentlemen of such ample proportions. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I'd better take a ladder. Yes, I'd better take two. They're small. <laughs> well, all right. Come on. Yeah, uh, here we are, right up there, sir. Up there? Mm. Oh, my goodness. Hold these ladders steady, Porter. Remember, if they tip, I won't. 
Yeah, sir. Now, be careful, mister. Train is coming to a sharp quiet pretty soon. When? Then. Oh! Hold on, mister. Let us slide. I can't hold on. I'm coming down. Look out below. Oh! No! What hit me? Oh, my sacrilege. <laughs> Yeah, miss, uh, let me help you up. I don't want to get up. I want to sleep. Not you, miss. The man in Dapa. He's now in the lower. And where am I? You're right here, brother. Get off of my poor stomach. Who is it? Uh? Oh, it's you. What are you doing sneaking into my berth? I'm not sneaking into your... <laughs> I'm not sneaking. I'm trying to climb into bed. I'm your upstairs neighbor. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I hope that swinging shelf snaps shut on you. Oh, yeah. If it's going to swing, I'll see that it swings your way. And if I land on you again, brother, you'll spend the rest of the night sleeping in the road bed. Oh, quiet. Let me go to sleep. Okay, Grandpa. Unpleasant dreams. All right, Porter. Give me a leg up again, will you? Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-three. Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-four. Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-five. Oh, my goodness. Two o'clock already and still not a wink. Yes, thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-six. Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-eight. Oh, what's the use? There was only some way of stopping that buzzsaw down there. I can't stand this any longer. Where's that porter? I'll fix this guy. Did you call me, sir? Uh, yes. Would you mind getting me a drink of ice water? I can't sleep. Uh, yeah, sir. Yeah. Here's the water, mister. Uh, thank you. You needn't wait. <laughs> good night, good night, good night. Uh, good night, sir. Yes. Now, if I can hold this cup in this hand and open the lower curtain with it. Ah, uh, I've got it. Yeah. Steady now, Gildersleeve. Ready. Aim. <laughs> oh, no. What, what was that? Porter. Porter. <laughs> Shut this window, will you? It's raining right in on my face. Quiet! Can a man get any rest around here? <laughs> Good morning, sir. He's just pulling into Summerfield. You want me to brush you off? No, I'll walk down the steps like the rest of the passengers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Porter, you've given me such good service. Here's an order for a gilded sleeve girdle for your wife. Uh, thank you, sir. I happen to be a spinster at the moment. <laughs> but if it's all right with you, I'll put in my hope chair. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that's perfectly all right. Uh, Summerfield, eh? By George, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing Marjorie and little Leroy again. Why can't I, Marjorie? Huh? Why can't I call them T.P. like they do down at this foundry? It isn't a foundry, Leroy. It's a... Oh, never mind. It's nothing that concerns little boys. And I'm sure that he will prefer to have you call him Uncle Throckmorton. Oh, shucks. You can't go around calling a big, tough guy who runs a steel foundry Throckmorton. It's positively derogatory. It's derogatory. Yes, that too. <laughs> Leroy, 
Who told you Uncle Throckmorton was in the seal business? Ah, you thought you were so smart. I saw one of his letterheads. The Gildersleeve Girder Company. Hmm? <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. The Gildersleeve Girder Company. See, he shall be here by now, shouldn't he, Marjorie? Now, don't you worry, Leroy. Just as soon as his train arrives, Mr. Wills will bring him here for breakfast. Oh, I wanted to go down to the station, too. I know, but Ted has to discuss all the legal details with Uncle Throckmorton before we go to court. Say, you're getting pretty darn stuck on that Ted guy, aren't you? Why, Leroy Forrester, I am not. Ted Wills is nearly our lawyer. He is not. Williams and Williams, Willies and Wills are our lawyers, and Ted's nothing but the tail end. <laughs> Well, he's young yet. You just give him time. Oh, there you go. Who oh, say, how's if I should call him Uncle Morton? Call who? Oh, Uncle Throckmorton. Well, I don't think he'd object to that. Wait, I can do better than that. How's this? Uncle Mort. Who's that? Uncle Mort. I'll answer it. Well, 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 I'll bet this is little Leroy. Hi, Uncle Mort. If I who? You, Uncle Mort. You don't mind if I call you Uncle Mort, do you, Uncle Mort? <laughs> no, not at all. Go right ahead. Uncle Mort, eh? <laughs> I like that. And this is Marjorie, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Marjorie, eh? Uh, come here, my dear. <laughs> my, how you've grown. <laughs> Hello, Uncle Throckmorton. Let me take your hat and coat. Will you have some breakfast? Uh, no, thanks. I've already had mine on the... Well, I'll have a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> sit right here, Uncle. Ted, you sit over there. Oh, thanks. My, this looks wonderful. Hey, Uncle, will you take me back to Wistful Vista with you and let me work in your factory? Uh, what? Well, I didn't think you'd be interested in that sort of thing. Now, Leroy... Gee, I am, Uncle Mort. That must be some layout. I bet you make the supports for a lot of big projects there. <laughs> Uh, uh, we don't turn out anything much like uh, We sort of confine ourselves to uh, foundations oh. uh, Say, I'd like to go along sometime when you install some of those foundations I don't have the... <laughs> what, what did you say, young man? Oh, uh, please excuse Leroy, Uncle Mort He's been like that ever since he found out that you owned the Gildersleeve... Girder Company. What? Uh, Gildersleeve Girder? Yes. Oh, oh, yes, I see it all now. <laughs> yes, a bright boy. <laughs> Gee, Unc, Unc, do you ever have to slug it out with any of them tough steel workers of yours? Uh, no, no, I never do. You don't, huh? Uh, oh, well, of course, uh, there have been times when I've had to put uh, more snap into their work. <laughs> Yes. Once I was so angry, I picked up a badly made uh, foundation and bounced it right off the foreman's head. <laughs> you did? Yes. Oh. Now, Leroy, let uh, your uncle eat his breakfast. Yes. Have some toast, Uncle Mort? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, uh, speaking of toast reminds me of an amusing incident on the train last night. Uh, you'll enjoy this, Leroy. When I went into the diner, the only empty chair was at a table with a sour little crab. And you should have heard that little rat yell when the ice water hit him in the face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it's time we leave for court, Mr. Gildersleeve. It is? Uh, come on, kids. This won't take long. Well, all I can say is we run things better than this in Whistful Vista. Eleven o'clock and the judge hasn't even shown up yet. Judge Hooker's usually very prompt. Yes, the trouble with some of these judges is they think they're little tin gods. Take those black robes away from them and what have they got? Bow legs. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's a hot one, Uncle Moore. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. Everyone rise, please. Ah, at last. Superior Court, Department 25, the Uncle Hitter, they took a judge for signing is now in session. Be seated. Sit down, Uncle Moore. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Who's that man sitting in the judge's chair? Why, that's Judge Hooker. Judge Hooker? That's the man in the lower berth. <laughs> Gildersleeve for appointment as of State of Ray Forrester. Oh, that's us. Come on, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm not feeling very well, Ted. <laughs> uh, couldn't we postpone this over to another judge? Oh, come on, Uncle Mort. Remember what you said. This guy will be a pushover. Yes, a pushover. Oh, come on, come on. Step up. Don't dawdle. I am 
haven't got all day. Make a snappy, folks. The judge is pretty short temper this morning. He didn't get any sleep last night. Oh, my. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, with your permission, I'll put Mr. Gildersleeve on the stand first. Go ahead, Mr. Wills. Swear in the witness, Beth. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you? I do. (laughs) Well, do you or don't you speak up? I do. That voice is very familiar. (laughs) Turn around, Mr. Oh, so it's you. Yes. Uh, Hello, Judge. (laughs) Mr. Wills. Yes, Your Honor. I will examine this man's qualifications if you don't mind. I don't, Your Honor. But I do. Silence. <laughs> now then, Gildersleeve, what do you do for a living? I make girdles, Your Honor. <laughs> Order in the court. Order in the court. Yes. Order in the court. Order. Order. And you, Gildersleeve, any more cheap humor and I'll judge you in contempt. But it's true, Your Honor. I'm the president of the Gildersleeve Girdle Company. Oh! Truth. He doesn't make girdles, Judge. And yeah, what does he do? Steal foundations. I bet he would, too. <laughs> now, no more interruptions, my boy. Remember, this is a courtroom. You realize who I am, of course. Sure, you're a bow legged little tin god. Yeah. What? Oh, Leroy. But, but you just said so yourself, Uncle Morris. Oh, you did. Uh, just a little joke, Your Honor. You know how I kid. Uh, I know. Uh. Well, I'm going to ask you a plain question, and I want a plain answer. Uh, what business are you in? Well, I... Uh, oh, uh, that is... Uh, Leroy, would you mind going out into the hall and get me some uh, some ice water? One moment. Who's running this court? You or I? Better not get Uncle Mort mad, Judge. Last night he threw a whole bucket of water on a guy in the bus under him. Oh, my. Here we go again. <laughs> he did, did he? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you ought to hear Uncle Mort tell him. <laughs> Thanks, I will. Let's hear all about it, Uncle Mort. What, Judge Hooker? It's after five o'clock. This poor man's been on the witness stand all day. All right, and... all right. One more question, then I'll hand down my decision. Mr. Gildersleeve... What makes you think that you have executive ability? Well, I have a large staff of my own, and through years of experience, I know the proper relationship between employer and employee. Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Wells? Our firm has thoroughly investigated Mr. Gildersleeve, and we're satisfied as to his qualifications. Uh Mr. Wells, I have great respect for you and your associates. That is probably the only reason why I'm going to grant your petition. However, in order to protect these children from their own misguided enthusiasm, I'm going to require this Gildersleeve to report to me every single week. Uh, But, Your Honor... He must get an okay for every cent that he spends. But, Judge... And I will require him to post a bond of $50,000 in cash. Now, see here, Hooker. (laughs) I won't stand for this. I'll resign. Quiet. Gildersleeve, I never sent for you. You came here begging for this job. To quote from Brawby versus Union Buggy Corporation, Civil Code of Nebraska, you've made your bed and you can't lie out of it. But my business in Wistful Vista. You remain here and make this estate pay or go to jail for contempt. Now, wait a minute. I'm not good. Court is adjourned. I'll kill that old goat. (laughs) Ted, we've got to do something about this. Do you realize that a $50,000 bond would not only take every cent of my ready cash, but also means a mortgage on my Gordel Works? Uh, Gee, I'm sorry about how the whole thing went, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, maybe if we went into the judge's chambers, we could persuade him to lower the bond, Uncle Moore. Sure, just let me talk to him. Young man, you've talked enough for one day. Well, how about it, Ted? Well, it won't hurt to try. Come on. Yeah. Come in. Uh, excuse us, Judge Hooker. Uh, you remember me, don't you? <laughs> I, I thought perhaps maybe we could possibly get that little cash bond reduced. I don't see why I should have... If you spoke to somebody who'd known me for a long time, they might convince you that I'm not such a bad fellow. <laughs> oh, that would be fine, Uncle Moore. Yeah. Who could the judge talk to? Why, uh, the president of the Whistle Vista Chamber of Commerce. He's my next-door neighbor, too. That chap named Fibber McGee. We can call him long distance, Your Honor. <laughs> Yes, yes, I see, Mr. McGee. 
Yes, I'm glad you put me straight on that. Yes, I knew my little chum would set me in right. That's a very good point. Leroy, I want you to meet McGee one of these days. There's one of nature's noblemen. I guess you've made up my mind for me, Fibber. Yeah, Fibber. <laughs> Hold the phone a second, and I'll tell him. Gildersleeve. Uh, yes, Judge? Gildersleeve, I've decided to rescind that $50,000 bond. Uh, I knew that would happen if you spoke to my little pal. Yes, after talking to McGee, I'm going to make that bond $100,000. What? Give me that telephone. Hello? You're a hard man, McGee. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. While Uncle Throck recovers from that one, I want to say a word that I believe will make every thinking housewife want to try parquet margarine tomorrow. This delicious new craft product is most popular as a spread for bread and a seasoning for hot cooked foods because of its delicate, pleasing flavor. But the same qualities that make it so good for table use make it an extra fine shortening for baking. I say extra fine because it has all the qualities of an ordinary shortening plus fine flavor and added nourishment. Let me read you a statement from Mrs. Lillian Watts, who, having been born and raised on a farm, is mighty particular about food. She says, quote, I have a family of eight, and they all like parquet margarine. I use it in various ways, cakes, bread, muffins, biscuits, soup, spreads, and other ways too numerous to mention. Thank you a thousand times for this wonderful product. End of quote. Now that's a mighty enthusiastic statement. But you'll be just as enthusiastic once you have tried parquet. It's so delicious, so nourishing, so grand in every way. Tomorrow, be sure to order parquet, the economical spread made by Kraft. And remember, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. George Leroy, I'm going to show that judge I can run that estate, or my name won't be Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. You bet it won't, Uncle Mort. You won't even have a name. Yeah, no. I'll just have a number. Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Original music on tonight's program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon saying good night for Kraft and reminding you to tune in again next week at the same time to hear the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. Each
this week at this time, the Kraft Cheese Company presents for your enjoyment, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, let me remind you that fall is coming in winter, too. And when chilly winter weather really comes, your family is going to need plenty of wholesome, nourishing energy food. Now, one reliable and economical source of energy is parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Yes, this delicious new margarine called parquet is a protective food of high nutritional value. And to make it even better for you, Kraft adds important vitamin A to parquet margarine's natural goodness. 9,000 units to every single pound. Now, of course, all this wholesome food value wouldn't do much good if your family didn't like parquet margarine. Well, we think they will. Thousands of American families do. Yes, they like parquet margarine's delicate, satisfying flavor for table use, for baking, and for pan frying. Best of all, parquet margarine is economical, yet it's made by Kraft to the same high standards as all Kraft food products. But why not find out for yourself? Yes, why not try a pound or two of wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine tomorrow? Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now for the adventures of the great Gildersleeve. Yes, and now I'll check the grocery bill. Nine and nine is 18, and eight is 28. Uh, no, 26. And seven is, uh, let me see, 33 and five is... Uh, what are you doing, Uncle 33 Moore? and... Uh, oh, now I've lost my place. Sorry, I disturbed you. Yeah, that's all right, Marjorie. I was just checking your household expenses. Part of my job is guardian for you and Leroy, you know. But we never had any trouble with little things like that before. We never had to count a Judge Hooker before either. Why, that dyspeptic little judicial blunder. Oh, now, Uncle Moore. I'll let you get on with your work. Yes. Yes, I'll have to start all over again. Nine and nine is 18, and eight is 28. Uh, no, 26. And seven is... Uh, Excuse and, me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Ham or beef? And seven... Lost it again. Ham or beef what? Filling. What filling? Sandwich filling. What sandwich? That's what I want to know. Ham or beef? Uh, cheese. Yes, sir. Yes. Nine and a cheese sandwich is 18 and... Uh, 26. Well, I got it right the first time. And seven is... Hey, Uncle seven. Morris, supposing I could buy a swell airplane motor cheap, what would you say? Nine and nine is 18. Where am I? Oh, back at the bottom again. But I can, Uncle Morris. I can buy a practically brand new Bumblebee plane motor for $19 from Piggy Banks. It, what are Piggy Banks? They aren't anything. He's my pal. Yeah. And this engine is such a bargain, I'm ashamed to buy it for that price. You needn't be ashamed, Leroy. You're not going to buy it. But Uncle Morris... Young man, you're far too young to take up flying. But this is a minute your plane motor. It says right in my model super duper swooper. You... Uh, oh, a model plane. Well, I forgot you were a flying bug. <laughs> That's a good one, Uncle Mort. Yeah. How's about that $19? Yeah. Now, hold on, Leroy. $19 is a lot of money. Oh, not for this motor, Unc. Piggy never part with it except his plane made an emergency landing into his pop store window. And he wants $19 for the motor? No, he wants $19 for a new window. Yeah. Can I have the dough, Uncle Moore? Well, I'm afraid not, Leroy. That's quite a large sum. And you know I've got to account to Judge Hooker for every penny you children spend. Oh, why can't he keep his nose out of our business? Uh, but that is his business, Leroy, sticking his nose into other people's. And he's got plenty of equipment for the job, too. <laughs> oh, but gee whiz, Uncle Moore. I bet you had a model airplane motor when you were my age. When I was your age, my boy, there were no airplanes. Everybody thought the Wright brothers were wrong. Well, <laughs> well I... I bet you had some hobby. Uh, let me see. What did I have? Oh, yes, yes, I had dynamite. Dynamite? Yes, dynamite was the name of my Shetland pony. Oh. He was my hobby, that little horse. <laughs> I can see him now. Bless his shaggy coat. Well, if, if you could have a big horse, Unc, why can't I have a little motor? Because I earned the money to buy dynamite, my boy. You earned 19 bucks? How'd you do it, huh? Well, uh, selling lobsters. I lived on the East Coast when I was a lad, and I got my spending money out of a string of lobster pots. I never knew lobsters grew in pots. If they, they don't grow there, Leroy. That's how you catch them. I can still remember how hard it was in the winter. Getting up before dawn, rowing five miles, sometimes in a biting gale, just to tend my pots. 
rowing back to market with my boat full of lobsters and my hands full of blisters, then walking five miles to school. Yes. It's wonderful to think what you'll do when you're young and you want a pony. Say, whatever became of that pony? Well, I took dynamite to school one day and he bit the teacher. We didn't have school for a month. <laughs> 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 Gee, instead of a motor, maybe I should get a pony. Yeah? No, I guess not. I'll stick to aviation. There's more of a future in that. Yes. But, Leroy, I said I wasn't going to give you the money. Oh, that's all right, Uncle Mort. I'm going to earn it, just like you did. A splendid idea. <laughs> It'll help build your character, like it did mine. <clears throat> How are you going to do it? Oh, all I got to do is find a job and earn $19. Then would you let me buy Piggy's Bumblebee engine? I'll do better than that, my boy, seeing that you're so ambitious. I'll advance you the money out of my own pocket. You will? Yes, and you can pay me back as you earn it. Oh, gee, Uncle Mort. <laughs> You've got a heart as big as your... As big as you are, Uncle Mort. <laughs> and, and don't worry about me paying you back. Huh? I'll get a job in no time. Yeah. And uh, uh, can I have the $19 now, Uncle Mort? Now? Yeah, Piggy's here with me. He can't go home until he gets the money. Oh, yes, I see. Well, here you are. Uh... Ten, fifteen, uh, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Well, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Piggy, it's a deal. Here's the dough. Yeah. Youth with its trivial problems. I wonder what kind of a job that boy will get. Need a boy? Oh, you don't. Need a boy? Oh, you don't. Yes, we have a morning paper route open. Got a bike? Sure. When do I start? Five o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, this is no cinch job, young man. You've got to deliver those papers every morning, rain or shine. Now, do you think you can swing it? Oh, sure. I'm awfully reliable, mister. I take after my uncle. He used to get up every morning and roll five miles into the teeth of a gale and then roll five miles back. Oh, delivering papers? No, lobsters. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess you'll do. What's your name and address, young man? Leroy Forrester, 747 Parkside Avenue. Okay, Leroy. Now advance and take the early bird's pledge. <clears throat> Neither snow nor rain, nor hail nor flood shall stop the carriers of the Summerfield Indicative Indicator from delivering their papers and collecting at the end of the month. I do. Good. Now wear this pin, your badge of honor as an early bird. And may its luster never be tarnished. No, sir. And remember, for every paper that isn't delivered before 7 a.m., you'll be Dr. Nickel. Strange. Leroy isn't usually late for dinner, is he, Birdie? No, ma'am. Dinner's usually late for him. Uh have you tried phoning any place? I don't know where. To... Well, how about this young friend of his, uh, Porky Pine? No, uh, Hogface something or other. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, Piggy Banks. Uh, what's his phone number? Let's call him, huh? I got a job! I got a job! Well, congratulations, my boy. What you doing getting jobs at supper time? Yeah. What kind of a job is it, Leroy? Delivering a paper route for the Indicator Vindicator. Well, isn't that peachy? Indicator Vindicator, huh? Yeah. When do you start? Tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. 5 in the morning? Yeah. Did he say five? You hear what the boy say? Yeah. Yeah, that, that means I gotta get up at four. Oh, and... Leroy, you can't get up that early. Oh, yes, I can. I'll set all the alarm clocks in the house. Oh, and <laughs> Leroy, I'm afraid you're a little too young for that sort of thing. <laughs> Maybe next year. Oh, but you had a much tougher job, won't you? Tell but me. Uncle's a big man. Yeah. Well, he wasn't a man then. He wasn't even an uncle. You promised me I could do this. Uncle Mort, you promised me I could do it, and I promised the circulation manager. How did it look if we both broke our promises? It looked better than getting up in the middle of the night. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, this puts me in rather a bad spot, Leroy. What would Judge Hooker say about this? That it's building my character. Well. Now, I'd better go to bed if I'm going to get up at 4 o'clock. But you haven't had dinner yet. Okay, then, let's eat. What's delaying dinner, Bertie? What's delaying, he said. Look here, you, Leroy. We've got ham for dinner, and whilst waiting for you, I've frizzled it, defrizzled it, and refrizzled it until it's fabled. <laughs> You 
dressed already, Leroy. Yep, up bright and early, Bertie. Hello, Bertie. Good morning, Leroy. Oh, don't look at me. I haven't had time to put on my makeup. I'm a sight. Gee, sis, I never knew you looked like that. <laughs> I like you better without makeup. <laughs> Looks like a skin rabbit to me. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> have you had anything to eat, Leroy? Oh, yeah, I fixed myself a swell breakfast. What did you have? A ketchup sandwich and a peanut bar. <laughs> Land of Goshen, boy, that ain't no breakfast. I'm going to fix you some pancakes. What was that? Oh, just a little drizzle. A little drizzle? Why, Leroy, it's coming down in buckets. Why? <coughs> Why, look at that street. It's flooded. Why, the water's running over the curb. You can't go out in weather like this. Oh, yes, I can. Neither snow nor rain nor hail nor flood shall stop the carriers of the indicator vindicator. I do. <laughs> You don't. Not this morning. Ah, oh, gee, Marge, I got my rubber boots and my slicker and my rain cap out in the hall, and I'll be riding my bike. You're not going out in that rain. Oh, shucks. This is nothing to what Uncle Mort had a face when he was a boy. He used to row five miles out to sea in a lobster pot. <laughs> I don't care if he... Oh, Uncle Mort. Well, he could take out the car and drive you around. I'm going to wake him up right now. Oh, gee whiz. Who ever heard of a guy's uncle driving him around a paper route? Oh, Uncle Throckmorton. That's very good, Judge Hooker. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Moore? Yeah. Uh, giddy up, dynamite. <laughs> uncle Moore, yeah. wake up. Wake up, Uncle Moore. Uh, well, who's that? It's me, Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie who? Oh, Marjorie you. <laughs> yeah. Good night, Marjorie. <laughs> no. Wake up, Uncle. Uh, what's the matter? Fire? No, rain. Uh, hmm? <laughs> Coming down in torrents, Uncle Moore. It is, huh? Yes. Well, don't try to stop it. Oh, no, 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 Uncle Mort, you've got to get up. Yes, that's nice. <laughs> Leroy insists on standing his job this morning, and you've got to help him. Yes, a very good point. Then. You must get the car out and drive him all over his paper route. Yes, to build his character. What? I do? <laughs> yes. Now put on some clothes and come into the kitchen. Bertie's fixing some coffee. Uh, but coffee will keep me awake. Hurry now, Uncle Moore. Yes, all right. Uh, where's the light? Oh! What's wrong? I burned myself. That bulb is still hot. Why, well, Uncle Moore, what time did you get to bed? Well, I was reading a detective novel. It must have been about 3.30. What time is it now? Four. Oh, my. Why don't you go back to sleep? Leroy's waiting for you in the kitchen. Yes, bright boy. But if people don't get the papers, Leroy, they'll understand it because it's on account of the rain. Bertie's right, Leroy. No, no, look. I got almost a hundred customers. And if I don't deliver a hundred papers, I get docked a nickel apiece. That's five dollars. You do? Yeah, and suppose it rains steady for a week. Now I'll owe the company thirty-five bucks. Why, at that rate, it'll cost me a hundred and fifty dollars a month just not to deliver papers. <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> Uncle Mort is very kindly consented to drive you around, Leroy. Oh, gee, you shouldn't have disturbed him. He had it tough enough when he was a kid. He's entitled to some rest now. Uh, coffee! <laughs> Here you is, Mr. Gill, please. Thanks. Yeah, somebody hold the saucer. I think I can handle the cup. <laughs> Uncle Mort, but we'll have to hurry. Uh, hurry? Where are we going? You're driving Leroy around his paper route, Uncle Mort, because of the rain. Uh, you better put on something warmer than that bathrobe and them pajamas. You know, summer's all over. <laughs> he won't have to get out of the car. Here's your overcoat, Uncle. That's all you'll need. Yes, uh, thank you. There, we're all set. Now let's go. Okay. Which way's the door? <laughs> right through here. Yeah. Oh, it's raining. What am I doing out in the rain? <laughs> You're going to help me deliver my papers. The uh, papers? What papers? The man said they'd leave the bundle right here on the porch. Where? I can't see any... Oh! Hey, Uncle Mars. What? They left the papers all right. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> In the name 
name of Pulitzer did they give you a newspaper route at the other end of town, Leroy? That was the only one open, Unc. Say, I bet this reminds you of the good old days. What good old days? You know, when you went out to the sea, lobster putting. Yeah. <laughs> By George, I wish I'd never brought those lobsters up. It, how much farther is it, Leroy? Oh, uh, just a block or two. Oh, no, stop right here. Yeah. Hey, here's my first customer. The Taj Mahal Bungalow Court. You... you just wait here while I deliver four papers. Yeah. Better turn on the radio or I'll fall asleep. And so if you're troubled with insomnia, why don't you trot right down to your nearest open all-night drug store and purchase a can of Dr. Dollop's delicious dream drop? Is that so? Yes. <laughs> And tell the druggist that Bert, the night clerk, sent you. Yes. And after you've taken a dozen drops, you'll doze into a delightful delirium from... That guy would put an owl to sleep. <laughs> okay, Uncle Mort. Fly straight ahead to the next corner. Yes. Yeah. Now turn right. Right. Oh, careful of that milk wagon, Uncle Mort. What milk wagon? I don't... Oh! 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 Yeah, whoa. Hey, you! Running into my wagon. Uh, what are you doing in the middle of the road? I'm parked against the curb, you big chowderhead. Oh! Now, see here, don't you talk to me that way, or I'll I'll pasteurize you, you little half pint feather. Look out, Uncle Mort, he ain't so little. He ain't? I, I mean, he isn't? Oh. Well, he can't frighten me. I got a good notion to report you to the police. Skidding around that corner and stacking up against my wagon and shoving my horse into a mailbox. I didn't mail your horse, no. no? <laughs> yes, he's shaking up my milk, too. Well, that's good. Why don't you stay home nice like respectable folks? No, I'll see here. I'm always having trouble with you playboys. Playboys? What do you mean? I don't you know, the street. There, now see what you did. You woke up all my customers. I did not. You woke him up yourself. Well, let's get out of here, Uncle yes. Mort. I still got a lot of papers to deliver. Yes, that's right. Let's get out of here. It's too noisy. The nerve of that milkman. Parked in the dark. And by Jove, he didn't have his taillight burning. Did he, Leroy? I didn't notice. Well, he didn't. I think I'll go right back Oh, and... no, no, no. We haven't got time, Uncle. Yes. We've just been out for 15 minutes, and I'm already half an hour behind schedule. Yeah. It's lucky for that milkman that you are. I'm just beginning to think of some things I should have told him. Funny, they always come just five minutes too late. You better watch where you're going, Uncle Mort. The water's pretty deep here. Oh. You might get off the road. Uh, does seem to be getting uh, deeper, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, throw your flashlight on that sign over there, Leroy. Sure. Uh, can you read it? What does it say? Warning! No fishing allowed. Oh! Oh, my goodness, a lake. Uh, where's the street? I'd better turn around. Uh, it's back that way. Yes, I see it now. We'll be on dry land in a moment. Oh, <laughs> don't worry, Leroy. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. I, I think the carburetor's flooded with water. Boy, now we are in a hole. Yeah. I wonder what we can do now. Well, I... Oh, oh boy. Huh? We're going to get a break, Uncle Mort. Somebody's coming down the street. Well. Hey, mister, will you pull us out? Sure, partner. Oh, Nelly. Oh, Nelly. Oh, Hey, ain't this the car that ran into me over on Quinn Avenue? <laughs> yes. But wow. uh... <laughs> if you haven't got more brass than the Marine Band, asking me to pull you out. Yes, but I'm willing to pay you. No, man. thanks. Giddy up, Nelly. <laughs> Go jump in your milk, both of you. It's getting pretty late, Uncle Morton. We still have a lot of papers to deliver. What are we going to do? Well, the car won't move, Leroy. Looks like we'll have to travel the rest of the way on foot. And I'm wearing bedroom slippers. Well, at least it stopped raining. You come on, Leroy. You take that bundle and I'll carry the rest. Ooh, yeah, yeah, the water is cold. <laughs> you want me to carry a piggyback, Uncle Morton? There's no time for joking, Leroy. Oh, good grief. It's starting to rain again. Uncle Mort, just 12 more papers to deliver and we're through. Uh, George, I'm soaked to the marrow. And on me, that's pretty far down. Here's 2100 Burnside. 
It's your turn to put it on the porch, Unc. That's a long walk up there, Leroy, and I'm rapidly reaching the end of my tether. Suppose I just throw it up on the porch, huh? Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Us huh? early birds aren't allowed to throw papers, Uncle Morse. Well, I'm no early bird. I'll bet my aim is still pretty good, too. Oh, but we've got orders. Oh, it's all right. Just this once, huh? Watch me place it on the porch. There it goes. Oh, oh, gee. It hit a window on the second floor. I told you you shouldn't Let's not go... stand around, Leroy. We delivered the paper, didn't we? Come on, quick. We might as well get going. Operator. Operator. Where's that operator? Get me the police department at once. Hello, police. This is Judge Hooker at 2100 Burnside. An attempt has just been made on my life. Somebody threw something wrapped in a newspaper through my window. It might be a bomb. I'm trying a gangster in my court, and his mob is probably trying to rub me out. Get him at all costs. Spread out a dragnet. Do something. Attention, all cars. Proceed to 21st and Burnside Streets. Judge Hooker's home has been bombed. Stop and question everyone. Investigate all parked cars. Bring all suspicious characters to headquarters. That is all. Rosenblatt. Oh, listen to those sirens, Leroy. Must be some excitement around here. I wonder what... Uh, uh, did you sneeze, Uncle Morris? What did it sound like? Sounds like you're catching a cold. Oh. I only got four more papers to deliver. Why don't you go home from here? Oh, no, I wouldn't run out on you. If, well, if you insist, that's a different matter. Maybe I'd better get into some dry clothes. Oh, huh? sure. Just go straight down 21st Street to Parkside. So long. Yeah, so long, Leroy. <laughs> See you at home. Oh, it's as cold as Judge Hooker's heart, and I'm as wet as a mad hen. I wonder if those policemen would mind giving me a lift home. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh... Hey, uh, officer. Yeah. Uh, hello, officer. I wonder if you're going my way. I'm all wet. I'll say you're all wet. Why don't you call a cab, mister? Well, you know how cabs are. They're like policemen. Anytime you need one, you can never find... Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> Uh, present company accepted, of course. <laughs> Where have you been, buddy? Uh, oh, uh, hello. Uh, two of you. Well, uh, uh, I, I've been out delivering morning papers. Delivering papers and pajamas and bedroom slippers? Uh, an overcoat, don't forget. What do you think, Joe? Smells. <laughs> Smells to me, too. Well, I assure you, officers, it's true. I, I did it all for my little nephew's character. Uh, we're building it, you know. <laughs> It was raining too hard for him to take his bicycle, so I, I drove him around. Yeah? Where's your car? It, it broke down. Where? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but it was right near a, a no-fishing sign. Yeah? Well, where's your nephew? Uh, he went that way. <laughs> Say, fellows, I'm terribly cold. Couldn't you give me a lift? What do you think, Joe? Okay. Get in. Uh, oh, thanks very much. Ooh, uh, a gun. <laughs> yeah. I hope this isn't going to be out of your way, boys. I live at 747 Parkside. Got it, Joe? Sure. Oh, but you're headed the wrong way, Joe. Oh, no, I'm not, buddy. I'm headed for police headquarters. Oh, my goodness. Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, you say your aim wasn't very good. Yes, Judge Rand. I hadn't had much sleep, and, well, I had the wind and the rain and my hair in my eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, instead of uh, throwing the paper on this man's porch, you broke an upstairs window. Yes. I was trying to throw a curve, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, your story sounds reasonable, and if you'll just wait in the sergeant's office till he can check it... Oh, gladly. I think you'll be able to go home in an hour or less. I want to thank you, Judge Rand, for being so nice yeah. to me. Yeah. I hear you caught the man who tried to kill me. Let's get a look at him. Here, here, one moment. This is a police court, not a pool room. <clears throat> Who are you? Judge Hooker, Superior Court, Department 25. Well, I'm Justice of the Peace Rand of Sunrise Court. Take off your hat. Oh, excuse me. I'm a little excited. My life's been threatened, and I want to confront the coward who... Gildersleeve. Yeah, hello, Judge Hooker. Do you know this man? Well, of course. What's he doing here? Well, we picked him up near your place. He's the one... Uh-huh. That... I see it all now. You were trying to... I was not. Don't lie. Order. Order. Yes, order. Order in the court. Order. Yeah. Now, Gildersleeve, you better make a clean breast of it. Confess... And I might be inclined to be more lenient. Say, wait a second. It's all right, it's all right. I'm trying this case. 
Now tell me, Gildersleeve, what was in that newspaper you threw into my bedroom? I don't know what was in the judge. I didn't read it. <laughs> now, Judge Hooker, I've heard this man's story. I'll listen I... to you later. Gildersleeve, you're guilty of breaking and entering my home. But, Judge, I've never been in your home. You threw something, didn't you? Yes, but... And it broke something and entered somewhere, didn't it? Yes, Then but... by your own admission, you're guilty, and by virtue of the laws of the state, I hereby sentence you to one year. One moment, Judge Hooker. This isn't your court. I'm the judge here, and I'm capable of running things. Uh, all right, all right. I don't want to tell you your business. Then don't. <clears throat> now, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't think it's necessary to question your word any further. You broke Judge Hooker's window, is that right? Yes, sir. And for that, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm going to require you to pay for installing a new window. Uh, yes, sir. Is that all you're going to do? No, not quite. Well, that's better. I've never before seen such disregard for the dignity of a courtroom. Of the rights of others, as you've shown here this morning, Judge Hooker. Who, me? Yes, and I'm going to cite you for contempt of court. What? $25 fine or 30 days in jail. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I wonder what the parquet margarine users who are listening in would say if I asked them why they like parquet. Well, it's a pretty good guess that they like parquet first because of its delicious flavor. And a good many would answer, too, that they like parquet because they can use it so many ways. Yes, parquet margarine is so good tasting, you'll be proud to serve it at your table. And for the same reason, you like it for seasoning, for baking, and for pan frying, too. Why, more and more these days, good cooks are insisting on a flavor shortening for baking. A shortening that adds its own tempting taste to cookies, cakes, and pastries. And a flavor shortening is just what parquet margarine is. You'll find parquet's flavor makes it a delicious seasoning for hot vegetables, too. And a grand fat for pan frying that doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And whether you use parquet margarine at the table, for seasoning as a flavor shortening, or for pan frying... Don't forget, parquet is a nutritious food and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. Now, when you go to your food store, don't just ask for margarine. Ask for parquet margarine made by Kraft. Remember, Kraft's reputation for quality backs every pound of parquet. So be sure to say parquet margarine. It's made by Kraft. <laughs> You know, Leroy, I don't think this paper route was such a good idea after all. Uh, I wish you'd uh, give it up. Well, I wanted to talk to you about uh, that, If Uncle you quit Mort. this job, I'll pay for that motor myself. Well, thanks, Uncle Mort, but... Now, stop I... interrupting, Leroy. I'll even buy you the most expensive model plane there is, if you don't carry papers anymore. Oh, but, Jim... Now, I'm make up to... your mind, Leroy. Will you take my offer? Well, if you feel that way about it, okay. Fine. Yeah. Now, what were you going to say? I was trying to tell you, Uncle Mort... I was fired this morning. What? Yeah. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> You have probably heard that September 15th through 20th is Retailers for Defense Week. During this week, your regular food dealer will be selling defense stamps. When shopping, you can help this patriotic cause by taking your change in defense stamps. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. Today's program is dedicated to the citizens of Gildersleeve, Connecticut, who are today celebrating their 100th anniversary. 
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I wonder how much you know about vitamins and other important food elements so essential to our health. Well, with all the talk about proper nutrition these days, you probably know quite a lot. Yes, you know how important it is to serve your family the right kind of foods, protective foods that are nourishing and wholesome. That's why you should know about delicious, wholesome parquet margarine made by Kraft. This quality margarine called parquet is a protective food of exceptionally high nutritional value. It is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And important to everyone who knows how essential vitamins are, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A, making it a reliable winter and summer source of this valuable vitamin. Best of all, parquet margarine has such a pleasing, delicate taste that your family is bound to like it, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. Yes, you won't have to urge them to eat all of this nutritious food they need. So for nourishment and flavor, serve your family economical parquet margarine. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And remember, parquet is a craft product. And now for the adventures of the great Gildersleeve. If you take the other end of this trunk, Bernie... I got it, Mr. Gilsley. All right, now, let's lift it. Oh, well, I can't budge it. Marjorie, what does Leroy keep in this trunk of his? Rocks? Yes, Uncle Mort. That's his mineral collection. Oh, well, we'll have to drag it out later. You can let your end down, Bertie. Oh, I can tote this whole thing myself, Mr. Gilsley. You can, eh? Hello, everybody. I'm not from school. Say, what are you guys doing to my room? Uh, your sister will explain, Leroy. Well, Dora Bell Claiborne, the girl I roomed with at school, is coming to visit. You mean that giddy little Georgia gal? Oh, she isn't giddy, Leroy. She's vivacious. Uh, Honestly, Uncle Mort, all the boys at school were crazy about her. She had the cutest draw. Yeah, she always talked with a soap and a loaf. <laughs> Bright boy. Cut that out, Leroy. Excuse me, Uncle Mort. Oh. Leroy. Dora Bell's just about the best girlfriend I've got. What's that got to do with my room? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Leroy. Dora Bell's going to be in your room while she's here. Yeah? Where do I sleep? On a cot in my room. Oh, gee, Uncle Mort. Well, what's wrong with staying in Uncle Mort's room? Well, if you must know, he snores all the time. Oh, no. Only when I sleep. <laughs> and when I do, just to roll me over on my side. Oh, me? If you don't mind, I'd rather sleep in my own room. Let that silly dame go to a hotel. Oh, now, stop that, Leroy. Uncle Mort, make him quit. Yes. You're too young to uh, bully our sister, Leroy. Well, you're older. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, this girl is Marjorie's chum, and naturally she has to give her the key to the city. But all she's given her is the key to my room. Yes. Yeah. I thought you liked Dorabelle when you met her three years ago. Oh, I was just a kid then. I used to like anything. <laughs> Nevertheless, Leroy, we must show Miss Claiborne some of that famous southern hospitality. Uh, now help us move all this juvenile junk out of here. Oh, I'll take the things out of the bathroom. Yes, all right. Uh, tell Bertie to get some fresh towels. And... Yes. <coughs> yeah, what's wrong? In the bathtub. A frog. Yeah. Nonsense, there's no frog in the bathtub. Or is there, Leroy? There should be, too. <laughs> Their names are Jake and Lena. Yes. Oh, get them out. Get them out. Oh, don't be afraid, sis. These aren't wild frogs. Young man, how long have you had these frogs in your bathtub? Oh, just a week or so. Oh. Do you mean to say it's been a week since you had a bath? Oh, keep your shirt on, sis. I take a shower every day at school. Your school started yesterday. <laughs> now, you get rid of Jake and Lena. But frogs are a benefit to mankind. I read where they catch flies in the encyclopedia. Encyclopedia? By George, I'll take them out myself. Oh, there. Uh, stay still, uh, Lena. Oh, jumping jelly beans. What's wrong, Uncle? They've escaped. Leroy, oh. help me catch them. Okay. Marge, fetch that butterfly oh, yes, net. Uh, here, Jake. Here, Lena. Oh, uh, nice froggies. Uh, here, nice froggies. Say, how do you call a frog? Oh, they're slippery, aren't they? Is this the home of Miss Marjorie Forrester? Yes, ma'am. Come right in. Oh, Dora Bell. Marjorie! Mm. 
<laughs> oh, my, how lovely you look, Doraville. And you, my dear, you look just exactly the same, only four years older. <laughs> It's just three years, Doorbell. Oh, yes. I'm so forgetful. I never did have a head for figures. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come here, Doorbell. I want you to meet my Uncle Mort. Uncle Mort, Miss Doorbell Claiborne. Uh, charmed, I'm sure. Well, I do declare, Marjorie, if you haven't got the handsomest uncle. <laughs> Oh, come now. Hey, here's your bags, miss. All 12 of them. Oh. I'll have Bertie put them away. Oh, thank you, sugar. Mr. Gildersleeve, you're much younger than I expected. And uh, you're much prettier than I expected. <laughs> oh, uh, there's Leroy. Leroy, come over here and say hello to Miss Claiborne. Hello. Uh, oh, don't tell me this is little Leroy. Yeah. Why, the last time I saw you, you were nothing but a baby. And now, isn't he developing into the Miss Boy. Oh, horse feathers. Uh, Leroy. Come with me, Doorbell. Your room's ready. Oh, but you shouldn't have bothered, honey. Goodbye for now, Uncle Maud. It was so charming meeting y'all. Yeah, so long, uh, Doorbell. <laughs> this way, darling. There. Here's your room. Oh, how nice and cozy. I just love being here. I just can't wait till I meet some of your charming northern boys. But what about Harvey? Harvey? Who's that? Why, the boy you were engaged to. Remember you wrote me about him in April? In April? Oh, that must have been Harvey Jackson. Did something come between you? Yes, the draft. I've been engaged to Joe Patterson and Sammy Full and Davy Lee since then. All at once? Why, no. What do you think I am, a flirt? <laughs> Of course not. I'm not engaged at all at the moment, so I thought I'd come up here and meet some nice, reliable men. Well, Ted knows a lot of nice boys. Ted, is that your fiancé? Well, not exactly. Yes. Is he nice? Uh, the kind you dream about. At least the kind I dream about. Well, <laughs> he's been awfully attentive, but we haven't any understanding yet. Well, my idea would be a man who can give a girl a nice home and lots of servants and cars and shopping money. Why, Dorabelle, there's more to marriage than that. What about your happiness? That's just what I was thinking about, Sugar Lion. Uh, can I come in? Oh, of course, Uncle Mort. Uh, <laughs> hello, Dorabelle. My, don't you smell nice. <laughs> <laughs> And don't you look handsome with your hair all slicked down. Oh, yeah, yeah. you uh, like it that way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes you look like a movie star. Well, I have been told that I resembled Ronald Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> Except that he has a mustache, and so have I. Now, Uncle Maud, I like you a lot better than Ronald Coleman. Yeah. Why, you'd make two of him. Yeah, I would, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, is there anything I could do for you? Well, uh, you could go down to the railroad station and fetch Tuffy. Uh, Tuffy? Who, who's that? My little dog. He's waiting in the baggage room. Oh, well, I'll be very glad to go. What kind of a hound is he? A little Mexican hairless. Yes. Oh, uh, Tuffy, eh? Yeah. Hey, everybody, here's Ted. Uh, hello, boys. Well, hello, Ted. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Ted. Darabelle, uh, this is Ted. Well, I do declare, Marjorie, if you haven't got the handsomest boyfriend... Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh, now, you know better than that, Miss Claiborne. Oh, don't be so formal. Just call me Dorabelle, Ted. Well, okay, Dorabelle. Now, how do you like Summerfield? Oh, well, give her a chance, Ted. She's been here less than an hour. But I know I'm going to like it, darling. Cause I'll be just a trifle miserable till I get my Tuffy. Oh, yes, a Tuffy. Tuffy? Uh, that's my little dog. He's been waiting for me at the depot. Well, I'll be very glad to drive down there and get him. Yeah, but I oh, was... Oh, thank uh... you, Ted. I don't know what I'd have done. But I oh, was... nothing at all. It won't take me more than 20 minutes. But I was... Is that all? Well, maybe I'd better come along. <laughs> Tuffy might be frightened. But I was... We'll uh... be right back. Everybody, come on, Tay. Yeah, we'll be right back. But I was. Uh, what was I? <laughs> oh, yes, I was stood up. Hey, sis, why didn't you go along? I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. I wasn't invited. <laughs> Chicken a la king for lunch again. For the third day in a row. Are you practicing to open a tea room, Bertie? No, sir. 
Dorabelle's favorite dish, Uncle Mort. It is, huh? Where is Dorabelle? Oh, Ted is showing us some of the sights around town. Shall we wait luncheon for them? No, they just phoned that they were having lunch out. You know, Marjorie, it's really none of my business, but... Hello, everybody. What's for lunch? Oh, cream chicken again. Why can't we have ham sandwiches for a change? Yes. Why can't we have ham sandwiches? Bertie, take this mess away and bring us some ham sandwiches. Yes, sir. Right away, quick. Won't we'll take but a dip it. Oh, uh, wait a minute. What am I running for? We ain't got no ham. <laughs> well, go out and buy some. You, you want a ham sandwich, too, don't you, Marjorie? No, I, I'm not very hungry. If you'll excuse me, I, I won't have anything. Hey, what's biting her? A little bull weevil. Dorabelle, huh? <laughs> he gives me a pain, too. Say, Uncle Mort, does Marjorie know Dorabelle is making a play for Ted Will? Why do you think she left the table? Because she hates ham sandwiches? <laughs> Gee, I had a feeling that dame was poisoned. Uh, when did you get this feeling? The minute you gave her my room. <laughs> By George, I wish we'd left the frogs in the bathtub. I can put them back. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not that, Leroy. We'll fall back on that only if everything else fails. Uncle Mort, this doorbell's given Marjorie the old sabotage. Yes. Now, we can't count on Sis to do anything about it. She's too proud to fight back. So we got to do something. That's right. We've got to do something. Uh, what have we got to do? Let me see. Just... Oh, I've got it. And it's foolproof. Uh, no, no. What do you mean, no? Let's hear it. What's the use? This idea would work like a charm, but you wouldn't stand for it. Leroy... In the past few days, I've stood for a lot more than I can stand for, and I guess I can stand for a little more. What is it? Well, if some high-powered guy stepped in and gave Ted a lot of competition with Dorabelle, I bet she'd get rid of Ted. You're a bright boy, Leroy. <laughs> Especially if this other man was a bigger shot than Ted. Somebody older with plenty of dough. Marvelous. Uh, but who could we get? I've got them all picked out already. You have? Who is he? You. Who? You. Who? You. Stop you hooing, Leroy. <laughs> uh, what do you mean, uh, me? Gee, will you answer the description perfectly, Uncle Mort? Look, you're older than Ted, aren't you? I am. And you're wealthier than he is. I am. And you're handsomer. I am? <laughs> Here you are. Uh, then why have you got your fingers crossed? Why, she says you look like Ronald Coleman. I heard her myself. No, no. Let's not kid ourselves, Leroy. She's half my age, and I'm twice her weight. <laughs> but she's tired of all these young, skinny sprouts, Uncle Morse. She wants to hook a rich guy. Oh, uh, the practical type, eh? <laughs> now, I'll do all the hard work, convincing her you're a millionaire, yes. and all you have to do is be nice to her. Give her things. Yes. Take her out to the movies. Uh, the mushy ones. But I don't like mushy movies. I like Hopalong Cassidy. <laughs> You've got to do this for my Uncle Mort. How about it? By George, I almost would. If she'd only stop using that overpowering perfume of hers, I can't stand it. Oh, I can fix that in no time. How? It's easy. I'll just sneak into a room, pour half the bottle out, and fill it up again with water. Keep this up, my boy, and someday you'll be... Uh, well, just keep it up. <laughs> then you'll do it, huh? Remember, it's your duty as our uncle, Uncle. You're right, Leroy. I'll do it. But something tells me it would have been a lot easier if we'd have put those frogs in her bed. Hi, Adora Bell. Hello, Sugarfoot. Uh, Ted called just now, but I thought you were out with Uncle Mort. Oh, I better phone Ted back. I've been neglecting him shamefully lately. Oh, it's no use calling. He was going right out. Say, have you seen Uncle Mort around? I think he's resting in his room till dinner time. We went to a movie this afternoon. What did you see? Hop along, Cassidy. I only went along to please him. I think Uncle Mort's doing all he can to please you, too. Yes, I wonder why he's doing it. Oh, you'll find out someday. You think I will? I hope so. How oh, aren't you sweet? <laughs> Your uncle's a very interesting man, Leroy. Yeah. You know, he started out as a boy with only one lobster pot, and now he's got millions. Of lobster pot? No, dollars. Oh, I never knew that. I thought he was well off, but I never dreamed he was a millionaire. Well, don't let on. He, he doesn't like people to like him just because he has loads of money. As if anybody would. No. He's just charming and lovable and sweet and handsome all by his own self. How did he make his money, Leroy? Why, uh, in enterprises. Enterprises? Yes, he's got them scattered all over the country. What kind of enterprises? Oh, uh, 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 various, you know, various. Uh, of course, Uncle has always said he'd trade all of his wealth. 
just not to be so lonesome. He did? Yeah. And you know something, Dorabel? Quite, Sugar Pie. Since he met you, he's been a different man. Too bad he's so much older than you are. Oh, not too much. And besides, what of it? And you're interested in somebody else. Why, Leroy Forrester, whatever gave you that idea? Oh, I don't know. You and Ted? Ted Wills? Why, he's Marjorie's fella. I'm not interested in him. And when he calls up, you keep telling him I'm out. You mean you're going to brush him off? I will not. Let him take care of his clothes himself. <laughs> now, you run along out, Angel Cake, whilst I fix up the dinner. Okay. Hey, Unc. How did it go? Oh, swell. Mickey Rooney couldn't have done it any better. Yes. And you think it's going to work? Sure, if you do your share. Remember, from here on, it's up to you. I'll try my best. It isn't easy, you know, playing patty cake with that little rattle brain, taking that darn dog of hers out for a walk every afternoon. Yeah. Say, how do you keep Tuffy in line? Well, we go to the park, I buy him four hamburger sandwiches, then we both take a nap under a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dora Bell's about ready to give Ted the gig. Good. That'll make Marjorie happy. Say, you better go in and try to cheer Marge up. Huh? She's been looking terrible lately. By George, you're right. I'll do it right now. Uh, there's another favor I'd like to ask, Leroy. Shoot. See if you can dilute Dora Bell's perfume just once more. <laughs> Who's there? Uh, it's me, Uncle Mort. Uh, do you mind if I come in? What's wrong, Marjorie? Oh, sometimes people are a terrible disappointment. Oh, there are plenty of nice people in this world. They just seem to be nice first. Yeah. Then somebody else comes along and you see them in their true colors. Oh, now, my dear, sometimes people get their heads turned by uh, other people. And these other people shouldn't be allowed to come between people and, and the people they like. They should go back home with it. Where they belong. Now, now, my dear. Time wounds all heals. <laughs> why, why, before you know it, uh, you'll be smiling and laughing and happy again. But I'm happy now. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. I can see that. Uh, Here's a handkerchief. Yeah, uh, that's it. <laughs> it blow hard, my dear. Now, don't worry. Uh, just leave it to your Uncle Mort. You mean you've done something? I surely have, Marjorie. Everything's going to be all right. It is? Sure. I'll let you in on a little secret. I've got a date tonight with Dorabelle. What? You too? Huh? Oh, come on. <laughs> How could you? Oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, Leroy, I can't go through with this another evening. Dora Bell's had me doing the rumba and the conga and the tango and the fandango till I walk with a Spanish accent. <laughs> and tonight we're going to the country club dance, and she's going to teach me how to be a jitterbug. If I could only tell her what I thought of her, I'd be a happy man. Uh, cheer up, Uncle Mort. This can't last much longer. No, well, neither can I. Now you run upstairs and get my hat. Okay. Good idea. A jitterbug at my age. Uh, Hello? Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, this is Ted. Oh, hello, Ted. Are you alone? Let me look. <laughs> yes. What is it? Well, this is rather hard for me to say, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I guess I've been pretty much of a fool. That's a pretty good guess. <laughs> There's no use in going over the whole thing now, but I've got to see Marjorie alone and try to get her to forgive me. An excellent idea. I'm taking Dorabel out of the house anyway. Oh, you're a pal, Mr. Gildersleeve. And don't think I don't know what you've done to open my eyes. I wish I could keep mine open. I don't ever seem to get any sleep anymore. <laughs> that Southern Bell has put me through the ringer. I can sympathize with you. Huh? Yes. If it wasn't for you, I'd never be in this mess. When shall I come around? Just as soon as you can get here. Dorabel and I were supposed to leave an hour ago. She should be down any minute now. I see. And when she does, I'm going to tell that... Oh, there you are, Dorabel. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, goodbye, Mr. McGonagall. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Uh, that was Mr. McGonagall. Did I keep y'all waiting long, Socky Walky? Yeah. Uh, no. And now, young lady, there's something I've been waiting to tell you ever since you walked into this house. Hey, Unc, I couldn't find your hat anywhere. Well, I better get myself so we can get going. But Lammy Pie, you were starting to say. I'll tell you on the way over to the house. Lammy Pie. I can't understand your uncle. He's been so droopy lately. Why, that's because he's in love with you. Don't you get droopy when you're in love? Come to think of it, I do. Sure, why, why right now you're a little droopy. <laughs> Am I, Leroy? You bet you droop. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you droop. And, and you think your Uncle Moat really and truly has a fever for me? Why, he was saying to me only just now, if I could only tell Dora Bell what I thought about her, oh, I'd be a happy man. <laughs> That's right, Miss Dora Bell. Uh, call me Auntie Dora Bell, Leroy. Oh. And you can tell Uncle that we don't need to go through any proposal business. From now on, we'll just consider ourselves engaged. Uh, say, where, uh, where are you going? I'll be waiting in the car, nephew. Oh, gee, now what have I done? I better tell Uncle Mort so he can... Uh, where's Dora Bell, Leroy? Oh, in the car. Say, I said something to her, and she thinks... No you... need for any more shenanigans, Leroy. I've got good news. Ted snapped out of his dizzy doorbell spell. And, and he and Marjorie have made up? Well, they will as soon as I can get that Dixie Dietrich away from the house. And when I do, I'm going to invite her to pack up and go home. Oh, say, don't do that. I just told her... Oh, that... you told her. A bright boy. Saves me the trouble, then. How soon is she leaving? Uh, she didn't say. She thinks she's going to get... I haven't time to dilly-dally here, Leroy. Got to get her out of the way before Ted comes. Uh, goodbye. But Uncle... Oh, my... Leroy, tell me what was on your mind, Throckmorton. Yes, I know. Saved me a lot of embarrassment, too. I just want you to know I'm ready any time you want to set the date, honey bunny. Well, how about tomorrow morning? There's a train leaving. Oh, you mustn't rush me, you impetuous boy. <laughs> well, <laughs> why not? Why not? The sooner the better. <laughs> and it better be sooner. <laughs> Tell me, Throckmorton, are you sure you want me to go through with this? Positive. Say, you're not going to back out now, are you? Oh, no. You couldn't get me to change my mind now. Well, that's good. Well, this is our last night at the country club. <laughs> I have a marvelous idea. Let's announce it here. Uh, you think we should announce it? Oh, sure. There'll be just loads of people glad to hear the good news. Yes, probably more than you think. <laughs> Now, let me see. Yeah? Who'd be the proper person to make the announcement? Why, the orchestra leader, of course. Orchestra? They usually... Oh, well, look, who's the new leader? Uh, who? It's Danny Durant. He started playing around my hometown. Look, isn't he the handsomest orchestra leader? Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> oh, Danny. Uh, did you call me? Well, for heaven's sake, Dorabel Claiborne, what are you doing up here? You'll soon find out. Uh, this is Mr. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, Danny. Hello, how do you do? And he and I have an important announcement we wish you'd make from the bandstand. Uh-oh. Up to your old tricks again. Yeah, huh? that's right. And now she's now, going Now, boys, home. stop teasing. Danny, we want you to announce my engagement and forthcoming marriage to Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes. What? <laughs> <laughs> engagement? Uh, marriage? <laughs> excuse him, please, Danny. Yes, this excuse This is me. his first engagement, and he's kind of nervous. Nervous. Rock Morton, you just... Just calm yourself. But I, but you, but I the we. I can't wait till Danny makes the announcement. Can you, darling? No, I can't wait. I've got to get out of here. The orchestra has a short admission right now, Dorabelle. Fine. That'll give Danny and me time to figure out a cute way of wording the announcement yep. and to visit a bit. See you in a few minutes, baby lion. Oh, now you're in a mess, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. What'll people say? Yes, and they'd be right, too. <laughs> Oh, now, what can I do? Uncle Mort. Yeah? Uncle Mort, Ted and I hurried here as fast as we could. Yeah. Leroy told us that he was afraid he proposed to Dorabelle for you. Uh, he did, Marjorie. Why didn't he ask me first? I'd have said no. <laughs> did you tell her it was all a mistake? How could I, Ted? I didn't know we were going to be married till she told that orchestra leader, and now he's going to tell everybody. Oh. Well, if I can stop him from... Oh, there he goes up to the bandstand now. Oh, where? Oh, there. come on, Uncle Mort. Uh, no. No, it's too late. I guess I'll just have to face the music. Yeah, there's the music. <laughs> Ladies and 
and gentlemen. I have an important announcement to make. Oh, here it comes. Not so long ago, Summerfield was visited by a beautiful vision of loveliness from down south. Yeah. <laughs> she charmed the hearts of all the boys, but there is only one man who is going to be happy for the rest of his days. Yes, slap happy. <laughs> this man, the envy of all Summerfield, is the one to whom she's just bestowed her hand. Bestowed. Thrust. <laughs> Of course, you know the girl I've been talking about, Miss Dorabelle Clayford. She's an old friend from down home. I wish you were there now. Well, it gives me great pleasure to announce that Miss Dorabelle Clayburn has just promised to become my wife. Uh, what? Uh, your wife? Hey, I've been jilted. Thank goodness. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, I have a confession to make. You see, although I am the announcer on a food program, I'm no cooking expert. No, I'm more interested in eating good food than in preparing it. But I do know this. The most important quality in food, the quality that makes you a good cook, is the flavor you give to the dishes you serve. And that's the reason more and more women are using parquet margarine. You see, parquet is the new craft margarine that tastes so good. Yes, women everywhere are discovering that parquet is a delicious margarine that can be used so many ways. Served at the table, for instance, parquet is sure to impress everyone with its delicate, satisfying taste. You'll find parquet is a luscious seasoning melted over hot vegetables. For baking, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening that makes cookies, cakes, and pie crusts that fairly melt in your mouth. And then there's pan frying. Yes, parquet adds flavor to pan fried foods, too. And it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And remember, parquet margarine is a nutritious food that contains vitamin A, yet it's economical, too. So next time you order, ask for delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Just say, I want parquet, the delicious margarine that's made by Kraft. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, yes, Mr. Bannon? I'd like to read a resolution we received from Gildersleeve, Connecticut. Oh, well, uh, go right ahead. Here it is. Whereas the town of Portland, celebrating its 100th anniversary, desires to honor that part of the town known as Gildersleeve and the person who has chosen that name in providing joy and entertainment to the nation, and whereas the first Gildersleeve built the fleet which helped win the War of 1812 and the great Gildersleeve of the modern airways is building happiness for the American people... We, the Centennial Committee, do solemnly declare and herewith appoint the great Gildersleeve, honorary mayor of the village of Gildersleeve in the town of Portland, state of Connecticut, given under my hand and seal on this 19th day of September, 1941. Joseph P. Bransfield, chairman. Well... Well, I, I'm deeply honored. And let me say, from one Gildersleeve to another... I hope the old proverb about the first hundred years being the hardest is true. Then the next hundred years will be easier. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and reminding you that if the community in which you live does not observe daylight saving time, the great Gildersleeve will come to you one hour later beginning next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. 
But right now, here's a question for you. Did you know that you can overeat and still be undernourished? That it's not so much the quantity of food you eat as the kind of food you eat that's important. Well, it's true. And that's why you should learn all you can about the right foods to serve your family. Wholesome, protective foods that provide the energy and real nourishment your family needs. So it's important to you that delicious parquet margarine, made by Kraft, is one of the right foods. And that it's so economical you can serve your family all they need. Yes, parquet margarine is a protective food that's packed full of wholesome nourishment. Parquet is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And you all know how important vitamin A is. It's truly a protective vitamin. Well, parquet margarine is rich in vitamin A. There are 9,000 units in every pound. And don't forget, parquet is the margarine with the delicious flavor, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. So ask your dealer for delicious, economical parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Here we are, Mr. Gildersleeve. Report of a state of Marjorie and Leroy Forrester Miners, submitted by Frock Morton P. Gildersleeve Guardian. Well, it looks very neat, Ted. Should impress Judge Hooker. Is it complete? All but the name of that firm that leased the 12th Street property. Oh, yes. Let's see. What was that firm? Oh, yes. The Swanky Hanky Shoppy. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just fill that in. It was a 99-year lease, wasn't it? Yes, 99 years with monthly options. <laughs> oh, Marjorie. Yes, Uncle Frog Oh, hello, Tay. Hi, Margie. Say, that's a new dress, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> what do you think of it? Uh, well, stop then. asking him questions, Marjorie, or he'll charge the estate for giving a legal opinion. <laughs> I'll go in the other room, young man, and tend to your paper. Oh, okay. Jay. <laughs> Did you want me? Yes. Uh, all ready to go to court, eh? Uh-huh. Uh, what about your brother? Where is Leroy? Oh, I sent him to change his shirt for the third time. Uh, Uncle, I wish we'd make him get rid of that printing press. Well, little boys will always revert to type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now tell him to hurry. I don't want to be late. This is important, and I'm getting jittery about it. Oh, now relax and take it easy, Uncle Throckmorton. Relax? Ted says the report is in fine shape. Why, there's nothing to be excited about. How is this? No, by George. Come to think of it, I've done wonders. If I do say so myself. In fact, I will say so myself. I've done wonders. <laughs> I think so. Why, since you arrived in Summerfield a month ago, you've straightened out all of our investments, rented that vacant property, and even put the kitchen on a budget. Why, Judge Hooker should be very pleased. I hope so. I made up my mind to demonstrate to that old... What is it Leroy calls him? Uh, old Leroy! What? What was it I told you not to call Judge Hooker? Picklepuss! That's it. I made up my mind to show that old pickle puss that a competent businessman could administer this estate properly. Why? Because you can't put anything over on me. Excuse me, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, yes, Bertie? Where did you buy them bananas? Well, from a man in a truck. They were bargains, too. The stores want 30 cents a dozen, and he only charged me 25. Well, he done gypped you there was only nine bananas. Yeah. <laughs> yes. As I was saying, mind you, you can't put anything over on my type of businessman. We have a certain alertness. Uh, oh, Great Danes. What's wrong? Look at the time. We'll be late for court. Oh, but court stays open until 5 o'clock, Uncle Moore. Yes, but we can't just drop in whenever we want, my dear. It isn't a barbershop, you know. We have to be there when the judge is ready to take us. Oh, like a beauty parlor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see, I don't want to arrive late and have trouble with old uh, cucumber face. I've got to get back here and pack up my bag so I can take the night train. The night train? Yes. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I'm going to back to Whistle Vista this evening. Oh, Uncle Moore. Huh? Well, I thought you were going to stay here and live with us. Well, I am. That's why I'm going back to Whistle Vista. Huh? To sell or lease my house there. You are? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> oh, Leroy. Yeah, what's it? Uncle Moore's going to sell his house in Whistle Vista and come back here and live with us. Oh, boy. Gee, that's wonderful, Uncle uh, Moore. Take it easy. Uh, do you want me to make you a for sale sign on my printing press? No, no, no. Thanks, just the same. You haven't got that many shirts to spare. <laughs> oh, uh, Ted, is it time to go? Yes, we should hurry down to the courthouse. Everybody ready? Uh, Leroy, Marjorie, Ted, Bertie? Oh, Bertie's not going to court with us, Uncle Moore. I know that. I just want a glass of water. That <laughs> ham I had for breakfast. Uh, water, Bertie. Yes, Mr. Gill, please. Bring in it. Good. 
Anybody else want any water? No, no. Thank you. Here you are, sir. You better hurry, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, one second while I drink this. <laughs> Thanks, Bertie. Now I'm ready to go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excuse me, I must have drunk too <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute, Ted. I think Uncle Mort has a hiccup. A hiccups? No, I'll be all right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe you better do something about it. No, no, no. I'll be all right. Well, Uncle Mort, you better sit down and rest a minute. Well, what about court? You know, old Judge. Sir. Judge Rucker, ah, he'll wait. Yes, I can have it put over till tomorrow. But I gotta get back to Whistle Vista, Ted. I I couldn't do that. <laughs> or could I? Why not, Uncle? No, no, no. <laughs> I'll be all right in a few minutes. No, oh, isn't this silly? <laughs> <laughs> now, don't try to talk, Uncle Mort. Just, just sit quietly for a few minutes and, and rest. Rest? All right, I'll rest. <laughs> Maybe it would help if you unbuttoned your vest, Unc. Unbutton my vest? I'll try it. Yes, that seems a little better. Oh! <laughs> uh, spoke too soon. <laughs> better button it up again. Yeah. Say, I know a sure cure for hiccups. It never fails. It doesn't? Well, what is it? Drink a glass of water. Oh, but Marjorie, my dear, don't you remember? That's how I got them, uh, drinking water. No, but you didn't drink slowly. Slowly. You've got to take nine swallows of water and, and not breathe in between. Not breathe? What am I, a fish? <laughs> now, Uncle Mort, it's cured thousands. Sure, you know, a hair from the dog that fish you. Uh, Ted, this is hiccups, not hydrophobia. <laughs> well, I'll get a glass of water. Yeah. You better get a pitcher in case one glass full won't do it. What are you trying to do? Drown him? No, no. No more water, Marjorie. One more swallow and I'll fly back to Capistrano. <laughs> oh, help me out of this rocking chair. I'm getting seasick. Cheer up, Unc. If you can keep on hiccuping for another two hours, you'll get your picture and strange as a thing. You're a bright boy, Leroy. I'll keep quiet. Uh, Mr. Gildersleep, I just remembered something that'll take care of those hiccups. You do, Ted? What is it? But it's simply a matter of breath control. Say, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers without taking a breath. Oh, I... Yeah, go on, try it, Uncle Moore. Well, all right. Peter Piper picked... Uh, no, no, it's slower, like this. Like this. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, that way. Yeah. Peter Piper picked up. Uh, picked up. Uh, picked up. Uh, oh, more water, Bertie. Yeah, we have, Mr. Gildersleeve. Thanks. Well, who's got the next suggestion? Step right up. Don't be bashful. Gildersleeve the guinea pig. That's me. <laughs> I wouldn't be bringing it up, Mr. Gildersleeve, except I know it'll work positively. Now, if you hold a cold silver knife on the back of your neck, then hiccups will be gone with the wind. Well, all right. I'll try anything once. Have you got a cold knife, Bertie? Uh, yes, sir. I brought one right here with me, Mr. Gilsleeve. Unbutton your collar, Uncle. There. Ooh, it sends the shivers up and down my spine. Where'd you get that knife, Bertie? I had it in the refrigerator. You never can tell when a nice cold knife comes in handy. Hey, Uncle Mort! Lamont, I was outside talking to my pal, Piggy Banks, and when he had the hiccups, they... Hey, what's that knife doing in your back? Did they operate on you? Well... No, Leroy. Bertie suggested cold silver against the back of my neck. Oh, that won't work. It will, too, you, Leroy. I've been watching your uncle since he tried it, and he ain't hit once. By George, come to think of it, I haven't hit. Now, this is wonderful, Bertie. Thanks very much. Now, remind me to give you a dollar. Uh, Ted, let's get started for the courthouse. But, Uncle Moore, a cold knife against the back of the neck cures nosebleeds, not hiccups. Why, is that right? Oh, I thought so, too. You mean to say it's not good for <laughs> hiccups? Oh, <laughs> jumping jelly beans. <laughs> Oh, they've come back again. Uh, forget about that dollar, Bertie. Say, Uncle Morris, I know a sure cure. I can't miss. No, Leroy. It's my turn this time. I've just remembered a, a remedy. But that isn't fair. I spoke up first. Say, whose hiccups are these? Yours or mine? Okay, go ahead. They're your hiccups. Uh, What's your remedy, Uncle Morris? Well, I'll, I'll take a cold shower. The shock should stop me. It sounds logical. Well, it won't hurt at any rate. We've got to do something so I won't keep speaking out of turn in court. <laughs> I'll get the car out of the garage. I bet that shower doesn't work, Marge. Now, my idea is to scare Uncle Mort. What for? Well, that's an absolute positive cure for hiccups. How do you know? It cured Piggy Banks when he had him te something terrible. How'd he get them? Drinking a whole bottle of pop at one gulp. Honest, his family tried everything. Then his kid brother put a string of firecrackers in his pocket and lit the fuse. 
That did the trick, all right, all right. But didn't those firecrackers burn a big hole in his coat pocket? No, Piggy wasn't wearing a coat. Gee, if I could only think of something super to pull on Uncle Mort, I bet I'd scare the hiccups right out of him. Now, you wait a minute, Leroy. Don't you do anything drastic. Oh, me? When did I ever do anything? Say, how's about it if I, I put ketchup on my head and stagger into his room and fall down on the floor? Leroy, Forrester, now don't you dare. Well, all right. Let's see. What else would frighten those Donald hiccups? Oh, oh, it's freezing in the shower. Bertie must be using the hot water in the kitchen. Oh, this water is ice cold. Oh. Uncle Mort! Uncle Mort! Uh, yes? Uncle Mort, where are you? The house is on fire! What? The house is on fire! Oh, I've got to get out of here. Oh, where's my clothes? There's no time for clothes. My bathrobe, where'd I put it? Never mind, here's a big towel. <laughs> All right. Come on, Leroy. Which way shall we go? No, no. No, Uncle Mort, go back. Why? Because you still got the hiccups. What's that got to do with my house being on fire? It isn't on fire. I was just trying to scare you. Scare me? What's the big idea? Gee, I only meant it for the best. I was just trying to frighten the hiccups away. If I ever ran out of the house like this, I'd frighten the neighbors away. <laughs> I'm awful sorry, Uncle Mort. Say, you better get back in the shower. There's a big drip on the carpet. Who, me? <laughs> You clear out of here now. As soon as I get dry, we're going down to the court. Hiccups or no hiccups? All right, folks. (gasps) I'm ready to go now. Come on, Ted. Come on, Marjorie. We're coming. Yes. <laughs> uh, where's Leroy? I think he went out. He must be waiting in the car. Good. I hope the judge doesn't mind. Okay, buddy, stick him up. Your money or your life. Leroy, come out of that closet and put back that water pistol. <laughs> oh, that didn't work either. You can't frighten me, Leroy. I'll go out and get in the car, young man. I told you, Leroy. Just you wait. I'll figure out a scheme that'll make Uncle Mort forget all about those beaks of his. Yeah. Uh, get in the car, everybody. <laughs> Lovely day, isn't it? Too bad I can't appreciate it. Maybe being in the fresh air like this, my hiccups will stop. Oh, no, they won't. <laughs> oh, and the car is doing it, too. <laughs> Boy, every time you hiccup, P.P., your foot goes down on the gas. Do you think so? <laughs> yes. You want to stop and let me drive? No, we haven't got time. Careful, Uncle Morris. Careful, you just went through a traffic signal. I can't help it. I'm afraid they're getting worse. Oh, lots worse. Yeah, they're first. Yeah. What's the idea of driving down the street like a jackrabbit and jumping the signal? Where's your driver's license? Well, it's like this, officer. Oh, it's like that, is it? <laughs> hey, what's going on here? Well, my uncle has a severe attack of hiccups. Yes, he, yes, he, he got it drinking a glass of water. Water, huh? Well, that's original anyway. <laughs> He's been hiccuping for hours. Show the officer how you've been hiccuping, Uncle. See? Never mind, I've heard him before. Uh, officer, we're in somewhat of a hurry. We're rushing down to the... I get it, to a doctor. Well, come on. What? Oh, of course, that's it. Where's the nearest doctor, officer? Let's not dilly-dally. <laughs> Gee, you got it bad. Follow me, I'll clear away for you. Thank you. Medical Center building. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, officer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all right. Same thing happened to my sister's kid two months ago. You know how we cured her? Made her eat a quart of ice cream fast. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'll put that down on my list. Hurry, Uncle Morse. Shall we go with you? No, you two children stay here with Ted. Oh. Going up? Yes. Is there a doctor in the building who specializes in hiccups? 
I mean, a uh, cure for hiccups. Oh, you might try Dr. Samard on 7. Get him, please. Yeah. <laughs> Say, you've got them bad, mister. Yeah. Well, I know something that will cure them in no time. You do? What is it? Eat a quart of ice cream fast. Yeah. Seven floor. Uh, there's Dr. Smart's waiting room, four doors down. Uh, thank you very much. All this fuss over these silly hiccups. Well, at least I'll get rid of them for sure now. Uh, Dr. E.E. E. Simard, throat, chest, and stomach. That should cover hiccups, I guess. <laughs> oh. Oh. How do you do? Do you wish to see the doctor? No. I just dropped in to catch up on my last year's reading. <laughs> Well, you should do something about those hiccups. Now, a quart of ice cream eaten fast. I know, it's a sure cure. But I want some competent medical advice. Is the doctor busy? Not at the moment. Uh, now, if you'll step in here and disrobe. I don't want to disrobe. I want to see the doctor. But if the doctor is going to examine you, you... He keeps his clothes on, doesn't he? Yes. Well, then I'll keep mine on, too. Stop! Where is he? Uh, step in here. Doctor, this gentleman wishes to consult you. Cut that, Miss Wood. How many times have I told you that patients must disrobe? We've been all through that, Doctor. <laughs> There's no need for me to do that. You can see what's wrong with me. <laughs> hmm. Open your mouth, please, and unbutton your vest. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You can close your mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't take me long to diagnose this case. No? No, you're suffering from an intermittent, uncontrollable diaphragmatic spasm causing a sudden inhalation which is interrupted by a spasmodic closure of the glottis. I am? Yes. <laughs> well, what does that mean, Doctor? You hiccup. I know I hiccup. <laughs> I can hear myself. Uh, how do I get rid of them? Uh, now, don't get excited. I have a painless and infallible cure. Oh, uh, you have? What is it? Eat a quart of ice cream fast. That'll be five dollars, please. Oh! <laughs> so... Judges' chambers are down at the end of the hall, T.P. Oh, jumping jeeps, look at the clock. This is a th of a time to show up. Feeling better, Uncle Moe? No. I've eaten so much ice cream, I sound like a good humor man. Now, take it easy, Uncle Moe. Uh, you take it easy, young man. And don't say anything to the judge. Shh. Here we are. Ted, did you send the financial report down this morning? Keep quiet. <laughs> now, don't worry. That report went down early. Should make a wonderful impression. Well, come on, let's go. Yeah, might as well face old pickle puss. Yeah. Careful, Leroy. Anything you say will be used against me. Come in. Uh, hello, Judge <laughs> Hooker. At last. I was ready to go home. <laughs> what are you hiccuping for, Gildersleeve? For about four hours now. <laughs> Uncle Mark's been suffering all day long, Judge. Yeah, maybe if you could frighten him, uh, Quiet, Judge. Leroy, quiet. Uh, yes, Judge. I'd have been here sooner except for that. Well, I'm glad you sent down your report, Mr. Gildersleeve. Gave me time to study it. I'm pleased with what I found. Gee, that's swell, Judge. I thought you could do a good job for these children. You, uh, you did? Well, thank you, Judge Hooker. In that case, we can leave. Come on, Leroy. Come on, Marjorie. Come on, Ted. What's your rush, Gildersleeve? Take it easy. Oh. Uh, you're nothing but a bundle of nerves. Yes. Yeah. I never knew nerves came in such large bundles. <laughs> Very good. I wonder if it'd be all right if I was absent from my duties for a while, Judge. I have some business to wind up in Whistle Vista. Uh, sure, sure. Go right ahead. Take all the time you want. Oh? Only be back next week. Oh. Yes, I see. Well, thanks, Judge. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Oh, poor Uncle Mort. You can't travel in that condition. I bet Mr. Fowler at the drugstore would have something to relieve you. Let us two go see him, Marge. And if he can't help, I know a couple of other guys that can. All right. If you'll excuse us, we'll run along. Certainly. <laughs> goodbye, then. Uh, goodbye, goodbye. Don't drive Uncle Mort home. Oh, sure. Hey, Leroy. Well, Ted, let's get started. Oh, I can't stop that. Hey, those hiccups must be annoying. They are, indeed they are. By the way, I know a sure cure for hiccups. What, you too? Oh, this one never fails. All you need is a brown paper bag. A brown paper bag? Well, that takes the prize. Uh, shall I go out and get one, Judge? No, no, here's a bag. Wait a minute. Wait till I dump the apples out. The uh, apples? <laughs> I teach a class at law school, and the boys always bring me apples. <laughs> <laughs> now let's try this remedy. Oh, no, don't bother, Judge. I think they're stopping now. Now let's make sure. All you have to do is to breathe in and out of this bag. Understand? I understand what to do, but I don't understand why. You will. 
Just put your face in the bag. Fine. You look better already. Now go ahead and breathe. Oh. <laughs> the principle is this. Normally, you exhale carbon dioxide and inhale oxygen. Oh, I see. But this way, you inhale the carbon dioxide you've already exhaled. Oh, I see. Is that clear? No. <laughs> well, if you stop inhaling oxygen, you'll stop hiccuping. It's really very simple. So are you. <laughs> you ought to be all right, but now, how are you feeling? <laughs> Worse. Oh, my, and I almost had him licked. Strange, it's never failed before. Let me see. <laughs> There's a hole in the bag. Oh, take me home, Ted. I'm going right to bed. Oh, stop that. <laughs> Yeah. Here's a pillowcase. The ball is somewhere in here. Okay. Now, when we go out, if anyone asks who we are, we're the laundryman. I got you, Red. Uh, shall we uh, take this silver cup, too? Let me see. Yeah. Awarded to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. First place, potato race, annual picnic, Gildersleeve Gertelwick. <laughs> hey, I guess he was the whole works, huh? What do you say? No, no, no. It's more trouble than it's worth Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too easily traced, huh? Hey, you sure there's no dough laying around? No, no, I looked every place, even behind the wallpaper. You think we should, uh, think we should take any more clothes, Lefty? No, I'm wearing three of this guy's suits already, one on top of the other. I'd hate to have to run from some copper this way. Yeah, it's too bad we didn't snag any dough. Well, let's get going. Okay, you take it easy. Say, look. Get away from that window. Hey, there's a big fat guy coming up the walk. Quick, out the back way. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is he alone? Yeah, let's get out of here. No, 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 now wait. I bet he's got a fat bankroll in his pocket. Let's hide behind these curtains. But where? Make it snappy. But where? Your ladyship, please. Buddy, stick him up. No, Leroy. What do you mean, Leroy? Get him up. Oh, I see. You must be a friend of Leroy. <laughs> he puts you up to this, eh? <laughs> What'll that boy think of next? <laughs> I says for you to get them hands up and keep quiet, too. Oh, I'm sorry, mister, but it didn't work. I still got him. <laughs> you see? Hey, Brad. Oh, uh, you brought a friend, eh? Hey, what's the matter with this guy? I thought you knew. I've got the hiccup. <laughs> you see? Look, you, look. This is a gun in my hand, yep. and I've got a good notion to let you have it. No, thanks. I wouldn't know what to do with it if you did. <laughs> hey, hey, Rex, yeah. should I give it to him? No, I don't want yours either. <laughs> you're, you're, you're asking for it, mister. I am not. I don't want any guns. I'm afraid of guns. <gasps> Ooh, sometimes they're loaded. <laughs> Shall I plug them, Red? Well, I don't think that'd cure me either, mister. Stand out of the way, Red. I'll show this smart Alex. Well, very realistic. Blanks, eh? <laughs> you, you missed. He moved. I'll try again. Don't do that. You'll have every cop in town here. Oh, a gangbuster. <laughs> what are you going to do with a guy like that? I know, I know. Lefty, you stick your gat in his ribs and I'll frisk him. Okay. Now hold still, will you? This time I can't miss. <laughs> now cut it out. Cut hold it out. still. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tickly. You Stop it. Here, give me that gun. No, no, no. Oh, you get away from there. Hurry up, Fred. I can't, I can't. All right, all right. Let's take his pants off. What? Yeah. That way we get his roll and he can't follow us either. Okay. Oh, no, you don't. By George, that's carrying things too far. Fine friends Leroy has taking my... <laughs> Keep your hands off me, you little... Grab him, Red. Oh, oh look out for those flowers. <laughs> I warned you. Now you see what... Uh, oh! That's right, Lefty. Charm and applause. Oh, you want to fight, eh? Well, all right. Get off of me before I... Wait a minute, boys. Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. Oh, you give in, huh? Yes. You can quit now. My hiccups are all gone. More double push. Yeah. Grab his leg, Grab. Get away from me, Red. Oh, Leroy should have never done this. That's right, Lefty. Sit on him. What is this? Wearing my new blue third suit. This is the last draw. I'm at the stand for you. Oh, me, Red. Get him off. I'll oh, still oh. hold still while I hit him. No, no, no. Now, don't move. Now, I... <laughs> Now look what you've done. You've clunked your little partner. Hey, Lefty. Hey, Lefty. Speak to me. Yeah, speak to him, Lefty. Hi, George. He's out cold. 
Give me that gun before you do any more damage. Oh, no, you don't. Ouch, my foot. Oh. The minute I saw those tight shoes, I knew you had corns. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mister. Huh? Mr. please. What? Please don't point that gun at me. You're just nuts enough to shoot me. That's a very good idea. A couple of blanks might teach you not to go no, around. No, no, no. Huh? Now, Uncle Mark, Uncle Mark, what's the big idea leaving the front door open? Well, at last you're here, young man. Those two friends of yours are nothing but a couple of roughnecks. What friends? Who are these guys? Come, come, Leroy. Stop pretending. It's all right. My hiccups have disappeared. Oh, come on. Oh! Look at this room. What? Who's that man? Sleeping on the floor. That's one of Leroy's friends, and he's not sleeping. Ah, <laughs> uh, don't try to sneak out, Red. Uh, gee, I... I come back here, Red, and I, tell Leroy what you did to me. Well, Uncle, I never saw these men before in my life. And what's all our silver we're doing in a pillowcase? Uncle Mark, these guys are burglars. They are? What? They weren't fooling? And to think that I... <gasps> oh, my... <laughs> Now I've got the hiccups all over again. (laughs) The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, I want to say that being a mere man puts me at quite a disadvantage in talking to you housewives, especially you housewives who are really good cooks, because so many of you are probably already using delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft, and already know from your own experience that it's a grand-tasting, economical margarine that can be used in many ways. Yes, you know, for instance, that parquet margarine is really delicious for table use, and good for your family, too. You know that parquet makes cookies, cakes, and pie crust taste better because it's a genuine flavor shortening that adds its own delicate taste to all baked foods. You know that parquet margarine seasons hot vegetables to a queen's taste, makes pan-fried foods taste better, too, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And don't overlook the fact that parquet margarine is a highly nutritious energy food and a year-round source of vitamin A. Yes, you housewives who use parquet know how good it is. But some of you listeners probably haven't tried parquet margarine yet. Well, if you haven't, try it. Yes, ask your dealer for a pound or two of parquet margarine tomorrow. Just say parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. Bags all packed, Uncle Mort. Oh, thank you, Marjorie. Say, hey, Uncle, how soon will you get back from Wistful Vista? Uh, not until Wednesday. Oh, you'll be gone that long? Yes. I've got to put my house up for sale, and I also want to be on hand to greet my two little chums, Fibber McGee and Molly, when they return from their vacation Tuesday night. Hey, maybe Fibber McGee would buy your house. No, no, no. From my past experience with Fibber McGee, he wouldn't buy the place. He'd just borrow it. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Evanson.
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, here's something I'd certainly be puzzling about if I were a housewife these days, and that's the problem of how to serve my family all the wholesome, nutritious foods they need and still keep within my budget. Well, here's one way to help solve that problem, and it's a mighty pleasant way, too. Yes, for nourishment your family needs, and for flavor they're sure to like. Serve them delicious, economical parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food that's one of the best sources of food energy. And to parquet's natural wholesome goodness, Kraft adds vitamin A, 9,000 units to every single pound. But rich food value isn't all. Important, too, is parquet margarine's flavor, that delicate, appetizing taste that makes it the favorite of thousands of families for table use, for seasoning, for baking, and for pan frying. Just one taste will tell you about parquet's flavor. So why not try delicious parquet margarine tomorrow? Yes, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Don't eat your luncheon so fast, Leroy. Yes, Leroy. Where do you think you're going in such a hurry? To a fire. Uncle Mark gave me a quarter to burn my leaves. Yes. Say, leaf burning might be a good business for me to go into. Better get outside, Leroy. There's a wind coming up and you're liable to blow your business right down the street. Okay. Say, did anybody see my sweater? Excuse me while I can't Yes. Yeah. Hello, Bertie. Mr. Gilbert, please. Yes, Mrs. Bill. Just finishing lunch. Now, come on in, Judge. Thank you. Well, hello, Ted. Uh, hello, Judge Hooker. This is an unexpected pleasure. Would you gentlemen care to indulge in a cup of coffee? No, no, only going to stay a moment. Mr. Wills and I have a little matter we want to discuss with you, Gildersleeve, in confidence. Oh, surely, surely. Let's go into the library. Thank you. Well, Leroy, what are you looking for? My sweater. I left it here somewhere. Yes, on my moose head. That's no place for a sweater. I put it in your room. Thanks. Oh, hi, Judge Hooker. Hello, Leroy. Ted. Hello, Leroy. Say, who do you think's going to win the game tomorrow? Leroy, we've got some business to talk over. Now, please imitate a priority and make yourself scarce. <laughs> uh, 23 skidoo. 23 skidoo? Yes, scram. Uh, oh, I get you. 23 skidoo. Must be a new kind of jive. Wait till I spring that one on the gang. Uh, jive. Well, now that we're alone, let's get to the point. Yes, let's get right to the point, Judge. Uh, what is the point? Well, Ted tells me that you're interested in civic and municipal affairs. Yes, I am. It was Thomas Jefferson who said, if, or was it Benjamin Franklin? No, it was Thomas Jefferson who said... It, what did he say? Well, whatever it was, you can be sure it was right to the point, Judge. <laughs> We've got an organization here in Summerfield, Gildersleeve, known as the CGA. Yeah. We strive to make our city a finer and cleaner place to live in. And now that you've become a resident of Summerfield, we want you as a member. Well, uh, that's a great honor. I, I'm not sure that I deserve it, Judge. By the way, what is the CGA? Uh, the Clean Government Association, T.P. Oh. I suggested that you were just the man to add the proper weight. Yeah. Uh, I mean the proper weight in the right places. The right places, yeah. We want you to head the committee investigating conditions at our city jail. Oh, well, city jail, eh? Well, well, thanks. What's wrong down there? If I told you what's going on, it'd make your mustache curl. Well, yeah, the place can't hold on to its guests. Well, what's the trouble? Poor service? No. Prisoners keep escaping. Yeah. Turnover is suspiciously high. Oh. Uh, we're getting ready to demand a cleanup. We want to get rid of the jailer. Everybody says he's made the place what it is. Yeah. Well, it sounds like he's created quite a stir. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got no evidence that we can put before the grand jury. Oh. We need the testimony of a reputable citizen who can gather the facts secretly. Well, now, how could we do that? Uh, one of our members offered to have himself arrested on some minor charge just so that he could get inside information. A uh, splendid idea. Yeah, it would have been, except everybody knows him. The jailer and his gang would smell a rat. Oh. In fact, all our members are prominent, well-known citizens. Oh, that's too bad. Would have been a peachy plan. Well, if there was some good, substantial citizen who was new here in Summerfield... Yes, who wouldn't be recognized when he broke some petty law and landed in jail. Oh, but... that's right. A new man. A very excellent... Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I can see what's coming. I'm the guy you're leading up to. I won't do it. Pull your chin in, Gildersleeve. Uh. I'm disappointed in you. 
I thought you were going to be a useful citizen. But I don't like jails. What's wrong with them? I don't want to find out what's wrong with them. For one thing, they're, they're too confining. They give me claustrophobia. Oh, poppycock. That's just your imagination. It is not. I've got claustrophobia so bad I can't even wear a double-breasted vest. But you're, you're just the man we need. Where else can we find someone with your alertness and intelligence and daring? No place. Thanks for the compliment, Ted. I appreciate the honor, too. But no matter how thin you slice it, it's still 30 days in the clink. <laughs> oh, what's the use, Ted? He's all bull and bellow. No beef and brawn. No, look here, you. One more crack like that, and I'll fracture your skull with a hot marshmallow. Gildersleeve, you couldn't fracture a poached egg without getting winded. Why, you little legal linthead, I've got a good idea. Oh, you haven't had a good idea since you put on long pants. That settles it, Ted. Don't hold me back. I'm good. Gentlemen, please, please. This is a meeting about law and order. Well, just because he's a law, he can't order me around. I'm not. I am not trying to order you around, Gildy, old man. Oh, so now I'm an old man, am I? Stop acting like a baby. Yeah, I did. If you had any gumption, you'd help us clean up this town, Gildersleeve. It could lead to a long and honorable civic career. Yeah. Someday they'd put your statue in the park. Yeah? Who knows? Maybe they'd even name the park after you. Think of it. The Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve Memorial Park. Memorial Park? You quit burying me. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> but this plan is foolproof, T.P. The minute you have all the evidence, let us know, and Judge Hooker will get you out of jail with a writ of habeas corpus. Sure. You see? Oh, will you do it? What do you say, T.P.? Well, I didn't know about that, the, the habeas, about that. But then you'll do it? Well, if, if I really can make this town a cleaner, finer place to live in, yes. Ooh, what am I saying? I knew he'd do it, Ted. Well, what's our first move? Gildy's got to get himself arrested for some minor offense. Now, let's see. What could he do? I know. Go downtown, Gildy's sleeve, and pick a fight with a policeman. Talk back. Make him mad. Sass him. Say... That's something I've always wanted to do. <laughs> Sass a cop. This is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Better pick a small cop. Oh, yeah. Well, if everything's settled, I'll drive you home, Dad. Uh, all right now, boys. And don't forget, Hooker, when I give the CGA the SOS, you get me out PDQ. Well, children... How do you like your uncle's new fall outfit? <gasps> Why, Uncle Mullard! You look like a tramp. Yeah, and what's the idea of the dark glasses? I'm going downtown to have myself arrested. What's the matter? Lose a bet on the Dodgers? You... <laughs> no, Leroy. I'm only doing this to help make Summerfield a finer, cleaner place to live in. Not going to jail? Yes. Now, don't tell a soul, but I'm going there to investigate conditions for the Clean Government Association. Oh, I didn't understand. Yeah. Well, don't you get it, sis? Unk something like a G-man. Yeah. Oh, boy, wait till I tell the gang. Leroy, if one word leaks out about this, I'll be thrown right out of jail. Oh, gee, Unk, I wouldn't want that to happen. Yeah. Uh, I'll keep quiet, but I still don't understand why you're wearing those terrible-looking old clothes. Yeah, boy, is that a corny outfit. It's, it's a disguise, Leroy. Do you like it? It's an old sack suit. Sack suit, huh? Looks like I forgot to take out the potatoes. Yeah. Well, it, it's seven or eight years old, Leroy. I wonder if suits fitted tighter then or if I've expanded. You shouldn't wear those pants, Uncle Moore. Huh? You can't stand up in jail all the time. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, Miss March. Who that man? What you want with these children? Go away, you trash. Uh, take it easy, Bertie. It's me, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve. You sure? Why, of course. Well, you done frightened me from here to Christmas. What you doing dressed up like a scarecrow and not so skinny? <laughs> well, well, Bertie, the truth of the matter is... Oh, oh, don't tell her, Uncle Moore. You know how women are. I can't keep a secret. Yeah. She'll be telling it all around town before you even get to jail. Jail? Who's going to jail? Well, you, Mr. Gillespie? What for are you going to the pokey? The yeah, pokey? <laughs> Tell you, she's starting to broadcast already. Leroy, you spill the beans yourself. What beans? Now, what's going on around here? Oh, Margie will explain to you later, Bertie. And meanwhile, if you just keep quiet and don't mention this to anybody, I'll be able to get any jail without any trouble. You will? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things I could say at this point, but I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Oh, run along, Bertie. I'll try to explain to you later on. If I ever find out myself. Yeah. Okay, but I've got a feeling in my bones and it ain't rheumatism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think, children? Do I look shabby enough? Sure, you look pretty good. Uh, that is pretty bad, pretty good. Uh, uh, don't you think so, Marge? Well, I don't know. There's something that doesn't quite fit in with the rest. Hmm? 
Oh, oh, yes, your mustache. That's it. Now, see here, Marjorie. I'm not going to shave off my mustache, even if it means I won't be able to get into that jail. Oh, you needn't shave it. Just trim it a little so it won't look so dapper. No, no, oh, no. Yes, now, come on. Here's a pair of manicures. Nothing doing, Marjorie. Don't you dare it. touch a hair. Hold his head, Leroy. Okay, sis. Hold still, Uncle. Oh, Leroy, stop that. Quick. Cut it out, Hold children. Hold it, Uncle. Hold it. It's taken me years to stop, Marjorie. You'll ruin the shape. Hold oh, still, Uncle. Stop it. Just leave my mustache alone. Oh, that's my nose, you're trimmy. Everything all right, Uncle Mark? Well, my upper lip was kind of cold. Keep it stiff, Uncle. It looks great. Yes. Uh, say, is it all right if we stick around and watch you get arrested? I should say not. I wouldn't have even let you drive me downtown if that conductor hadn't thrown me off the streetcar. Say, how do you plan to get arrested, Uncle Moore? Huh? I hope you're not going to do anything against the law. Well, nothing really bad. I'm just going to tease a cop. <laughs> well, I have fun getting that cop mad. Hey, Uncle Moore, huh? stop. I see a policeman. Where? Coming down the street. See him? Boy, is he a big guy, too. Hey, Uncle Moore, you're not stopping. No sense in taking just the first policeman, you see, Leroy. <laughs> oh. What's wrong with this one? Well, I'd kind of like to shop around for a little one. Uh, for a little while, I mean. <laughs> but you know how hard policemen ought to find when you want one? Huh? Now's your chance. Gee, Unc, ain't you gonna? Well, all right, if you insist. Come on, Unc. Uh, don't rush me, young man. Well, what are we waiting for? Well, I, I just don't know how to begin this. Why don't you just bump into him? Look how big he is. There wouldn't be any fun in that. Then step on his corn. Yeah, step on his corn. That's like putting one foot in the grave. Hurry up before he passes, huh? Uh, quit pushing me out of the car, Leroy. Now, stop that. Whoop. Oh. Yeah. Say, look where you're going, you. You stepped right on my foot. Yeah. I did, officer? Well, why don't you keep those big, uh, flat feet out of my way? They are big, aren't they? Huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, they are big. And uh, clumsy, too. That's true. But, you know, I have the worst time with them, especially when I dance. Yes. I'm not interested in your waltzing dogs. Now, out of my way before I get tough. Oh, don't, don't shout. I've got a splitting headache as it is. Oh, you have. Uh, I'll shout if I want to. Yes, by George, I'd like to see you stop me. Now, really, really, mister, if you're going to create a disturbance, I'm not going to stand here and take it. You're not, eh? Uh, what are you going to do? I'm going home to bed. Oh! <laughs> Wait a minute, aren't you going to arrest me? Oh, oh no, no. As a citizen and no. taxpayer, I insist on being arrested. Well, in that case, you better find a policeman. Yes. Yeah. Aren't you a policeman? Shh. Don't tell a soul. But I'm just getting home from a masquerade ball. Oh. I wish you two children would stop following me around. You're just a jinx. Oh. No matter what I try, I can't get myself arrested. Well, um, did you walk on the grass in the park and pick the flowers like I told you to do? Yes, but that didn't work. Well, you should have waited till you saw a policeman. I did, and all he did was wink at me. How about jaywalking? No arresting people for that these days. I tried jaywalking right on a busy street. What happened? A couple of big trucks just missed me and ran into each other. And the officer didn't arrest you? No, he was too busy separating the truck drivers. <laughs> I even tried to steal a mounted policeman's horse. That should have landed just smacking the hoose down. Well, it would have, except this was a burglar-proof horse. What do you mean? He just sat down in the gutter and refused to move. Well, maybe you better give up, Uncle Moore. No, sir. I'm just as stubborn as the police department. I'm going to jail this afternoon if it takes me all night. Unc, I've been thinking. I know it'll do the trick. It, what is it, my boy? What is it? You see that pile of bricks? The bricks, yes. And see all the pretty straw windows? Oh, Leroy, I don't want to hurt those shopkeepers. Okay, then. How about that row of empty stores across the street? You couldn't hurt anybody there. You're a bright boy, Leroy. Now, you children go back to the car and pretend you don't know me. All right. So long, Uncle Moore. I hope you make it this time. Yeah, thanks. <whistles> uh, better take an armful in case I miss. Well, here goes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem to attract any attention. I better try again. <laughs> what kind of a neighborhood is this? Well, I'll wake him up this time. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> Uh, what's wrong, Marjorie? Look at the signs in those windows you broke. Signs? Where? Oh, yes. Uh, these stores for rent by the Forester Estate. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve agent. Oh, my. Now, go on, Uncle. Here comes a guy. 
Yeah? Do as I told you, and I can't keep you out of the coop. Oh, but this is ridiculous, Leroy. I'm a little embarrassed. I'll get stage fright. Well, you said it was for a worthy cause. I'll be waiting. Huh? Uh, oh, I, I don't like this. Uh, excuse me, buddy, but could you spare a dime for a worthy cup of coffee? Why, sure, pal. I've been up against it myself. Here, here's a quarter. Oh. That's all right. Keep it up. Sooner or later, somebody's going to complain to the cop on the corner. Oh, to think. A Gildersleeve hustling handouts on the highway. Here comes another customer, Uncle Moore. Okay. Makes me feel like a cat. <clears throat> uh, pardon me, lady, but could you spare a dime for a cup of coffee? Why, you poor man, I'll do better than that. I'm going to take you to the nearest restaurant and buy you a nice hot meal. But, madam, I've had my luncheon already. I just forgot to drink my coffee. <laughs> Leroy, I simply refuse to ask another person for another dime for another cup of coffee. Why, I've collected over seven dollars already. <laughs> Here, to give it to some worthy charity, start a fund to buy glasses for nearsighted policemen. What are you going to do now? I'm giving up. I never knew it'd be so hard to get yourself arrested. Come on, your sister's waiting in the car. Oh, well, look, that lady dropped her purse. Hand it here, Leroy. Uh, thanks. Which lady was it, Uncle? The one with the hat like a waffle. Uh, hey, lady! Uh, Leroy, you go to the car while I run ahead and give it back to her. Uh, lady! Oh, oh, lady! Uh, 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 lady! Oh, lady! Uh, uh, lady, I've been whistling at you for a block. I heard you. How dare you follow me? It, I wasn't following you. I was trying to catch you. Oh, what? Uh, here's your purse, lady. You dropped it back there. I did not. But I thought I saw you. I have my purse right here in my hand. What? That was just an excuse to stop me and try to flirt. You masher. Masher? Who, Yes, man? yes. A girl isn't safe anymore with wolves like you roaming the street. Wolves? No, she here. I wish there was a policeman around. I'd teach you a lesson. Quiet, lady. You're attracting a crowd. Why, you ought to be ashamed. Whistling and shouting at a poor girl. Girl? You wouldn't be so bold and sassy if my brother-in-law was here to protect me. Oh, oh my goodness. Excuse me, lady. Uh, maybe I can help you. Quiet, quiet, please. Yes, quiet. Yes, quiet. Uh, what's wrong? This man is bothering me. I am not. Move on, bum. You're bothering the lady. But I just ran after her. It bothered her. Now run away. But I want to give her this purse. I don't want your old purse. My purse? She says she don't want your purse. Now beat it. All right, Mr. Refuse. Wait a second. Who are you to tell me I should beat it? I'm a deputy sheriff, see? Now, if you don't want to be pulled in for mashing... But I swear, Mr. Huh? Oh, is this your purse? Well, I thought it belonged to the other lady. <laughs> Stealing ladies' pocketbooks, too, huh? Huh? Now I got you on two charges. Mashing and purse snatching. Oh, but I tell you, Deputy, I'm innocent. Oh, yeah? Come on now, fatty. Let's get down to the sheriff's office. Well, I just saw it lying there on the sidewalk, mister, and I thought that... Are you coming quietly, or do I have to drag you to jail? I won't come quietly. You can't make me... If... What? You're going to take me to jail? You catch on fast. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on, come on, come on. I just can't wait till we get there. <laughs> in here, fatso. If that's all. Come on, step in there. You think I'm going to carry you across the threshold? Uh, no, no. I'll walk. <laughs> Hey, Spud, you got a roommate. Show this guy the ropes. Sure. Well, make yourself at home, Bunky. What's your name? Uh, Gildersleeve. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Boy, did you pick yourself a phony moniker. Uh, what? Nobody'd ever believe that one. But I assure you, sir, that's my name. Uh, look here, Spud. I don't want to stay around here a moment longer than I have to. Who does? Uh, uh, how's their chances of getting out? I don't know. You got a good lawyer? No, no, no. I mean, how's, how's chances of escaping? You mean take it on the lam? Well, if you want to be technical, yes. Uh, not a chance in the world, Funky. This joint is airtight. Shh. But I've heard otherwise. Yeah, sure. So did I. But I'm still here. What? Why, I bet I tried everything. And I know all the tricks. Shh. You do? Yeah. That's why I'm here. Oh, on account of busting out of all the other joints. But I was told that lots of you robber chaps got free. Then somebody gave you a bum steer, pal. Huh? Why, this is the place that gave him the idea for Alcatraz. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Nobody's ever cracked this jug. Oh, I can hardly believe that. Oh, no? Huh? Well, I'll show you. Hey, deputy. You. Yeah? What is it, Spud? Anybody ever escape out of this cooler? No, nobody's ever escaped out of this cooler. Oh. Hey, Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, yes, sir? You got visitors. Oh, thank you. Come on. 
fine mess Judge Hooker and Ted have gotten me into. The hot cooler. Oh, oh. oh uh, hello, children. Are you all right, Uncle? Gee, you made it after all, didn't you, Uncle? How did you manage to do it? Oh, it's a long story, Marjorie. Remind me to tell it to you some cold winter night when we've got nothing better to do. Now, I want you to get a hold of Ted and Judge Hooker. Yes? Tell them that their information was all wrong. Nobody's ever escaped out of this cooler. You mean you've just been wasting your time? That's it exactly, Roy. Now, you tell them to get me out of this rabbit hutch quick like a bunny. Judge Hooker Chambers. Uh, let me talk to Judge Hooker, please. This is Ted Will speaking. Oh, sorry, Mr. Will. He just left. Oh, I see. When will he be back? Well, in about a week, he said. What? A, a week? Uh, he can't do that. Oh, yes, he can. He's just gone to New York on court business. But he can't go. He's left someone in the lurch. Oh, my goodness. Where's the judge stopping in New York? Well, he hadn't decided. He's going to let me know. Uh, what's the trouble? He's left an innocent man here in jail. Oh, that's what all you lawyers say. Oh. Goodbye. Marge, Leroy, what are we going to do? Poor Uncle Mort. Yeah, poor Uncle Mort. <laughs> I'm going to get out of this jail by and by. Oh, stop it, stop it, Throckmorton, stop it. That's all you've been doing all day long. What are you so cheerful about? You'll soon see, Spud. I'll be out of here quicker and you can walk across this cell. Yeah, well, cut out that singing. I'm punished enough without that. Yeah, I can't help it. I'm so happy about leaving this place. I've just got to sing. Hey, darling, you and I, you know... Hey, Gildersleeve. Huh? You got a visitor. Oh, <laughs> you see, Spud? What did I tell you? <laughs> Thank you, deputy. Hey, darling, you and I know the reason why I'm such a happy guy. Oh, well, hello, Bertie. I'm glad to see you. Uh, where is everybody? They were afraid to come down, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, afraid? What were they afraid of? Afraid of you. They sent me down to break the bad news. What bad news? Judge Hooker done forgot all about you and went to New York for a week. What? Yes, sir. I told you something bad was going to happen. He can't do this to me. Bertie, did you ring me a habeas corpus? I'm sorry, Mr. Gillsleeve. All I brought you was a roast chicken. I don't want a roast chicken. I would... Hey, I do want a roast chicken. Where is it? The man at the door, he done took it away from me. Why, that petty chiseler. But I don't think he's going to enjoy eating it. Why not? <laughs> I stuffed it with some little sauce, some fries, and a little gun. <laughs> If you don't shut up, the warden's going to send you to solitary. Uh, let him send me to any place. As long as it's out of here. You know, you're the screwiest cellmate I ever roomed with, Funky. Yeah? The other prisoners are circulating a petition demanding your removal. Oh. Now, why don't you just sit down like a good little fella and write another letter to the newspaper? No, I've been framed and double-crossed. And they were going to name a statue after me in a memorial park. I'm really a member of the Clean Government Association. Well, you certainly don't act like it. Huh? In the past three days, you've tried to set the cell on fire four times. Yeah. And the rest of the time, you're either trying to bribe the guards or you're organizing a jailbreak. Gildersleeve, you ain't playing the game. <laughs> I don't want to play any games. I just want to play the anvil course on a certain judge's head with a baseball bat. All right, Gildersleeve, get your things. You're leaving. Uh, leaving, I am? Oh, I can hardly believe that. <laughs> oh, this makes me very happy. Uh, that makes it unanimous. Oh, uh, uh, goodbye, Spud. Ah! Uh, try, to, uh, try to keep out of mischief from now on, Spud. Well, goodbye, boys. Uh, behave yourselves. Get out of here, Bum! Yeah, glad to, <laughs> Bum. Uncle <laughs> Moore, you're free. Oh, hello, children. Uh, hello, Ted. Hello, Hooker. Hello. Well, it took you long enough to get me out of here. How oh, guilty it was all a mistake. Uh, let's not discuss it here. Shall we go? Yes. But first, I want to ask you two great civic leaders a question. Where did you get your phony information? From a fortune teller? It wasn't phony. And why did you have to yell your head off about our investigation? It's all over town now. What difference does that make now, Hooker? There's nothing to prosecute here. The jail is escape-proof. I found that out. 
And from what I saw, it's run on the level, too. Of course it is. I knew that all along. Then why in the name of common sense did you send me here? That's just it. We didn't tell you to come here, Gildersleeve. What? No, this is the county jail. We told you to go to the city jail. Oh, my... Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I wonder how many of you housewives baked a cake or some cookies yesterday for your Sunday dinner today. A lot of you did, I'm sure, because there's just nothing like that real home-baked flavor. Well, here's a hint for the next time you bake. For luscious extra flavor in cookies, cakes, or pastries, use delicious parquet margarine for the shortening. You see, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not just a bland, tasteless fat. Yes, the same delicious flavor that makes parquet grand for table use makes it marvelous for baking, too. And that's why so many women also use parquet margarine for seasoning hot vegetables and for pan frying. But whether you use parquet margarine at the table, for seasoning, for baking, or for pan frying, you're adding valuable nourishment to your family's diet. And every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. And remember, good as parquet tastes and nourishing as it is, Parquet is so economical, you can use all you want. So why not join the thousands of Parquet users and order a pound or two tomorrow? Just ask for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's the margarine that's made by Kraft. You did, Spud? How? Well, somebody did escape out of that cooler. Uh, they did? Who? Me. So long, Throcky. Uh, Spud! Uh, Spud! You're not playing the game. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents... The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that these are challenging days for every one of us. It's our duty to produce more to help meet our country's increasing needs. And that takes plenty of good food, as you wise homemakers know. Wholesome, nutritious food that provides the energy and nourishment your hard-working, hard-playing family needs. That's why you should know about parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is a delicious food that's packed full of wholesome nourishment. It's one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And important to you housewives who know how essential vitamins are, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. 
making it a reliable year-round source for your whole family. What's more, parquet is the margarine with the delicious flavor, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. So why not give your family the benefit of this grand-tasting, nourishing food? Tomorrow, ask your dealer for a pound or two of economical parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Come on, wake up, Judge Hooker. Pay attention to your checkers. It's your move. I know it, Gildersleeve. I was merely studying the board. What, with your eyes closed? (laughs) Let's speed this up. We haven't got all night here. All right. There, there. There and there. <laughs> now crown me. I'd love to, but I haven't got anything to do it with. Hooker, I don't see how you keep beating me, honestly. In fact, I don't think you do, honestly. Gildersleeve, you're a pushover. You couldn't win a game from a backward baboon with a dozen checkers up your sleeve. I could, too. Um, I mean, I wouldn't need a dozen checkers. I'll show you, Hooker. Set them up again and pull in your belt. Because this time I'm going to beat the hell of Leroy. How are you tonight? <laughs> Judge Hooker. Leroy. Say, Unc, can I... Uh, can you what, Leroy? Well, I hate to keep pestering you, Bart, but can I see the circus tomorrow afternoon? Not unless they happen to pitch the tent in the front yard of the Peter B. Flugelhammer Junior High School. Is that where you go, Leroy? Yeah, Flugy Junior High. Say, I grew up with Peter B. Flugelhammer Sr. That's who the Junior High School was named after. If, well, I thought the school was named after Peter B. Flugelhammer Jr. No, Junior was the son of Sr. after whom the Junior High School was named. Poor Junior. He never could finish senior high. Yo. But gee, Uncle Mort, could you call up school and ask if I could skip tomorrow? I did, Leroy. I even went so far as to predict that you wouldn't be feeling very well tomorrow. What did they say? They told me that an excuse for illness while the circus is in town must be accompanied by a note from your doctor. Shucks, that's a heck of a note. Yes, yes. (laughs) Well, there's no use grousing, young man. Remember, school must come first. Now, sit down and get started with your homework. Yes, Leroy, your homework, that's the thing that's going to count in later life, not going to the circus. I don't think so, Judge, because in my later life, I expect to be a lion tamer. Oh? You don't need any education for that. All you need is a kitchen chair and the right kind of breakfast food. (laughs) Well, yes. This lion taming is new, though. Last week, you were going to become a pitcher with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, that was last week. Oh, Gee, I wouldn't mind missing the circus so much, Uncle Mort, but I hate to see those passes go to waste. Oh, did you get passes, Gildersleeve? Did I get passes? Yes, sir. I've got certain connections. Yeah, Uncle Mort gets the right number of beans in that jar in the drugstore window. Oh. Yes, I connected that time. <laughs> Gee, Uncle Mort, are you sure you can't take me? I'm sorry, Leroy, but you'd better make up your mind to skip the circus. Oh, gee, a guy can't get any fun out of life. Yeah. You know, Gildersleeve, sometimes I think our school system has become too scientific, too streamlined. You're right, Judge. These days, everything is streamlined. Uh, except me. <laughs> Yes. Things were a lot different in the days when I went to school. <laughs> what a memory. I sat, I sat next to Petey Flugelhammer. Huh? That was long before he was elected lieutenant governor and then named the school after himself. Oh. We had none of this modern stuff like getting a doctor's prescription to go to the circus. Yes, it was the same in my school days too, Judge. Of course, I'm not as old as you are. What do you mean, Gildersleeve? You were shaving when I was a little shaver. I was not. You were too. All right, all right. I was always taught not to contradict my elders. (laughs) Come to think of it, Judge, we kids used to have a lot more fun than modern children have. I can still remember some of the tricks we pulled at school. So do I. Shenanigans, they were called. Yes. I'll never forget the time I dropped a paper bag full of water on the Spanish teacher. Only it turned out to be the new athletic coach. And when he caught me, boy, was he athletic. (laughs) That's nothing. I once sneaked up behind Miss Pettibone's desk and tacked her dress to the floor. (laughs) Kids don't do a thing like that these days. Kids can't do a thing like that these days. (laughs) Say, uh, Judge, did you ever put eggs in the principal's umbrella? No, did you? Uh Uh-huh. I had my own hen and I saved eggs for a rainy day. (laughs) 
I can still see him lifting that umbrella over his head. <laughs> well, I put alum in the water pitcher at our graduation exercises. Oh, that's a peachy stunt. <laughs> what happened? I didn't graduate. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, youth. Sometimes I wish I were a kid again, just so I could pull a few more of those cute little innocent juvenile pranks. Well, they're a thing of the past. Yeah. I never hear of kids doing those things these days. Not enough imagination, I guess. That's right. You know, I remember when a dog and pony show came to our town and all us kids made up our minds to go. You know how we got the afternoon off? No, how? Well, I climbed up on the schoolhouse roof and stuffed my coat into the chimney. <laughs> Boy, I wish you could have seen that smoke pour in and those kids pour out. <laughs> Gildy, I'll bet you were car. Oh, that wasn't anything. Did I ever tell you about the time we smuggled the horse up in the bell tower at college? No. <laughs> you know, Uncle Mort, tell us about it. Well, I borrowed this. Leroy, I didn't know that you were still here. Sure, you told me to do my homework. Say, did you ever do any homework, Uncle Morse? Uh, stacks of it. Gee, when did you find the time? Didn't it interfere with your jokes? Yeah. Now see what you've done, Gildersleeve, giving the boy a wrong impression of our childhood. Me? You started it, tacking teacher's skirts to the floor. <laughs> and you, a superior court judge. Well, aren't you ashamed? Well, how about you, egging the principal on and trying to brain everybody with bags of water? What do you mean, everybody? Just our Spanish teacher, Miss Olson, that's all. <laughs> now, Leroy, don't get us wrong. Judge Hooker and I were merely reminiscing about an era that doesn't exist anymore. I'll say it doesn't. You couldn't get away with those corny gags today. Those gags weren't corny, Leroy. They were mighty clever. <coughs> huh? Oh, yes, yes. They were terrible. The big kids made me do them. I'm ashamed of myself. Aren't you, Judge Hooker? Yes. I was a bad boy. <laughs> yes. You see, Leroy? Gee, you two treat me as if I was 12 years old. You are 12 years old, Leroy. Sure, I know, but I don't like to be treated that way. Yeah. You'll have to hurry, Marjorie, if you're going to the circus with me. I'm almost ready. What's the rush, Uncle Mort? Well, I'd like to get there on time for once. No matter when I start, it seems I always arrive in time to get caught in the opening procession. One year, a hippopotamus chased me around the ring twice. I never did find my seat. <laughs> well, too bad Leroy couldn't get off from school to come with us. Yes, the poor boy. Well, we'll bring him back a red balloon and a little whip it, with a tassel. <laughs> hey, anybody home? Hi. Leroy! Gee, I'm glad I caught you before you left for the circus. Leroy, what are you doing home at this hour? School was dismissed just now. Come on, let's go to the circus. By the way, Leroy... Why were classes dismissed? Well, uh, you might call it an accident. Accident? What was the accident? Oh, nothing serious. Then what was it? Oh, it seems they had to get all the students out quick on account of all the rooms had to be aired out. Aired out? They did? Why? Well, nobody knows for sure exactly, but the general opinion is that uh, somehow or other, a skunk got into the air conditioning system. Oh! <laughs> I've ever seen. How did you like the fellow who did the swan dive into the tank of burning gasoline, Uncle Mort? I liked him, but I don't think Secretary Ickes would. <laughs> Leroy, there's something that's been troubling me. It's that skunk in your school. You mean Mr. Proctor, the principal? No, Leroy. <laughs> the one that got into the air conditioning system. Do you happen to know how it got in there? No, I don't. Say, remember the tiger that rode on the elephant's back? How did they train him to do that, Uncle Mort? Oh, with kindness, I suppose. Uh, Leroy, did you happen to have anything to do with it? With the tiger, Uncle Mort? No, the skunk! That wasn't a skunk, Uncle. It was a tiger. Tigers and skunks have different kinds of stripes. I know they have. I'm talking about school. But, you know, I've been thinking. Isn't it a strange coincidence that this accident occurred on the day the circus came to town? Yeah, funny, ain't it? Uh. Say, Uncle Mort, what do you think would happen if when the lion tamer had his head in the lion's mouth, the lion suddenly had a sneeze? Well, I don't think anyone would say gazoontite. <laughs> now, Leroy, I hope that nothing Judge Hooker and I said about our school day pranks caused you to try to imitate us. Oh, no, sir. You understand we were just talking about old times. Yes, sir, like Judge Hooker says. That's about all you old-timers have got left. Your memory. Yeah. What did you say? Uh, good afternoon.
afternoon, Bertie. Is Leroy home from school yet? Well, let me look in the refrigerator. Uh, no, sir. Did you expect to find him in there? <laughs> no, but I can tell if he's here by what ain't. <laughs> well, maybe he wasn't hungry this afternoon. That boy? Why, he's nothing but appetite held together by skin and bones. Oh, what's the matter? Well, there's a lot of strange things going on at Leroy's school, and I'm afraid that maybe I'm partly to blame. How come you messing around the school? Is you one of them pants teachers? <laughs> no, it's just that Judge Hooker and I were talking about some little pranks we used to play when we were in school. A little uh, harmless things, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, well, Leroy happened to overhear us, and now I'm afraid he's showing us the modern versions with the uh, chromium trimmings. Uh-huh. Uh, what makes you think little Leroy's doing pomodiddles? Well, uh, did you read the afternoon paper? No, sir. It never gets to me till the following morning. Oh, yes. Well, I've got it right here. Listen to this. Juvenile Joker startles school. Police were called early today to investigate a large, stout lady's body seen suspended from the window of Principal Poultney Proctor at Flugelhammer Junior High School. Oh, who was it, Miss Proctor? Yes. No. Listen. Closer inspection revealed that the body was a dummy, stuffed with old football pads, wearing a green and purple silk dress, size 48. Green and purple silk? Size 48? Yeah. Sounds like my Sunday go-to-meeting dress, the one that was kidnapped off the clothesline last night. Yes, doesn't it? Well, what's my dress doing in the newspaper? I don't know, Bertie. <laughs> Shh, hey, Bertie, here comes Leroy. Do you think he did it? Shh, yeah. Afternoon, Uncle Morse. Hiya, Bertie. Say, is this your old dress? That's my new dress, Leroy, and what you doing with it? Why, Piggy Banks just gave it to me. He says the wind must have blown it over into his yard. He found it under a window. Young man, isn't this the dress that was hanging out of Mr. Proctor's window this morning? You mean on the dummy that was suspended from school? If... Well, how could it be if it belongs to Bertie? What do you think, Bertie? I ain't saying nothing. I'm only too glad to get my dress back without paying ransom. I'm going to hide it this time. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Uh, look, Leroy, don't think of me just as your uncle and your guardian. Think of me as your pal, your buddy. Now, if there's anything that's troubling your little mind, why don't you just come right out with it? Well... Okay, Uncle. There, there is something that's been bothering me. I understand. Go right ahead, my boy. What is it? Well, how did you ever get that horse up into the bell tower at college? Oh! <laughs> I asked you to come here tonight, Judge Hooker, is because you and I are turning Leroy's school topsy-turvy. Why, I haven't been near the place. We've been doing it by remote control. Remember how we shot off our mouths in front of Leroy about our school day monkey shines? Yes, and say, I just remembered another one. Forget it. Leroy has been up to all our old tricks. Oh, his teachers have caught him, huh? No, that kid's smarter than we were. But we got to stop him from going on with him. Well, maybe if I gave him a little lecture... Hooker, you don't understand children. That wouldn't work at all. We've got to pretend we don't know what's going on. That shouldn't be hard for you to do. <laughs> when Leroy comes in, that'll be our cue to start casually chatting about the evils of practical joking. Yeah. Yeah, subtle propaganda, you know. How about it, Hooker? We can try it. Too bad this whole thing had to happen. You know, Gildersleeve, it would never have started if you hadn't opened your fat face. Me? Why, it was you that started it, you little travesty on justice. Is that so? Why, Gildersleeve, if you had the intelligence of a jackass... Uh, but no, why should I daydream? <laughs> There's no use arguing with you. Why not? Because I don't argue with blubberheads. Well, I do, you blubberhead. <laughs> Just because you're a judge, do you think? No, I can answer that myself. You don't think. Don't you provoke me, you big water wind. Oh, that settles it. I'm going to lambaste you with... Oh. Excuse me, I didn't think... Oh, uh, oh, come right in, Leroy. I was uh, I was just telling Judge Hooker how to uh, baste the lamb. Wasn't I, Judge Hooker? <laughs> huh? Uh, oh, yes, yeah. yes. Don't let us disturb you, Leroy, my boy. Go right ahead and do your homework. Just pay no attention to us. I won't. Uh, uh, as we were saying, Judge, uh, don't you think that juvenile delinquency often starts with some innocent boyish prank? When were we saying that? Oh, uh, of course, Gildersleeve. Uh. Quite often, a young fella starts out for a lark and winds up in a cage. 
How's that? Oh, Judge. <laughs> then you think that uh, practical joking can lead to uh, serious consequences? Surely. Yeah. It starts out with a fellow dipping girls' pigtails into ink wells, and then he becomes bored with that and puts firecrackers in the coal scuttle. Yes. Or water in the teacher's galoshes, and then setting them out to freeze. Never heard of that one before. Huh? That's only good in real cold weather. Well, in summertime, you can always put flypaper on all the chairs. Yes. With the words, kick me, printed on the back. <laughs> Say, I did that when I was in fourth grade. You should have seen the fun at recess. <laughs> you know, I used to hunt for frogs during recess and put them all in the lunchboxes. <laughs> Once I made a mistake and put one in my own lunchbox. <laughs> 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 Did I tell you about the time that I snagged our principal's wig with a fish pole and then hoisted it to the top of the flagpole? Oh, boy. I wish I could have seen... Oh, my goodness. What have we been saying? Huh? Leroy, don't you pay any attention to this old... Go uh, say, where is Leroy? I don't know. You said pretend he wasn't here, and by George, he isn't. Yes, and a lucky thing, too. How did we ever get started talking like that again? I remember distinctly. You began it, Gildersleeve. Me? Who are you, feeble little fuddle-headed fuddy-duddy? Smile when you say that, Gildersleeve. Smile? I'll laugh right out loud. <laughs> Marjorie. Hello, Pierpont. I came to see Meatball. Who? Meatball. You know, Leroy. Only you don't like us kids to call him Leroy anymore. Like I don't like to be called Pierpont. All right. Piggy. <laughs> Come on in. Oh, Leroy. Piggy Banks is here to see you. Come on to the library, Piggy. It's right that way. Thanks. Well, come on in. Don't be bashful. But your uncle, that's him behind that newspaper, ain't it? What's the matter with him? Oh, nothing. He always does that after dinner. He's digesting his food. Oh. Ain't we going to disturb him? No, we had roast beef and potatoes for dinner. Nothing will bother Unc for another hour at least. <laughs> now, let's get going on that history stuff. Well, I know Miss Keller's going to ask us about the vice presidents tomorrow. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. She's going through the book exactly the way she did last year, the first time I took the course. <laughs> okay, I, I think I've got to memorize. But is she going to ask us the names of all the vice presidents? She did last year. I kept a diary. All right, but gee, what a question to ask. Well, you check the list and see if I get them right. Shoot. Uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh, uh, Aaron Burr... You said that. Mm. Say, Meepo, what do you think of the stuff that's been pulled off at school lately? Oh, I don't know. What do you think of it? Oh, I don't know. Have any idea who's doing it? Gee, I don't know. You got any idea? Well, I don't know. Who do you think? I don't know. Let's get back to the vice president. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, John Adams, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh, say, I wonder who put the iron sulfide in Miss Keller's inkwell. How'd you know it was iron sulfide, Meatball? Shucks, anybody knows that's the stuff that puts the smell in inkwell. You know who pulled that one, Piggy? Let's get back to Vice President. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh, oh, gee, I don't know what good knowing the vice president's is going to do a guy who's going to be a stunt man in the movies. I thought you were going to be a lion tamer. Well, lion taming's just one of the stunts I'm going to do. Talking about stunts, did you hear about the one somebody just pulled tonight over in the schoolyard? Which one's that? Ah, I bet you know about it already. Well, maybe I do and maybe I don't. I ain't saying. What are you talking about? Oh, about what they did to old man Flugerhammer's statue. Somebody dressed him up in a set of red flannel underwear and a corset. No kidding. Yeah. Boy, if they ever find out who did that, they'd be expelled from school prano, I bet. <laughs> Let, let's get on with the vice president's pig. All right. Say, could I borrow a glass of water? We had corned beef for dinner. Sure. Come on out in the kitchen. I'll get it for you. Boy, wait till Mr. Proctor sees the willies on Flugie. Uh, did I hear right? Red flannels in the corset on Flugie? Or was I just dreaming? No, there's Piggy Banks' hat. It's true. 
Oh, let me think. Yes, that's what I'll have to do. Yes, six. Hooker's just as much to blame as I am. I can't let Leroy be expelled. Hello, Judge. This is Gildersleeve. You've got to help me with something. I can't explain now, but I'll pick you up in about ten minutes. We've got a date with an old schoolmate of yours. right part of the schoolyard? Why, of course. Not so loud, Gildersleeve. Oh. I'm a superior court judge. Can you picture what would happen if I'm caught? Yes, yeah, scandalous, isn't it? <laughs> oh, why do I let you get me into situations like this? Because you haven't got any more brains than I have. And where in the name of Goots and Borglum is that statue? Oops. Never mind, I found it. <laughs> yeah, that's Flugelhammer up there. Flannels, corsets, and all... Let's not hang around here all night, Gildersleeve. Come on, I'll boost you up. Well, wait a minute, I'll take this top coat off. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. All right, get down now. <sighs> Upsie daisy. Oh. oh, my poor back. You'll cave it in. <laughs> Push my other foot up, Judge. I will if you take it out of my hip pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. Is that better? No. Ow, now it's in my ear. Well, in one ear, not the other. If... Gildersleeve, get up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. What's wrong? Judge, you notice a sudden cold wind? <laughs> no, can't say that I do. Which way is it coming? Up. <laughs> the judge, hold my feet so I won't fall. I got him, I got him. You're all right. Solid as a rock. No, no, you're holding Pete's feet. What? The flat-footed Fugelhammer. Yeah, that's better. Now I can get to work. I wonder where Leroy ever found this corset. Make it snappy, Gildersleeve. Who do you think you are, Gypsy Rose Lee? Yep. Okay, okay, I've got it now. Here, catch it, Judge. Hurry up before somebody catches us. All right. Hey, Leroy must have sewn this underwear on. I never knew the little rascal could sew. How's it coming, Gildy? Just another second, yeah. Cut out that whistling, Judge. I'm not whistling. That must be the night watchman. Oh. Come on, rip it off. Let's grab. Okay, head for the car, Judge. Hey, who's there? Uh, this way, Judge. Quit calling me Judge, Gildersleeve. Oh, oh. You. Don't you believe him, Gildy? Oh! Scatter, Judge, scatter. I'll meet you at the drugstore. <laughs> the principal sent for us, Uncle Mort. Well, now, you let me handle the whole thing, Marjorie. Do you think that Leroy might be in some trouble? Well, I didn't want to tell you, Marjorie, but your brother has turned his school into a midget version of Hell's Apoppin. <gasps> Leroy? But he had such a fine record. He had, until he heard Judge Hooker and me brag about the foolish antics we performed as children. Oh, I hang my head when I think of it. And I'd like to hang the judges, too. Oh, now, Uncle Mort, he can't be that serious. No? Well, come on. You'll see. You know, after all, boys will be boys. Leroy is just a bit high-spirited. And what's wrong with that, sir? You were a boy once yourself, weren't you? Me? No. Uh, I was talking to the principal. <laughs> Rehearsing, I mean. <laughs> after you, my dear. Yes. Look at George Washington and the cherry tree. Just high spirits? Washington was a boy, too. We were all boys. Uncle, are you all right? Of course I am. No, no, I'm not. It's been a long, long time since I was called to the principal's office, but I still get that old feeling. Me too. Yeah. Well, brace up, Uncle Mort. Here we are. Okay. Let's go in. Hope he doesn't make us stay after school, Marjorie. Uh, Mr. Proctor? Yes? If I'm Leroy Forrester's uncle, and this is his sister, Marjorie. Well, I'm glad to see you two. I want to talk to you about that young man. Yes, I know, Mr. Proctor. Really, he's a fine boy at heart. I realize that. There's something I want to tell you. Sure, about. but you were a boy once yourself, weren't you, Mr. Proctor? Well, of course I was. Uh, you see, Marjorie, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Mr. Proctor was a boy once himself. <laughs> Probably high-spirited, too. Surely. Now, about your nephew. I hope you're not going to be harsh with him. But why should I be, Mr. Forrester? Uh, excuse me, my name's Gildersleeve. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Glad to meet you, Miss Sigurd. 
Did you say Gildersleeve? Yes. Did I say something wrong? That happens to be my name. And does that happen to be your top coat hanging on that hook? Where? If... Yes. How did it happen to get here? Last night, that coat with your name in it was found by our night watchman. Oh, my goodness. Excuse me. I just remembered a dental appointment. One moment. There's something else that belongs to you. Your red flannel underwear and your corset. Corset? What? Uncle Mort! I don't understand. Neither does Mr. Proctor. I understand only too well. Are you ashamed of yourself? A grown man. A big, fat, grown man. Going around at night putting union suits on statues. Yes. Uncle Mort, what is this? Now, can't you explain? Sure, if I can get a word in edgewise. Actions speak louder than words, Gildersleeve. It's a lucky thing for you that Leroy Forrester is your nephew. It is? Yes. I'd expose you in a minute. But I don't want to spoil Leroy's big day. Leroy's big day? Oh, what has he done now? That's why I sent for you. Today, he's going to be presented with a Chamber of Commerce medal as the outstanding student in Flugelhammer Junior High School. What? Leroy? Well, I knew it all along. The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I want to ask you, what is the most welcome compliment a hostess can receive? Well, I'm told it's sincere appreciation of the dishes she serves, comments on the lightness of her cakes, the flakiness of her pie crust, exclamations on how downright good everything tastes. So here's a tip for you housewives. For baking that's sure to win compliments, use delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not a bland, tasteless fat. Yes, the same delicate appetizing taste that makes parquet margarine so delicious for table use gives added flavor to baked foods, too. And parquet mixes so easily and creams so smoothly, it's really pleasant to use. Remember, too, that parquet margarine's flavor makes pan-fried foods taste better, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And whether you serve delicious parquet margarine at the table or use it for cooking, you are giving your family a nutritious, wholesome energy food. Remember, too, that parquet is an excellent source of vitamin A. So give your family the benefits of this delightful, nourishing food. Serve them economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. That's a beautiful medal, Leroy, and I'm mighty proud of you. But, uh... Won't you answer just one question for me, my boy? What is it, Unc? Who was responsible for all those escapades around your school? Now, Uncle Mort, I, I positively don't know. What's more, I don't want to know. And, and even if I did know, you don't think I'd squeal on my pal Piggy, do you? Uh, you're a bright boy, Leroy. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, here's what a prominent government official said about nutrition not long ago. This official said that in times like these, proper nutrition is as important as fighting planes. Yes, we all need the right foods and plenty of them to keep up the pace our great defense effort demands. So you'll be glad to know that parquet margarine, made by Kraft, is one of the right foods and that it's so economical you can use all you need. 
You see, parquet margarine not only has delicious flavor that makes it grand for table use, baking, and pan frying, parquet contains lots of valuable food elements, too. Yes, wholesome parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food. In fact, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And what's more, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. But just because parquet margarine is good for you, don't think it isn't good tasting. Why, parquet's delicate, appetizing flavor has made it a favorite with families all over the country, both for table use and for cooking. So try it. Buy a pound or two of delicious parquet margarine tomorrow. Yes, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, and his niece and nephew, Marjorie and Leroy. They're trying to entertain a friend of Marjorie's, Oliver Honeywell, a chap who's taken so many pills that he's beginning to look like one. Today, Oliver is the man who came to lunch and stayed through tea and dinner. It's after nine now, and a quiz game is in progress. Now, the next question is for you, Uncle Mort. Okay. I love quizzes. Let's hear it, Leroy. Well, what's the difference between Niagara Falls and your friend Judge Hooker? There's no difference. They're both big drips. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, that's wrong. Oh, is it? The difference between them is that Niagara is a mountain fountain and the judge is a legal legal. Oh, Oh, yeah. Well, I see. Now whose turn is it? (laughs) It's your turn next, Oliver. Uh Boy, this one's a sing. Can you tell us who was the third assistant secretary of agriculture in President McKinley's administration? Oof. Oh, that wasn't fair, Leroy. No, that, that's too hard, Leroy. Oh, no, 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 it isn't. Uh, third Assistant Secretary of Agriculture McKinney's administration, uh, Lucius Ann Follinsby. Yep. That's right. I, <laughs> I remember. It is? That's great, Oliver. Oliver, that's wonderful. Oh, really, it's nothing. A fellow shouldn't get any credit for remembering his own grandfather's name. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you had me fooled for a minute. I thought you were smart. Yes, Leroy. Well, next is Marjorie's turn. Huh? Huh? Sis, what does it mean if you say, throw up the sponge? Um, I give up. Absolutely correct. Oh, my God. Very good. Yeah. Uh, now, the scores so far are Oliver, 27, uh-huh. Marjorie, 19, and Uncle Mort, minus two. Uh, young man, <laughs> what do you mean, minus two? You answered one question wrong twice. It's twice? <laughs> now, here's your chance to make up, Uncle. Uh? It's in arithmetic. Arithmetic. If Jones buys 50 bales of hay and 100 bushels of barley for $300... Yes? ...and the barley costs four times as much as the hay, how much did each bale cost? Oh, my. Let me get paper and pencils. Uh, 50 bales, 100 bushels... It's $300. Mr. Jones should have bought defense bonds. <laughs> the idea. Oh, what's that? Half past nine. Leroy, I've got a question for you this time. If 9.30 equals your bedtime and you haven't done your homework yet, how do you expect to know your lessons tomorrow if you have to go to sleep now? Gee, that's an easy one, Uncle Mort. All those questions I've been asking you people are my homework. Oh, well, it's all done. It is? <laughs> <laughs> You're a bright boy, Leroy. Say, can we just finish this game, Uncle Mort? Yeah, <clears throat> I sort of lost interest in this Gee, game. I thought it was fun. So. You would. Oh. Now scamper off to bed, Leroy. Gee whiz, I'm not a bit sleepy. Why can't I stay up? It's the same thing every Sunday night. First Jack Benny, then Charlie McCarthy, and after that trying to get Leroy to go to bed. But, Uncle Mort, you stay up a lot later than this. Why can't I? Because you're growing, Leroy, and I'm not. No, maybe not in the same direction as I am. Have up, Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh. well, leave Uncle's waistline out of this. You leave it out. You brought it in. Yep. <laughs> children, children, let's drop my waistline. It's dropped too far already. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, young man. Oh, are you going to bed, Uncle Mort? Sweet dreams. No, you're the one who's going to bed. Yes, and let's not discuss it anymore. But, but... That's but... all, brother. <laughs> but it isn't fair. It's not democratical. I'd like to stay up as late as everybody else. Well, let me see. Can I, Uncle Mort? Uh, promise to go to bed the minute we do? Gee, of course I promise. Then you can remain up as late as Marjorie and I. Boy, that's keen. Well, I'm pretty sleepy right now. How about you, Marjorie? What? Oh, yes, yes, uh... 
Oh, I can hardly keep my eyes open. Yeah. Oh, I catch on. It's a trick to make me go to bed now. <laughs> You've made your bed, Leroy. Now get into it. <laughs> In that case, maybe I should... I'll get it. Well, if that's my mama, you tell her not to worry. Yeah. Leroy. Hello? Hello? Oh, hi, Pig. You're pe- it's for me. It's Piggy Banks. Piggy mm-hmm. Banks. What is that, Pig? What for? Oh, no, no, Uncle Mort wouldn't... Huh? No, I wouldn't even ask him. Oh, it's too bad, Pig, but that's the breaks of the game. Goodbye. Uh, I don't want to intrude in your private affairs, Leroy, but what is it Piggy Banks wanted to do? Oh, he wanted to come over here tonight to carve out his pumpkin for Halloween. Well, I'd have no objection to that. Yeah, but he wanted to use you for the model. You? <laughs> you go straight to bed, young man. We're all going to bed now. Oh. Uh, well, in that case, maybe I should. Yes, you should, Oliver. Oh. Uh, good night. Uh, Marjorie, don't let Oliver forget his overcoat tonight. It's awfully chilly, and he might catch something he hasn't got already. <laughs> Mr. Gilsleeve, I didn't bring any overcoat. I didn't expect to be invited for tea and dinner, too. I... Invited? Uh, oh, well. my. I hate to think you'd be going clear across town on the streetcar. Oh, Midgey, the streetcar doesn't bother me. It's the waiting and the walking. Yes, and in the dark, too. <laughs> Say, uh, why don't you stay here for the night, Oliver? Oh, that's a splendid idea. Where can we put him, Uncle Moore? Uh, on the sofa in the study. It's the kind that collapses into a bed. <laughs> oh, no, thanks, really. I don't think I should. Why not? I'll fix you up with a pair of my pajamas. Oh, I don't think I could sleep in a strange pair of pajamas. Yes. <laughs> uh, and besides, uh? besides that, don't you think they'd be a trifle large? Oh, come, come, Oliver. It'll be fun. Like sleeping in a tent. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll bring out a couple of spare blankets and a pillow. Oh, yes. never mind the pillow, Midgey. I'm allergic to feathers. Uh, feathers? Is that so? Oh, yes. You know, I have it so bad I even break out with spots when I eat chicken broth. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you better telephone your parents and tell them you won't be home tonight, Oliver. Oh, yes, I better. Otherwise, Mom would have to send Pop out to look for me. Uh, then she'd have to go out to look for Pop. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll get the blankets. Uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, hello, Mama. Mama, this is Oliver. Yes. What's that? Papa's been out looking for me already. Well, it isn't ten yet, Mama. Oh, we want to get an early start. Uh, you better go find him, Mama. Uh, try the place on the corner. Oh, not the drugstore. The place in the other corner. I don't know why he always goes there. I never do. Well, you just push open the doors and call in. That's a... What? Oh, I'm still at Midgey's house. Yeah, Mama. They invited me to spend the night here on account I didn't bring an overcoat. I did? I must have left on a streetcar, huh? Well, I got my pills. Uh, don't worry, I'll keep out of drafts. Good night, Mama. Poor Mama. You know, she doesn't seem to realize that I'm a big boy now. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's very hard to believe, Oliver. Oh, I, I almost forgot. Here. Uh, what's this nickel for? Oh, for the phone call. I never like to be under obligations to people. Yes, I can see that. Well, everything's ready for you, Oliver. Yeah, go right in and make yourself comfortable, Oliver. I'm going to lock up. Uh-huh. Oh, be sure all the downstairs windows are fastened, Uncle Mort. There have been some burglars in the neighborhood lately. Burglars? Oh, don't worry, Oliver. Go right in and get ready for bed. If a burglar ever saw you in my pajamas, he'd put back everything he took. <laughs> I wonder who built these windows. The Pullman Company? Oh, my bunion. Oh, uh, almost forgot to wind the kitchen clock. <laughs> Somebody already wound it. Oh, oh! excuse me, Aesop. <laughs> I didn't mean to step on your tail. <laughs> now, scat cat, scram, go, outside. Yeah. Everything locked up tight, Uncle Moore? Yes, yeah. a burglar would need three policemen to help him get in here. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I guess it was the company we had for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, see you in the morning. Huh? Good night, Uncle Moore. Yeah, good night, my dear. Good night, Uncle Moore. What, you still up? Uh, good night, Leroy. Good night, Uncle Roy. Good night. What's that? Ooh. Oh, oh, good night, Oliver.
woke me up. There must be a fire somewhere near here. How about let's go on and see? You better ask your Uncle Mort first. Okay. Fear, Mom and Pop. Hey, Uncle Mort, can I go to a fire? Huh? What's that? There's a fire somewhere as close. Can I go see it? A fire? Oh, boy, I haven't done one for years. And I just love to go to blazes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excuse me. I should have known. This way. Yeah, thanks. Now, let's hurry outside or the fire will be out before we are. See, this is fun. Huh? Hey, Marge, let's go. Here's Uncle Moore. Yeah, let's get Oliver. You think he'd be interested? Sure, it'll be a tonic for his nerves. Oh, Oliver. Yes, Mama, I'm getting off. You? <laughs> I'm not your mama. Come on outside with us. Hurry up. What's wrong? There's a fire, Oliver. Fire? Oh, oh my goodness. Come on, let's go. Oh, right away. Wait a Wait for us, Oliver. Uh, Leroy, bring Oliver's shoes. Hey, come on, Marjorie. Hey, Oliver, come back here. Where's the fire? It's somewhere around the corner, Oliver. Is it coming this way? No, we're going that way. Come on. <laughs> Here's your shoes, Oliver. You better put them on before you wear out your socks. Oh, thanks, Leroy. Uh, all right, let's not spend all night here. The fire won't wait for us, you know. Oliver, you can tie your shoelaces afterwards. As you say, Mr. Gill. Oh, thank you. Oh, on second thought, Oliver, you better tie them now. I might as well, now that I'm down. Gee, this is the latest I've been out since the night I went walking in my sleep. Yeah, well, let's take a quick look at the fire and scoot back to bed. I wonder whose house it is. Well, we'll soon see. I think the engine's right around the corner. They are? Oh, oh I yes, see a lot of people. Yes, there they yeah. are. Gee, look at all the neighbors. There's nothing like a good fire to bring out all the best people. <laughs> Everybody must have gotten up. Huh? Oh, look, there's Edie Quinn. Wearing the same kimono she wore to that fire last year. Yes. We carry it. Well, here we are. I don't see any fire. I better find out what this is all about. Uh, let me through here, please. I excuse me, lady. Oh, uh, pardon me, chief, but could you direct me to the fire? Mister, I wish you could direct me. We can't find it. Oh, well, it may be a little unprofessional, but have you asked anybody? Say, that's an idea. Thanks. Oh, it's all right. Uh, quiet, please. Let's have quiet, everybody. Yes, quiet. Uh... Now, did anyone here turn in a fire alarm? Oh, Excuse me. I was the one who called. Oh, hello, Mrs. Beasley. Well, where's the fire? Oh, there isn't any fire. My poor little cat is stranded on top of that telephone pole up there. What? Yes. Oh, good grief. Madam, do you mean you got us all out of bed and dragged the firemen away from their gin rummy game just to look at a cat? Oh, disappointed because someone's home isn't burning down. <laughs> huh? I know who you are. You're the man who does want to set the world on fire. <laughs> now, see here, Mrs. Uh... Oh, this is Mrs. Huh? Beasley, Uncle Mort. Mrs. Beasley, this is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. How do you do? Uh, charmed, I'm sure. Now, see here, Mrs. Beasley. What do you mean by waking up the whole neighborhood? I'll take it easy, mister. I won't take it easy. Chief, are you going to waste the taxpayers' money climbing telephone poles for tomcats? Well, what's wrong with that? Well, give me a reason why you should go to all that trouble. Sure, I'll give you a reason. This lady happens to be the mayor's sister-in-law. Yeah, uh, just as I thought. Politics. Hey, boys, yeah. get out the 40-footer and bring down that cat. Right. Thank you, Chief. I'll see that my brother-in-law hears about this. Yes, and I'll see that the newspapers hear about it, too. I'll write letters to the editors. And I write a nasty letter, madam. <laughs> and as for you, Chief, you're paid to fight fires. Not to go sky-hooting around town all night. Now, I've heard enough out of you, fatso. Yep. If you don't pipe down, I'll turn you over to the police, you big false alarm. I'm a false alarm, you little brass pole polisher. Take off that fireman's uniform and say that. Now, don't get so hot under the collar, beat cuss, or I'll have the boys cool you up with a hose. Yep. I'm not afraid of you and all your little squirts. <laughs> You twitch a thumb at me, and I'll push that tin hat of yours so far down, you'll have to breathe through a straw. <laughs> well, now you have gone too far. Logan! Here, hold my coat. That suits me. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve? Keep off the grass, you'll get your feet wet. <laughs> hey, look! Look, I've got the cat down, Uncle Mort. Oh, oh, thank goodness. Where's the lady that owns the cat? Please. Right here, Kelsey. Now I've seen everything. The idea using thousands of dollars worth of fire equipment, waking up hundreds of people in the middle of the night just to snag a mangy cat off a telephone pole. Here it is, lady, safe and sound. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, dear me, this isn't my cat at all. Well, now it isn't even her cat. Lady, if you aren't... Shh, Uncle Mort. Yes. What's wrong, Marjorie? I'll tell you what's wrong, Mr. Gildersleeve. This is your cat. Yes. <laughs> Our cat? 
Uh, Aesop? <laughs> Is that a hot one? Oh, my goodness. Let's get home. Come on, children. Uh, come on, Aesop. Uh, goodbye, Chief. Thank you, boys, for doing a noble and humane deed. Ah, go back to bed, you big mattress. Oh. Come on, man. Let's go. I don't like the way he said that. <laughs> Too bad there wasn't a fire. We could have been fleeced cotton and warm. Oliver. <laughs> But don't you dare catch a chill. I'll try my best not to, Minty. I wish I'd brought along my cold pills. Uh, let's hurry into the house, Oliver. We'll fix you up a nice hot cup of... Uh, well, what can you drink a nice hot cup of? Water, if it's distilled. Uh, well, it'll be nice to get back into a nice warm bed. Huh? Open the door, Leroy. Okay. Uh-oh, it's locked. Yep. Locked? Why didn't I go home on a safe time? Uh, <laughs> Now, don't get excited. Don't be nervous. Uh, take it easy, everybody. I have the key right here. Right here in my pants pocket. Oh, no. No what? No pants. <laughs> I'm just wearing pajamas. Here, let me try that door. Ooh, no shoes either. <laughs> Maybe it's stuck. No, we're stuck, Oliver. The wind must have blown us shut. Well... I guess the joke's on us. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't get it. You keep asking questions like that, Oliver, and you'll get it all right. There must be a window around the side or in back that I could climb into. No, Leroy. Before we went to bed, I made sure that everything was locked as tight as a drum in a bagpipe band. Oh, wait a minute. We forgot something. Huh? I know how we can get in. You do? Well, what is it? Birdie. A clever girl, Marjorie. <laughs> Birdie. Yeah, come on, everybody. Where are we going now, Midge? We're going to see if we can wake Birdie, our maid. Yes. Oh, Birdie. Oh, Birdie. Oh, Birdie. Yes. Too many Birdies. Hey, let me do it. <laughs> uh, oh, Birdie. Yes, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, uh, Birdie, uh, will you please come downstairs and open the front door? Come downstairs? Open the front door? Yes, I'm locked out. And so is Marjorie and Leroy and Oliver. What an unfortunate coincidence. Yes, Bertie, quit stalling and hurry down here. I would if I could, Mr. Gilsey, but I just can't. Why can't you? Because I'm locked out, too. What? If... <laughs> Bertie, aren't you upstairs? No, sir, I'm right here on the back post. Oh, this is a pretty pickle of fish. How did you get locked out? Well, I just got home from a lodge meeting. Yeah. You know, the mysterious and bewildering orders of the daughters of Cleopatra. <laughs> <laughs> They had Sphinx. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sphinx? Uh, you are? Yes, sir. And I found the back door bolted. You know, that's contrary to the customary procedure. Yes, well, I wonder if the people next door have got a pass key. Oh, they went away on their weekend. Oh, <laughs> I'm getting terribly cold. Maybe I'd better go home after all. Uh, no, Oliver. We'll get inside in two shakes of a jiffy. Oh. Uh, the only trouble is all the downstairs windows are locked. If we could only reach the second floor. I can do it. If you boost me up, I can climb this tree and then crawl out on that branch and drop down on the roof of the porch there. Who do you think you is, Leroy? A Superman man? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I won't let you risk your neck, my boy. You're too young. I do it myself, only why ruin a tree that never did me any harm? <laughs> oh, dear. Now, isn't it too bad that we don't have anyone big enough and thin enough to come to our rescue? <clears throat> It's getting colder, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I can't help thinking what King Arthur, one of his knights, would do on a case like this. Yes, it, <coughs> I believe it is getting colder. <laughs> Why, he'd leap off his horse, spring to the tree, and just, just swarm up to his lady love's window. If I'd only brought along some of my vitality tablets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, what's the use? Oliver, why don't you go climb a tree? Who, me? Midge, you know I get dizzy spells from high places. <laughs> Oliver, it's really very easy. You can do it with your eyes shut. Oh, I don't like this. Give him a boost up, Unc. Can't you see he's raring to go? Uh-huh, raring to go home. Yeah. <laughs> Come, Oliver, you've got to be brave. Pull up my pajamas. Mm. No, I mean the ones you're wearing. <laughs> yeah, now tighten your belt. I didn't say yes. You shook your head. Well, can I help it if I shiver in the affirmative? <laughs> <laughs> well... Now, you take his other leg, Leroy. Okay. Yeah. Careful now. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Grab hold of the branch, Oliver, right above you. Well, yeah. Don't drop me. I bruise easily. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I'm right below you. Mm -hmm. Now, just pull yourself up. Uh, no, no, Oliver. Go the other way. 
Oh. You're getting out of the wrong limb. Oh. Gee, if I only had my slingshot here, I'd have him in the right direction quick enough. Zero. <laughs> uh, keep going, Oliver. You're doing fine. Right. Oh, what are you stopping for now? The spring on my pajamas, bro. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, oh, my boy. Yeah, well, congratulations, Oliver. I never thought you'd make it. How about it, Missy Witchy? Am I as good as any night? Oh, yes, Oliver, you're wonderful. Yeah. Bye, George, for a week night. He finished strong on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oliver. Now just climb in one of the windows and all our troubles will be over. Mr. Gildersleeve? Huh? I've got bad news for you. What? There aren't any windows over the porch. <laughs> what? A porch without windows? I never heard of such a thing. Let me look. Well, that's one for Ripley. <laughs> you better come on down, Oliver. Oh, I can't reach that limb again. Uh, Jeepers, we've stranded Oliver. Is that bad? Now what are we going to do, Unc? Well, there's only one thing to do. I've got to get a ladder someplace. And a piece of string. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oliver. Oh, hurry, Mr. Gillis. Leave it terribly cold, Oliver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The people in the back got a nice big ladder. Yeah? Why don't you just pussyfoot over and throw the bar? Well, thanks, Bertie. I suppose that's all I can do. Uh, children, you just stay where you are. And Oliver, uh, don't go away. Very funny. <laughs> I'll be back just as soon as I can, Oliver. Fine state of affairs when a man can't break into his own home. Well, that's what you get for chasing fires in the middle of the wood. Uh, oh, it's you, Aesop. Meow. Out of my way, you slimy snake in the grass. Now, uh, let me see. There's a loose board somewhere along this fence. Ah, uh, there it is. Tight squeeze, Rockmorton. You should really cut out the starches. <laughs> I wonder where that ladder is. It's as dark here as the back of a coal miner's neck. Who's there? Huh? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, oh, hello. Oh, don't shoot, Mrs. Beasley. <laughs> it's only me, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> what are you doing in my backyard at this time of night? Uh, what am I doing here? Oh, oh, yes, we were locked out of our house, Mrs. Beasley. Do you happen to have a ladder I could borrow? It's in the shed, in the shed's lock. Well, then, if you could find the key and kind of throw it down to me, oh, I... Nerve. Waking me up, scaring me half to death, and then having that call. Uh, what did you say, Mrs. Beasley? Wait where you are, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'll be right back. Yeah, lovely woman. A break at last. This time we're all set, T.P. Where are you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, right underneath your window, Mrs. Beasley. Directly underneath? Yes, directly underneath. Well, then, cat. Oh! <laughs> oh! on the grass. I hope Uncle Mort doesn't get his seat damp. Hey, sis, I did it all right, all right. Boy, that was a thrill. Well, it's only a matter of minutes now. Well, Oliver, it's only a matter of minutes now. Uh, only minutes before I freeze. I wish I brought a parachute. <laughs> Who that there? It's me, your Uncle Throckmorton. <laughs> if I ever lay hands on that B B Beasley woman, I'll kill that old cow. <laughs> Why, Uncle, you're soaked. What happened? Uh, she lured me underneath her window and then threw a bucket of water on me. I'm going to tell the mayor about this. Oh, that's a shame. But don't you worry. Huh? We'll have you in the house and dry inside of five minutes. Oh, you got the door open? No, not yet, but soon. Poor Oliver's been freezing on that roof. He's freezing. Yes, yeah, so I sent Leroy down to the corner to ring the fire alarm. Oh, fine. Oh, my goodness. What'll the chief say when he sees me this time? Uh, can't you stop him, Leroy? I don't think so. Oh, in fact, I'm sure I can. Oh, my, here we go again. Stop right here, men. Okay, okay, where is it? Oh, hello, Chief. Well, you're just in time. Look. Where? Oh, say, what is this? First a cat on a pole and now a guy on the roof. Who's responsible for this call? Well, it was like this, Chief. Well, if it isn't the taxpayer's best friend in the fire department, severest critic. Huh? Hi, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, hi. Been writing any letters to the newspapers? No. Now, stop teasing, Uncle Mort, Chief. He's just soaked to the skin. Yeah, and that takes in an awful lot of territory. Yeah. How about saving those cracks for the fireman's minstrel show and getting our front door open? Oh, is that what you want? Well, why didn't you say so? Hey, Max, yeah. bring an axe. We've got a door to chop down. No, no, no. Can't you just send up a man and a ladder to one of the windows on the second floor? Oh, never mind the axe, Max. Bring a ladder. Okay. Say, Chief, there's a cellar door open around on the other side. The cellar door's been open all this time? Oh, I could kick myself. We could help you with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you just the same, no. 
Say, boys, I'm awfully sorry about this whole thing. Let me make some amends, huh? How about you all coming in for coffee and sandwiches? Huh? Won't you? Hey, come on. Just for good old Gildersleeve. Huh? Okay, sure. Yeah, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> Uh, have another cup of coffee, Chief? No, no, thanks. I've had two already. You've had four, but have another anyhow. Oh. Sandwich, Mr. Grogan? No, no, no. I'm full clear up to here. Incidentally, I made sure that cellar door was locked tight this time. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Grogan. Well, this has been swell, Mr. Gildersleeve, but now we'd better be getting back, boys. Hey, hey, you guys in the kitchen, let's get wheeling. Okay, well, uh, goodbye, boys. Thanks for everything. And if I ever have a fire, you'll be the first people I'll call in. <laughs> <laughs> I like firemen. Say, Uncle Mort, can I go out and watch them leave? Sure, we'll all go out and wave goodbye to them. Come on, Marjorie. Hey, you too, Bertie. Okay, Uncle Mort. Yeah. Well, thanks for the hospitality. Yeah, so long, boys. Don't take any wooden fire plugs. <laughs> yeah, nice fellas. Well, let's get back in. There they go. It's colder out. Catch the door, Bertie. It's good. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Again. Yes, this is where we didn't come in. I isn't anybody ever gonna get me down off this road. Oh, Oliver! <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, let me remind you that next Friday is Halloween, and a few mothers are the kind that worry about the children being out and getting into mischief. Here's a worthwhile suggestion for you. Keep the kids at home with a well-stocked pantry. Yes, if you have plenty of popcorn and cookies and cakes on hand, you can be sure the kids won't go very far away. Now, to make popcorn extra good, drench it with plenty of melted parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, that delicate, tempting flavor that makes parquet a favorite for table use makes it delicious on popcorn, too. And remember, use parquet margarine in the cookies and cakes you bake. It makes them tastier because it's a real flavor shortening not just a bland, tasteless fat. And not just at Halloween, but the year round, Parquet Margarine provides your family with wholesome, nourishing food values. Yes, Parquet Margarine is a highly nutritious energy food that contains important vitamin A. So use Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft all three ways, at the table, for baking, and for pan frying. It's delicious, it's nourishing, it's economical. Tomorrow, ask your dealer for a pound or two of Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, our time's up. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. In the meantime, November is here again. Yes, and crisp, frosty November weather is going to make the whole family feel like working harder and playing harder, too. So now the right kind of energy food becomes more important than ever. Yes, right now it's very important that your family gets plenty of wholesome, nourishing food. Food that provides energy and vitamins that gives you and the children the kind of nourishment everyone needs. Now, parquet margarine made by Kraft, is just such a food. Yes, parquet margarine is a wholesome, highly nutritious food made from selected American farm products. Parquet is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. What's more, 
Parquet margarine is a reliable source of vitamin A. Every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. Now, all this wouldn't do much good if your family didn't like parquet margarine. Well, we're sure they will. Yes, they're bound to like parquet's delicious flavor, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. So order delicious, economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Uh, Leroy? Yes, Uncle Mort? Uh, come in here a minute, will you? I want to... Say, how did you get that scratch on your nose? And by George, your shirt's all torn, too. What's happened to you? Oh, I had a slight argument with a friend of mine. A yeah, slight argument with a friend, eh? I'd hate to see you after a big fight with a stranger. Where did you two argue? Inside a cement mixer? Nope. All the way from our backyard to Georgie Beasley's front steps. Oh. It was a sort of a running argument. Yes. Now, Leroy, I disapprove of you holding knuckle debates with your little chums. But, gee, Uncle Mort, you should have heard what Georgie said. No matter what he said, it wasn't the friendly thing to do. Well, if you'd have heard, you'd understand why I had to bop him on the smeller. You bop him on the smeller? <laughs> Leroy, where do you pick up that kind of language? From you. Uh. <laughs> Remember Wednesday when you almost ran into that truck? That truck almost ran into me, young man. And besides, I don't recall using those words. It was just after the truck driver told you to go. Leroy, and... never mind. <laughs> Let's get back to you. Young man, you must realize that you can't keep friendships by indulging in pugilistic altercations. What's that? Poking people in the puss. <laughs> yeah. Well, who wants to be friends with old Georgie Beasley anyhow? Now, now, Leroy, friends are more precious than gold or diamonds. What would a man have if he didn't have any friends? Gold or diamonds? That's right. No! <laughs> Leroy, I want you to go over to Georgie Beasley's house and apologize. Well, not right now. His big brother is home. Oh. And besides, I'm not going to shake hands with him after what he said about you. Come, come. Remember, sticks and stones may break. About me? What did he say? Well, I, I don't like to repeat it. But I want to know. No, Uncle Mort, you'd only get angry. Yeah. And besides, your head isn't any fatter than anybody else's. Oh! <laughs> so he called me a fathead, did he? Yeah. How'd you find out? Yes. Yeah. Wait till I tell his mother about this. Oh, you won't have to do that, Uncle Mort. He was just repeating what she said. Oh. <laughs> Let's drop the subject, Leroy. Only remember one thing. Friends are wonderful things to have. Because when you're over your head in debt, a friend won't let you down. And when you're up to your ears in trouble, a friend won't let you down. And when you find out you're on a limb... A friend won't let you down then either. <laughs> yes. Say, that reminds me... I've been meaning to look up an old friend from back home ever since I came to Summerfield. Does he live here? Yes, fellow named Charlie Dapple. I'll get in touch with him right now. Hand me the phone book, will you please? Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, great chap, Charlie. I remember when I was first struggling to get into the girdle business. It was Charlie who helped me. To get into girdles? No, young man. Uh, yes, yes, he owned Dapple's department store at the time. He snapped up the first ten dozen I made. <laughs> Yes, he had a stretcher point to do it, too. Did that help you? Yes, sir. It pulled me out of a mighty tight squeeze. Uh, let me see. Uh, Daniels, Danner, Dante. Here we are. Dapple, Charles, 147 Olive Street, Pimento, 4733. That'll be good to see good old Charlie Dapple again after all these years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. Hello. Hello. Uh, could I speak to Charlie Dapple, please? Well, he isn't home now. This is Mrs. Dapple. Uh, Mrs. Dapple? Well, don't tell me that good old Charlie's married after all these years. Congratulations, Mrs. Dapple. You're a mighty lucky woman. Thank you. That's what Charlie keeps saying. Uh, who is this? Uh, what was that? Who is this? Uh, well, when did the big event take place? Three years ago, Labor Day. Who is this? Well, well, good old Charlie married on Labor Day. <laughs> Say, I'll bet you're a redhead. No, I'm a brunette. What made you think I was a redhead? Well, you know how Charlie always went... No, I guess you don't. <laughs> Maybe not, but I will. Yeah. Who is this? Oh, it's an old friend from back home, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Uh, doesn't that name mean anything to you? No. Oh, but surely he's told you about the times we used to have together. Didn't he ever talk about Atlantic City? No. What about Atlantic City? Well, it's, uh, it's in New Jersey. <laughs> 
He'll be home any minute, and I'll ask him all about it. Oh, no, no. Let's uh, make it a surprise. Make what a surprise? Well, I'm going to drop over for a visit. Oh, but really, Mr. Now, come, come, Mrs. Dapple. I haven't seen your husband for five years. Let's see, you live at uh, 147 Olive, eh? Yes, it's an apartment house. The Venus de Milo Arms. If. (laughs) Well, uh, I think I can find it. I'll drop in in half an hour. Oh, but I I don't know if you should come today, Mr. Silvercoat. Uh, Gildersleeve's the name. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, now, don't fix anything special for me. Uh, just think of me as one of the family. Goodbye. Uh, this is going to be fun surprising Charlie. He loves surprises. I'll never forget the night he sneaked a lot of his wax dummies into my office to scare me the next morning. And did it? It would have if our night watchman hadn't shot six of them. <laughs> he claimed they pulled a knife on him. <laughs> Mr. Dapple sounds like a keen guy. He is, Leroy. Good old Charlie. Hey, come along and meet him. Oh, but I wanted to go to a movie. We can go afterwards. Come on, come on, come on. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Dapple? Yes? Well, well. Charlie certainly picked himself a lovely little bride. What? Oh, oh, you must be the man who phoned Mr. Silversleeve. Yes. Yeah. Gildersleeve. Uh, by the way, is my old sidekick home yet? Well, no, and I've been expecting him for an hour. All right, Uncle, let's go to that movie. Uh, come back here, young man. Uh, Mrs. Dapple, this is my nephew, Leroy. Oh, how do you do? How do you well, do? come right in. Uh, thank you. Oh, now, don't look at this room. It's a mess. Oh, no, it just has that lived-in look. <laughs> yeah. Well, Charlie should be home any minute now. Mm-hmm. On Saturday afternoons, he usually stops at several places on the way home. Uh, uh, to get the football scores, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know how it is. No, not a baby. Uh, mind if we look? Oh, no. Come on, Leroy, don't you want to see the baby? No, I just want to see the movie. Okay, young man, no baby, no movie. What? See the baby. Yeah, that better. Well, well, Mrs. Dapple, what a handsome husky child. What's his name, Charlie? No, Gertrude. Oh, pardon me, Gertrude. <laughs> Ooh, zitty bitty babums a zoo. <laughs> oh, dear, you frightened her. Maybe it's her face, Uncle Mort. Uh, nonsense, Leroy. Babies just love my face. Uh, now, now, Mother's little angel cake. Shush. Yeah. Shush. I know it'll quiet her, Mrs. Dapple. It's one trick that always works. I got it right here in my pocket. Gee, Unc, are you carrying around a bottle of milk? No. It's my watch, Leroy. Yeah. Now listen, little cupcake. You hear the tick tick? Oh, isn't that cute? She's holding it to her ear. Yes. There's nothing like a piece of jewelry to stop a girl from crying. <laughs> Dear me, it's a phone again. Uh, now, phone? let go of the gentleman's watch, darling, so I can put you down. No, now, Mother's Lamb, let go. Uh, uh, oh, dear, she won't let go. Well, you'll just have to hold him, Mr. Gildersleeve, while I take that call. Uh, but, but, but it's been years since I held a baby that young. Oh, no, no. Don't you be afraid. Huh? Once you've learned, you never forget. It's like swimming. Uh, swimming, I'll bet it is. Yeah. Oh. Here. Hold, Gertrude, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, well, all right. Take it easy, Gertrude. Oh, uh, well, jiggly, isn't she? <laughs> Whoa, now. I'll be back in just a minute. Uh, you better come back now. She's getting restless. Now, see here, Gertrude. <laughs> oh, I was just kidding. Uh, relax. <laughs> kitchy, kitchy, goo. Kitchy, kitchy, goo. Uh, Gee, Uncle Mort, I never knew you could take care of babies. I can't. Uh, Leroy, would you like to hold little Gertie a while? Huh? Not me. Come on, let's ditch her and go see Hop Along Cassidy. Yep, wait a minute. I can't get my watch and chain away from her. And now, Gertrude, you've had your little fun, so let Lou... Uh, no use trying to force her, Uncle. Huh? She'll get tired of it pretty soon and just drop the whole thing. That's what I'm afraid of. I see. If she drops the watch, you get the works. <laughs> Leroy, don't poke fun. Now, now, Gertie, let go of Uncle Throckmorton's 21 jewel nasty gold watch. <laughs> yeah, that's a good girl. You see, Leroy, I got it back. Oh, now she's got a hold of my hair. Let go, Mother's little devil's food cake. Say, she certainly is a cute kid. Leroy, don't stand there. Do something. Well, if I could find a pair of scissors, I could cut off that hunk of hair she's holding. No! Ouch! Gertrude, unhand my hair. <laughs> 
Say, she likes you. Yeah, she's practically drooling over me. Well, really, Mr. Gildersleeve, what are you doing to that baby? Madam, you better ask the baby what she's doing to me. Oh, oh, now, now, let go of the man's hair, darling. There. Uh, thanks. Oh, my scalp. Feels like I just lost a decision to sitting bull. <laughs> Now you just lie in your blanket like a good little girl while Mama runs down to the gas company. Yes. Now? Yes, or else I don't know what we'll ever do over the weekend. Charlie was supposed to attend to it. But, but you're not going to leave us alone here with, with Gertrude. Oh, she won't give you any trouble, will you, sweetheart? <laughs> See? Yes. Well, Charlie will probably be here before I return. Oh, and in case he isn't, uh, just heat the baby's bottle in ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes? Uh, take the roast out of the oven in a quarter of an hour. Yeah, take the roast. Then uh, light a fire under the soup. Fire the soup? And if a COD package comes, it's all right to pay for it. But, but I... And if it gets any cooler, phone down to the janitor for more heat. Huh? Bye. Light a fire under the janitor. <laughs> Put the COD in the oven. Phone down for the baby's bottle. Oh, my... <laughs> I know which way it folds. After all, I used to be a baby myself. <laughs> yeah. Now, don't get fidgety, Gertie. Remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> Careful with that safety pin, Uncle Mort. Oh, my. Why don't these things come with zippers? <laughs> yes, yes, Mother's little leg of lamb. You better hurry up, Uncle Mort. Gertrude's getting restless. And cold, too. That's well. It's her own fault. She keeps kicking it off. Well, if you can't pin it, why don't you just leave it off altogether? No, Leroy. We've got to pin Gertrude down some way with this blanket. Ah. There we are. I wonder what makes her do that. Maybe she's just bored with everything. When she isn't yelling, she's yawning. Well, that's because she should be sleeping, Leroy. Possibly if I told her some little anecdote, that might put her to sleep. It always works at the Rotary Club. <laughs> singing or to sleep. That's a fine idea. Friends have told me my voice reminds them of a meadowlark singing bass. <laughs> okay, don't make for the lullabies. All right. Uh, what would you think of a sleep in the deep? You know, many brave hearts are asleep in the deep. <laughs> Too deep. Yeah. <laughs> How about Rockabye Baby? That's it. Go ahead, Uncle Mort. All right, let me see. I think it goes, uh, Rockabye Baby in the treetop. <laughs> yes. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. <laughs> yes. I can't remember how the rest goes. Now we'll come, baby, cradle and all. Yeah, that's it. Rockabye Gertrude on the treetop. She's going to sleep, so you better not stop. When the bow breaks, the cradle goes lower. You're doing swell, Unc. Sing it once more. <laughs> rock bye baby. Let's go, Leroy. She's closing her eyes, so let's tiptoe into the other room, my boy. Let's wait here till both eyes she shuts. Look out for that pen! Oh, nuts. <laughs> Rockabye, baby. Oh, what's the use? I have been singing till my tonsils are loose. You better give up, Unc. Whatever it is that kid wants, it ain't a meadow lark that sings bass. Yeah. I'm afraid you're right, Leroy. Gee, if this takes much longer, we won't see those two pictures before dinner. Leroy, if this takes much longer, we won't even see dinner. I better call home and tell your sister we'll be late. Hand me that telephone. Yeah, I did. Me playing nursemaid to a baby. Fine thing. Hello? Oh, hello, Marjorie. Hey, looks like Leroy and I will be a little late for dinner tonight, my dear. We stopped in to see an old friend. Who's that? Your old friend? 
Uh, no, it's Gertrude. Uh, she's just a baby. Yes. Leroy and I are taking care of her. Uh, for Mrs. Dapple. She's out taking care of the gas. Yes, and we're even taking care of the cookie. Oh, you, Uncle Moore, taking care of the cookie? Yes. I was supposed to take the roast out of the oven and put the soup on the fire. But I had to put the soup in the oven because the roast was on fire. <laughs> oh, poor Uncle Moore. Yeah. Have you been having much trouble with the baby? Well, I've been singing Rockabye Baby to her, but something tells me she'd prefer there'll be some changes made. <laughs> That's a marvelous idea. And bring Bertie, Marjorie. And maybe she can patch up the dinner I've ruined. <laughs> All right. Oh, I think I know what's wrong with that baby. It's probably hungry. Yeah, hungry? Say, I never thought of that. Uh, let me have a look. Oh, my goodness. That's what it must be. Marjorie, hurry over quickly. What's wrong? Gertrude's so hungry, she's trying to swallow her foot. <laughs> Have you got that all straight now? I think so, Mrs. Dapple. We're to shut off the gas at 147 hour this afternoon mm -hmm. and turn it on at 3214 Winslow. Is that right? Correct. We're moving away from the Olive Street apartment tonight, and I don't want any slip-up. Oh, there won't be. Oh, now, uh, can I change my light and water here, too? No, the light and water company's down at 10th and Spring Street. Oh, dear. Well, that'll take me an hour. I left someone with my baby, and I promised to be right back. Oh, well, they'll just have to wait. Really, Marjorie, the way you've handled that baby is a revelation to me. <laughs> yeah, you're certainly tidy with a dighty. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you ever learn all that, my dear? Oh, I took child psychology in school. Yes, but Gertrude didn't. How did you ever two get together? Oh, it was easy. <laughs> In dealing with hysteria and psychoneurosis in the field of speculative philosophy relating to the young, the prime factor was a thorough understanding of the mental and nervous processes of the infant mind. Simple, isn't it? Uh, either it is or I am. <laughs> uh, say, Leroy, how's Bertie doing? Oh, Bertie, how's everything? I'm doing as well as a kid, considering. Uh, considering what, Bertie? The cupboard. Oh, what's wrong with the cupboards here, Bertie? Well, from the looks of them, these folks seem to have a mighty fine assortment of nothing. Uh, nothing? What do you mean? Make yourself plain. Okay, I speak plain, but it's going to sound ugly. Uh, these folks have got just about enough food in their kitchen for one meal. Uh, do you mean that Mrs. Dapple's cupboard is empty? <laughs> Man, that cupboard couldn't be any better than if that lady's name was Hubbard. Oh, <laughs> Oh, this is terrible. I, I never dreamed for a moment they were destitute. Well, what are we going to do, Uncle Moore? Don't worry. I'll fix things up, Marjorie. Now, Bertie, take this $10 bill down to the nearest store and buy a lot of groceries. Yes, sir. Better make out a list. Yes. Some canned goods. Oh, Uncle Moore, that's terribly sweet of you. And some sugar. Oh, it's nothing, my dear. I get a lump in my throat. Lump sugar? It... <laughs> and a sinking feeling in my heart. Bacon soda? <laughs> When I think of what's ahead. A head of cabbage? Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. It brings the tears to my eyes. And onions. I suppose they just gradually got into debt and couldn't... Catch up. That's it. They couldn't catch up. <laughs> uh, Bertie, are you still here? You better get going. Take Leroy along to help you carry the bundle. Okay, right. yeah. Hurry out the back way. I'll bet that's my old pal now. And will I clap hands if here comes Charlie. Now, see here, Dapple. We've exhausted our patience with you. Why do you ignore our letters? Why do you hang up when we telephone? Why don't you be a man and make your payments on that piano like you promised? No, see here, mister. I'm not dappled. But by George, if I was and you used that tone, I'd cuff you around till you'd crawl back into the woodwork. Oh, yeah? Well, if you're not dappled, what do you care how I talk to him, you, you big blimp? Oop! <laughs> He's my friend, and you can't abuse an absent friend in my presence. Especially if he isn't here. Not so loud. Huh? Oh, that's right. Not so loud, mister. If you want to fight, just step inside. Okay. At this time when I leave, I'm taking that piano with me. Over my dead body. That makes it even more attractive. Oh. <laughs> One more crack like that, and I'll shove that swollen zither down your noisy throat. Now, you take your hat off and state your business before I forget my manners and bop you on the smeller. Now, take it easy, Chubsy. Whoop. <laughs> my name is Baxter of the Summerfield Washing Machine and Piano Company. Now, this fellow Dapple has been buying this piano from us on the installment plan, only he ain't kept up his payments. Well, I happen to know that Mr. Dapple has been up against it pretty badly lately. 
Uh, couldn't you just uh, kind of forget the payments this month? Forget it? How can I? I've got a memory like an elephant. Yeah, and a hide like one, too. <laughs> All right, then. How much is the payment? I'll give it to you myself. Oh, no, no, you won't. According to our contract, once a payment is defaulted, the entire remaining balance becomes automatically due. Oh, my goodness. How much does he still owe on it? Now, let's see. I've got it right here. It's uh, $74. $74 more? Why, that mahogany monstrosity over there was never worth that in the first place. Either I get the money or else the piano. Yes, I think you mean it. Well, Charlie Dapple helped me up when I was getting started, so I can't let him down when he's just about finished. I'll write you a check for the $74. Let's see. That'll leave me with a balance of uh, 28 cents. <laughs> There's somebody at the back door. i better go see. I'm coming, you blasted woodpecker. Excuse me, I'm the gas man. Don't want any. I've got enough gas. I come to shut it off. Shut it off? Didn't Mrs. Dapple call at your office this afternoon, probably to pay the bill? Look, brother, I'm a guy who sticks strictly to his own job. Yeah. I got an order saying turn off gas at Dapple Apartment 147 Olive Street. And that's what I'm going to do, brother. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh... Let's not be too hasty about this, uh, brother. <laughs> Suppose I pay the bill to you right now. No, no, I ain't allowed to take no money. Uh, you don't understand, brother. I'm just the guy who gets orders to turn gas on and to turn it off. Yeah. Then I go where it says and I turn gas on or else I turn it off. <laughs> That's all I do. Oh, sounds mighty monotonous. I like being monotonous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Look here, uh, brother. Uh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, uh, Herman Peebles. Uh, Herman Peebles. Uh, look here, Herbie. Uh, Peebles live here, too. Uh, simple Peebles. The kindly Peebles. The salt of the earth. Uh, things have been a little tough for him lately. Uh, and there's another mouth to feed, too. You mean... Yes, that's what I mean. A tiny baby named uh, Little Gertrude. Yeah, think what it would mean to poor Little Gertrude if she didn't have any gas. <laughs> No hot milk, uh, no hot water, no hot air. That's tough. Yes. Winter is approaching too, Herbie. Need I say more? No, no. Don't worry, mister. I'm not going to shut off the gas here today. Uh, you're not? No, I just can't. Well, I'm certainly, <laughs> certainly glad I convinced you. It wasn't you, mister. I just remembered I left my tools at the office. <laughs> Just as soon as a dapple shows its nose through that door. I, I done cooked this rib roast so long it's done shrunk down to the size of a lamb chop. Yeah. Well, personally, I wouldn't mind staying all evening, only I've got a previous engagement. It's them. I'll get the door. We come for the furniture. To take it away. This is the last straw. Don't let them do this to little Gertrude, Unc. You're right, Leroy. You men can't do this to a poor little helpless baby. We ain't doing nothing to no baby. Take the other end of this sofa, Terry. I got it. Now, get out of the way, mister. Bye, George. You're not going to get away with this. Uncle, put down that vase. <laughs> I was just trying to help the men out there. Don't do us no favors. We'll help ourselves out. Careful coming out that door, Terry. Okay. Uh, quickly, Roy, lock the door. Okay. Now we've got to figure out some way to prevent him from stripping the apartment. Uh, Mr. Gillsleeve, huh? a lady just come in the back way and says she's Miss Dapple. Here she comes now. Oh, at last. <laughs> oh, thank you ever so much, Mr. Gildicoff. If... That's all right. Where's Charlie? Well, I can't imagine. Unless he's... Oh, of course. Huh? This was his Saturday to work late at the office. But he'll be here any minute now. Uh, that is, if he comes straight home. He better come straight home. There are a couple of men roaming around trying to repossess your furniture. Repossess our furniture? Well, I can't imagine... Oh, why, you must mean the moving men. Yeah, they're moving men. They're trying to move everything you got right out of here. Well, of course. We're moving over to Winslow Avenue today. Oh, my goodness. How can Charlie do this to me? And what about the piano? The collector tried to take it away, but I stopped him. Well, you should have let him have it. Huh? We just played it to break our lease here. It's your lease in my pocketbook, madam. Well, we better hurry up and get ready to leave. Oh, uh, did the men come to turn off the gas? Yeah, and you should have seen them turn on the tears. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, there's my husband now. Yes? There's something about the way he knocks that I can always recognize. Oh, at last. 
Hey, Mrs. Dapple, I've been waiting for this moment all afternoon. Do you mind if I hide in the dining room and then when good old Charlie comes in, I'll jump out and yell surprise? Please, that's all I have left. Well, that'll be cute. Uh, all right, come right ahead. Uh, Leroy, Marjorie, hmm? uh, Bertie, I want you to get in on this. All right. Come on, let's hide. Hello, Charlie, darling. Oh, hello, you sweetheart. What's the idea of keeping the door all out? Well, I don't know. In fact, I don't know half of what's been going on around here. Oh, but come into the living room, dear. There's a little surprise for you. Surprise? What do you mean? Where's the surprise? Oh, boy! Surprise, Charlie! Surprise! Yeah, where's Charlie? I'm Charlie. Who in thunder are you? Oh, my goodness. Gee, Uncle, what's the matter? It's that man. I never saw him before. He's the wrong Charlie Dapple. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, I wonder why I always talk to the ladies in our audience, because after all, some of us men aren't such bad cooks. Why, I can fry a wonderful egg. I can even make pretty good biscuits. So really, we men should know about delicious parquet margarine, too. So this is for men only. Next time you men feel like whipping up a batch of biscuits, use parquet margarine made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is a real flavor shortening. It adds flavor to all baked foods. So no wonder the wife's cookies and cakes taste better when made with parquet. And if you like pan-fried foods, you'll find they're tastier, too, when you use parquet margarine. And you don't have to worry about parquet spattering or sticking to the pan. Of course, you'll want to use parquet margarine at the table, for you'll like its delicate appetizing flavor. Now, maybe you men aren't as interested in nutrition as the women are, but you should know that parquet margarine is a nourishing energy food that contains vitamin A. So, men, if you can't find parquet margarine at home, buy a pound or two tomorrow. You'll be pleased to learn that it's mighty economical, too. Just ask the dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. <laughs> Just a second till I find my key, children. Oh, I'm tired. Yes. Hey, somebody put a note under the door. It's for you, Uncle Moore. Well, a note, eh? I wonder who it's from. Uh, uh, dear pal Throcky, George Fiddy just told me you were in town, so I dropped over to see you. Sorry I missed you. Your old pal and sidekick, Charlie Dapple. Uh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, we might say that one good thing at least has come out of the world crisis. And that is that we Americans have learned that the right kind of food, and plenty of it, is vitally essential to national health and morale. And realizing this, we Americans can become the strongest nation on earth. That's why you homemakers should know about delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. Because parquet margarine is an economical source of nourishment and energy your whole family needs. Yes, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. 
And equally important is the fact that every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. What's more, your whole family will like parquet margarine's delicate, appetizing flavor. Yes, delicious parquet margarine makes everything taste better, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking or pan frying. So try this nourishing, economical food. Buy a pound or two of grand-tasting parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Hello. Uh, where is everybody? Oh. Oh, oh, there you are, Marjorie. Oh, hello, Mr. Throckmorton. Did you bring the things I wanted for dinner? Yes. Here's the flowers, the after-dinner mints, and the candles for the cake. I hope this wasn't too much trouble. Not at all, my dear. The market was so crowded, I just drifted with the tide. That's how I happened to get this quart of clams. <laughs> yeah. How many of these candles do you think we should put on Judge Hooker's birthday cake, Uncle? Well, I don't know. How many cakes did Bertie bake? Oh, now, Uncle, I don't think it would be polite to put on more than 30. Well, if that's all the candles you're going to use, you better burn them at both ends, then. <laughs> oh, I don't think he's that old. No? Say, he's got a Lincoln penny that he got from Lincoln. Oh. <laughs> Uncle Morton, I do wish you'd make an effort to get along better with the judge. Especially tonight at dinner. Well, seeing that it's his birthday, I'll give him a break. You will? Yes. I won't insult him until he insults me first. <laughs> Say, do you think he's going to be surprised when he finds out we know it's his birthday? Oh, he'll be dumbfounded. He's got a good start, too. He's been dumb ever since he was founded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Uncle. Huh? Huh? <laughs> now, Judge Hooker is really awfully sweet. Well, it doesn't show on his face, then. Why, George, if I had to push that sour, I'd take it out and drown it. Uh, see, something smells mighty nice around here Oh, it's the dinner Bertie's fixing oh. And is it going to be delicious? You know, that Bertie is a real treasure Her dinners are always delicious The only trouble is I'm beginning to develop what is known as second helping spread Well, what do you mean? Well, my laps are starting to overlap <laughs> I don't talk that way, Uncle Mort huh? You're just the right weight for a man of your, uh, weight Yeah Well, maybe so Everything's expanding these days. <laughs> oh, by the way, Oliver Honeywell's coming to dinner, too. What? Oliver again? Seems that every time we sit down to eat, there's that overgrown St. Bernard puppy yapping around the table. Well, his family's out of town, and Oliver doesn't like restaurants. Of course not. They charge for meals. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like to appear inhospitable, Marjorie, but I'm beginning to get bored with Oliver as a boarder. Well, his family will be back by Thanksgiving. Say, by the way, when is Thanksgiving? Anytime Oliver's family comes back. <laughs> uh, another thing, Marjorie, can't you persuade him to get a haircut? Oh, well, he says the barbershop's frightening. Huh? He cuts his own hair, and it gets long enough for him to reach. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody should uh, drop a hint that it's time for the fall harvest. <laughs> or else buy him a paper of booby pins. Uncle, you mean bobby pins. You heard me, Marjorie. Oh, uh, let me see. Have we forgotten anything? Oh, I don't think so. Let me see now. Dinner, uh -huh. presents. Yeah. Oh, I ordered a cute singing telegram delivered at 10 p.m. Oh. Say, what time did you did, huh? what time did you tell the judge to be here? Well, uh, well, I said that. Uh, oh my goodness! Where's my hat? Right in your hand. What's wrong? I forgot to invite somebody. Who? Judge Hooker. Oh. <laughs> Seabiscuit. Why, Leroy, what do you mean? Oh, hello, Oliver. Oh, Midgey Widgey. <laughs> Gee, you look lovely this evening. <laughs> How do I look? Gee, you look lovely too, Oliver. <laughs> hello, Meatball. Hi, Oliver. How's all your allergics tonight? Oh. Leroy, now be more polite. You mustn't make fun of Here's me. Here's Judge Hooker, Marjorie. Oh, oh hello, hello. everybody. Hi. Dinner will be ready very soon now, Judge. Really, Marjorie, you folks shouldn't have gone to all this trouble. Uh, no trouble at all, Judge Hooker. We had to eat anyway. <laughs> uh, by the way, Judge, uh, do you know Oliver Honeywell? You mean that anemic young calf that hangs around, Marjorie? I've heard about him, but I've never seen him. Uh, well, take a good look. This is him right here. <laughs> Hello. What? <laughs> oh, say, don't mind me. I'm always kidding, Oliver. That's the trouble. Everybody's always kidding, Oliver. No, no. <laughs> My boy, you mustn't get bitter. Say, 
Why is your ear all bandaged up? Huh? Oh, I did this this afternoon when I was giving myself a haircut. You mean to say you cut your own hair? Yeah, I do it with mirrors. Yeah. But what happened this afternoon? Did the bowl slip? No, no, I was using manicure scissors. I guess I didn't allow for the curve. Yeah. <laughs> well, your hair looks very pretty with its scalloped edges. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Hey, come in. I'm from the telegraph company. Oh, for goodness sakes, you're huh? too early, boy. Later. Yeah, but I got a message. Come back at 10 o'clock now. Beat it before you spoil everything. Yeah, but... <laughs> Wrong address, folks. <laughs> Say, Unc, can I give it to him now? What? Oh, oh, the present for the judge? Why, sure. Let's all give him his present all now. All right. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, 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 birthday Judge Hooker. Hooker. <laughs> for me? Now I wonder what's inside. Yeah, listen to him. You'd think he was a sweet 16 instead of a sour 60. <laughs> Go on, unwrap him, Judge. All right, I will. He's opening yours first, sis. Yes. I hope you like it, Judge. I'm sure I will. Well, what do you think? A necktie. Well. Just what I need. Thank you, Marjorie. <laughs> now, let's look at the next one. With all best wishes from Oliver Honeywell. <laughs> well, 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 Honeywell. Yeah. You shouldn't have done this. <laughs> Gee, another necktie. Yeah, isn't it nice? A yellow one with green polka dots. <laughs> you know, I got one just like that for Christmas last year. And I'll bet that's it. <laughs> Well, let's see about this one. Although it is not Christmas Eve, here's a present you will perceive from your old friend, Throckmorton Gildersleeve. Yeah. Catch on? It's a poem, Judge. Yeah, another necktie. Purple this time. Yes. Just matches your complexion, Judge. Thank you. I wonder what's in this package. It's from Leroy, I see. One guess, Judge Hooker. It's a necktie, all right, but this one's different. It's got a picture of Superman on it. Yeah. Well... Now that the necktie party's over, let's trot into the dining room. Uh, Judge, uh, Bertie's fixed a special new dish in your honor. Is that so? I'm flattered. I thought you would be. What do you call it, Gildy? Uh, calves brains a la Judge Hooker. <laughs> <laughs> certainly was a delicious cake, and beautiful, too. Yes. With all those candles lit up, we had enough heat to bake another cake. <laughs> <laughs> Have your fun, Gildersleeve. I'm so full of wonderful food, I don't mind. Oh, that was a marvelous meal. I wish I had a cook like your birdie. Well, what happened to your cook, Judge? I let her go when I found out that after fixing dinner for me, she'd go out and have her dinner in a restaurant. Oh, oh excuse me. I wonder who that can be. Uh, yes? I'm from the telegraph company. Not now, I said. Come back at 10 o'clock. Yeah, but I got a date at 10 o'clock. Break it. What was it, Gildy, old man? Uh, nothing at all, Judgy. Just a boy out looking for the wrong house. <laughs> Say, if you don't mind, I'm going into the kitchen and thank Bertie for that wonderful dinner. Oh, well, don't overpraise her, Judge. I won't. Remember, too many compliments spoil the cook. Uh, something I can do for you, Your Honor? No, Bertie, I just wanted to tell you that that dinner you just served was an Epicurean collation. Oh, is that considered good? I didn't think it was good. I thought it was a gastronomic achievement. Oh, you didn't like it. I did, too. And I consider myself a pretty good judge. And so do I, and I'll be glad to vote for you. When's the election? Next spring. <laughs> no, no, I mean judge of cooking. Wish you were working for me, Bertie. That Gildersleeve is a mighty lucky dog, but he doesn't really appreciate you. He don't? But look at the way he makes you wash those dishes, getting your hands all chapped and red. Well, man, them rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> well, the least he could do is to buy you a nice electrical dishwashing machine. I've got one in my kitchen. Say, you'd have a lot of fun operating it. Well, I don't know. I may be old-fashioned, but I prefer to dump the dishes in water instead of electric them. <laughs> <laughs> Great sense of you we have there, Bertie. By the way, did I ever tell you about the fine big maid's room in my house? No, sir. Is it pretty? Is it? It's got everything but Rochester. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm, certainly sounds like the elephant's earrings to me. Yes, and of course, I'm not home more than three, four nights a week, so that means my cook has plenty of days off and very little to do. What do you think, Bertie? Well, I think you're going to make some gal a wonderful employer. Well, you don't understand. I want you as my cook. Me? But I've already got a position. But think what it would mean to your social position among your friends if you were to cook for Horace Hooker. Yes, sir. 
that certainly would impress the other members of the mysterious and bewildering orders of the daughters of Cleopatra, which I as the head think. <laughs> but, of course, I just couldn't do it. Why not? Has Gildersleeve got you under contract? No, sir. I'm here strictly on a meal-to-meal -meal basis. Well, then, where no contractual entailment exists between principal and agent at the time of severance of service, notice of termination is not required, if so facto. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, that's common law. Oh, it happens often, huh? Well, yes. Say, after you've left Gildersleeve and come to work for me, you wish that you had left old stupid over... Old stupid over what, uh, uh, Well, that is, uh, I was saying to Bertie that it must be hard working all stupid over a hot stove. Oh, yeah. I see. Well, come on back in the living room. The kids want to play pin the tail on the donkey, and you're going to be the Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm coming. Yeah. Bye, Bertie, and don't forget what I said. You mean about the ipso facto? Yes, yes, and the quicker you ipso, the sooner it'll be a facto. Come on, Gildy, old pal. Let's go in the other room. Yeah, all right, Judge. <laughs> now, here he is. Well, children, what shall we do? Well, I think it'll be just dandy if we play drop the Kleenex. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Oliver, don't you mean drop the handkerchief? Well, I figured that the other would be more sanitary. Yeah. <laughs> How about musical chairs or something like that? Well, I bet I know who that is. Here, come in. Mister, this is positively my final appearance. Here's a telegram for you. Look, it's not for me. It's this gray-haired gentleman right here. Oh. No, no, no. Don't hand it to him. Huh? It's supposed to be open and sung. Oh, but I don't think... You're it. not paid to think. You're paid to sing. I'll break in the song, young man. Well, okay, but remember, you asked for it. Uh. Me, me, me. Yes, you, you, you. Me, me, me. Mr. Throckmorton, he killed his sleeve. I'm in awful bad jam. Can you send me $50 to bail me out? Sign your brother-in-law, Sam. What? <laughs> Old telegram, get out of here. Gildersleeve residence. Good morning, Bertie. This is Judge Hooker. How are you this bright and sunny morning? Dull and cloudy. I was up all night trying to decide between remaining where I is with the status quo or packing up and moving over to the ipso facto. I just telephoned to tell you that whatever your salary is now, I'll better it but $10 a month. $10 a month? Judge, you done just hide yourself a cook. Fine. How soon can you come to work? Well, that depends on how soon they let me go. Well, cook up some excuse to leave quick. Bye. Mm, that's going to take a mess of doing. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I was getting into. Oh, well, Bertie, is breakfast ready? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Bertie. You better set another place, Bertie. Oliver invited himself over for breakfast again. More people to feed. Just working myself to a shadow. Uh-oh, -uh, now, Bertie. Can I help it if that biological blunder... Eh, come right in, Oliver. Thanks. Morning, Bert. Oh, prunes again, huh? Don't you like the way I fix breakfast? Uh, of course he does. Oliver, never wrinkle up your nose at a prune. Morning, everybody. You too, Oliver. Say, what is this? Prunes again? Now, if you don't like it... Yes. Uh, Leroy, sit down and pass the toast. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Where's Marjorie? Isn't she... <coughs> Oh, darn this toast. What's wrong with that toast? <coughs> it just went down the wrong way. Oh, you don't like it. And after I work my fingers to the bone, scraping it off for you. Yeah. <laughs> but all I said was the <coughs> wrong way. Oh, now I'm doing things the wrong way. Teaching me my business. I'm tired of not being appreciated around here. I was resigning. There's other people who like my cookery. Well, uh, Bertie seems to be a little twittery this morning. Gee, she never acted this way before. And you think she means that about resigning? Say, I better find out what's wrong. And now, Bertie, I don't understand what... Bertie, where are you? Oh, Bertie! Oh, Bertie! Oh, Bertie! Oh, Bertie! Oh, my goodness, Bertie has flown the coop. Come, come. Wake up, Leroy. 
Uh, time to go to school, young man. Uh, just give me another 15 minutes, Bertie. Yep. This isn't Bertie. It's Uncle Mort. I just haven't shaved yet. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Unc. Where's Bertie? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Wake up, young man. Look at the clock. You want to be tardy? It's okay with me. You... Come on, Leroy. Wake up. Oliver's fixing some nice hot mush for breakfast. <sighs> oh, just let me sleep ten minutes more. I can't, Leroy. By George, I'm going to pull the covers off of you. Oh, no, no, no. Don't do that. I'll get up. Yeah. Uh. Hey, where's Marjorie? She's downtown interviewing cooks at employment agencies. Excuse me. Help me quick. Oh, Oliver's in trouble in the kitchen. Hey, get up, Leroy. Hey, coming, Oliver. Yes. Now, what's the trouble? Oh, it's the mush I'm fixing for breakfast. It huh? keeps overflowing. Oh. I filled four pots already. Now I need another one. Oh. Well, here's a double boiler, Oliver. Now, keep stirring or it'll start burning. Gee whiz, I never knew mush multiplied like this. <laughs> It just seems to go on and on and on. It's a morning cereal, isn't it? <laughs> oh, jumping jelly beans. What is it now? Oh, uh, good morning, mailman. Oh, good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've got a postage due letter here. It's uh, three cents, please. Uh, surely. Surely, three cents. Yeah. Yeah. There you are. Oh, thank you. Say, this letter is for Bertie Lee Coggins. He doesn't work here anymore. Oh, yes, yes. That's your cook. Say, I've got a change of address for her. Better give me that letter back. Uh, certainly. Oh, by the way, what is her new address if it isn't violating any professional secrets? Oh, it's 2100 Burnside. Uh, 2100 Burnside. Thank you very much. Uh, 20 was... That address sounds familiar to me. Where have I heard it before? 2100 Burnside. Why, of course. Leroy! Yeah? Oliver! Mm -hmm. I know who hired Bertie away from us. You, you know? know? Yes, I should have guessed it before. It was the judge. No! Yes, that crook of a hooker hooked our cook. Wait till I lay my hands on him. He stole our birdie, the horse thief. At last, Hooker, I finally tracked you down. What do you mean, track me down? I'm always in my chambers this time of day. What do you want with me? Why, you oily worm, you got our birdie. We want her back. Nothing doing. Now get out. Oh, that does it. I'm going to create a vacancy on the Superior Court bench. So put down, put down those bookends. I will not. Stand still, you old goat, so I can hit you. Now stay where you are, Gildersleeve, or I'll press this buzzer. I won't stay where I am. I'm going to knock you. What happens when you press the buzzer? My bailiff will come in and drag you down to jail. Yeah, it's a frame-up. That's what it is. First you steal my cook, then you upset our whole household, and now you're going to railroad me to the caboose. Uh-huh. So the big balloon's losing all its hot air. Your threats didn't work, Gildersleeve. You're a beaten man. You don't have to rub it in, you judicial Judas. I know, and I'm licked. We can't find anybody to do Bertie's work. We can't find where she puts anything. We haven't had a decent meal since she left. You haven't? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, well, I don't want to be too hard on you. So, if you promise to behave yourself, maybe I'll invite you over to the house for dinner sometime. I wouldn't sit down at the same table and eat a meal with you, Hooker, if I were starving. What am I talking about? If I were starving, I am starving. <laughs> I knew that your stomach was bigger than your stubbornness. You can come to dinner tomorrow night if you want to. I don't want to. I wouldn't humiliate myself to the extent of what time tomorrow night? Seven o'clock. <laughs> and don't forget to bring Marjorie and Leroy. Of course I won't forget. But that's the only reason I'm coming. I'm just doing it for the kiddies. <laughs> Remember, Uncle Mort, if this scheme is to work, you've got to keep a tight control over your temper. Uh, who, me? I never lose my temper. <laughs> and Leroy, now, don't overdo the business of being sassy. Oh, don't worry, sis. I'm a born actor. <sighs> well, I guess we're all ready. Gee, we surely look like tramps, don't we? Yeah. Well, go ahead and ring the bell, Uncle. Yeah, all right, all right. Now, on your guard, everybody. Here she comes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hello, Miss Mart. Hello. Hello, Leroy. Hello, Bertie. Good evening, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yes, yeah, good evening. <laughs> Won't y'all kindly come in and rest your hats and coats? They look kind of tired. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, come on in, children. Well, well, come right in. Oh, hello, Judge Hooker. Hi, so yes. sweet of you to invite us. You have no idea how we're going to enjoy this. Hiya, Hooker. How's the cooker? Uh, Leroy, don't you talk that away. 
Oh, who are you fooling? You can't boss me anymore, Bertie. Oh, Leroy, behave yourself. Oh, I just can't imagine what's gotten into you lately. You used to be such a little gentleman. Oh, who wants to be a gentleman? I'm going to be a heavyweight prize fighter and, and chew tobacco. You ain't going to be no prize fighter long if somebody hits you smack on that chew of tobacco. And look at your hair. Somebody must have been trimming it with hedge clippers. Nope. Oliver showed me how to cut it all by myself. You never did these farmer diddles when I was there. Why, Bertie, Bertie, isn't dinner ready? Yes, sir. Well, when, when you needed a haircut... Then serve the first course, please. It's sitting on the table. Oh, oh shall we go in now? Yes, sir. Come on, Leroy. Come on, Marjorie. Oh, yeah, I'm starved to death. Yes, well, how do you think everything looks? Oh, just splendid. Except for Bertie. What's wrong with Bertie? Well, I think she must be worrying. She's got dark circles under her eyes. <laughs> Nonsense. Incidentally, you shouldn't talk coming here without a shave. Oh, yes, that reminds me. Uh, Bertie, where did you hide my good razor? I've looked high and low for it. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillsleeve. It's out on the back porch. I used to carry it with me when I went out in the backyard at night, sort of discouraged, you know, late visitors. <laughs> Bertie, isn't it time to bring the soup? It's right here. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I fixed a special turtle soup for you. I know it's your favorite. Well, thank you. It's a darn expensive to make. We don't have it very often. But I'll come over here every day if you'll cook it for me, Bertie. Oh, I'll be glad to. But, uh, but, uh... Splendid. You mind if I bring over Oliver? He just loves turtle soup, Bertie. <laughs> well, you're invited, Gildy. Yeah. Boy, this soup is super. <laughs> no matter how you like it, Leroy, you just eat it. Don't kiss it. <laughs> Leroy isn't your responsibility anymore, Bertie. Yes, the judge is right, Bertie. But I know how to handle him. You just send him over here. Bertie, pay attention to your work. That's just what I'm doing. Oh, Miss Marsh, that bandage. You done cut your finger. No, Bertie, I... I burned it. Well, ironing. Oh, honey, how many times have I told you you ain't got no knack for ironing? Somebody's got to do it. And we haven't found anyone else. Yes. Then I'll come over tomorrow afternoon and do it for you. Now, wait a minute, Bertie. You're working for me. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I got three afternoons off every week, and if I want to spend a mining for Miss March, nothing in the world can stop me. It's so facto, habeas corpus, or post-mortem. <laughs> I tell you, I won't stand for it. As long as you're working for me, you can't spend all your time straightening out Gildersleeve's message. Why, George, I can straighten out my own message, you little... Oh, uh... Uncle, remember now, you mustn't. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Judgey, what were you saying? I was just telling Bertie to quit acting like one of your family. Uh, well, I've been a member of that family so long, I just came up and quit all at once. Don't be foolish. Here you have all the extra time in the world. That's just the trouble. Nobody to cook for, except one dyspeptic that eats itty-bitty dabs. There's no big parties with lots of work like over at Mr. Gillsleeve. Well, I must say that that is... And when I see that Leroy, who I practically raised myself, acting so fresh because he needs a guiding hand to slap him down once in a while, <laughs> well, I just don't like this job, Judge. And if I thought Miss Marge would have me back again, I'd go right upstairs and pack my bag. What? Why, you ungrateful... Bertie, we'd be very happy to have you come back. Okay, I was resigning, Judge. But you can't do that. You haven't given me any notice. I don't need to. Where does no contractual entailment exist between the principal and the agent at the time of severance of service, notice of termination is not required. If so facto. <laughs> Oh, what's the use? <laughs> I'll get my things, and I'll be waiting out in the car when y'all get ready. Goodbye, George. Bye. Oh, it's a fine mess, and I have a sneaking suspicion regarding how it all came about, too. Why, Judgy, what are you hitting at? Never mind. Oh, whatever are we going to do about this dinner? Well, if you want to come over to our house, our birdie will be glad to fix us up some ham and eggs, George. No, thanks. You sneak in the grass. You, look who's calling who a what and a where. Come on, children. I won't let you remain in this atmosphere a moment longer. That suits me, Pop. Yes. But there's just one thing I've got to do before I go, Hooker. Let go of me. Get off of me. Help. Help. He's choking me to death. What? Oh, Lord, stop. Uncle, don't choke him. Now you must. I'm not choking the little pipsqueak. I'm just taking back the necktie I gave him for his birthday. <laughs> Come on, children. Did 
I do my part all right, Uncle? Oh, you were perfect, my boy. You were a regular dead-end kid. Oh, this bandage on my finger bothers me. Can I take it off now? No, no, no. Uh, keep it on for at least another day or so, Marjorie. Or else Bertie might get wise that this was all a put-up. Ah, oh, Bertie, there you are. <laughs> yes, and Mr. Gill, please. Uh, are you all ready to come home with us now, Bertie? Yes, sir. <laughs> That was mighty cute the way y'all pretended things were wrong at home. Of course, it didn't fool me a bit. What? We didn't? Oh, my goodness. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, do you grown-ups listening and remember the good old cookie jar? Yes, and what a treat it was to come home after school and fill up on those wonderful cookies Mother used to make. Well, the cookie jar is an American institution. Every family with youngsters certainly ought to have one. And for making better-tasting cookies to put in the jar, let me tell you about parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, because parquet margarine is so delicious for table use... It makes better-tasting cookies, too. Yes, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not bland and tasteless. Parquet adds flavor to all baked foods. That goes for cakes and pastries, too. And for the same reason, parquet margarine makes pan-fried foods tastier, too. And it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Another thing, whether you serve parquet margarine at the table or use it for baking and pan-frying, it's a nourishing, wholesome energy food and a reliable winter and summer source of vitamin A. Now, for all these reasons, you should keep plenty of economical parquet margarine on hand. So tomorrow, ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It sure is good to be back in my own kitchen again. Well, we're glad to have you back, Bertie. <laughs> well, there's one thing you sure was a surprise. Well, what's that? I expected to find a sink piled high with dirty dishes and ain't a single one. No, we've been using paper plates. Yeah, we broke all the dishes. Yeah. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randall. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. And reminding you that America's first line of defense is you and your support. So invest to the best of your ability in defense savings bonds. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company. National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Terry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, remember the saying, an army marches on its stomach? Well, nowadays, battles are won not by armies alone, but by entire populations. For total defense, we all must have plenty of the right kind of food. That means wholesome, nourishing food. Food that produces the energy we use up in hard work and play. 
That's why Parquet Margarine, the quality margarine made by Kraft, should be an important item on your shopping list. Because Parquet Margarine is an economical source of important food elements we all need. Parquet Margarine not only has delicious flavor that makes it a favorite for table use, baking, and pan frying, Parquet Margarine is a highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, every pound of Parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So why not give your family the benefits of this wholesome, nourishing food and start serving them Parquet Margarine now? They'll like its flavor. You'll know it's good for them. So tomorrow, ask your dealer for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now, let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. My goodness, Bertie, the ashtrays are all empty for once. Uh, what is this, some special occasion? For me it is, Mr. Gillsleeve. I'd like to have the evening off. Oh, is this your night to leave early? No, sir, but I'd sort of like to get an advance on next week's night off. Oh, yeah. Uh, any reason why not, Marjorie? Oh, not at all. Go ahead, Bertie. Thanks. I wouldn't ask, only we've got spectacular things tonight down at our lodge. Oh. That's the mysterious and bewildering orders of the daughters of Cleopatra. Yeah, <laughs> yeah our Bertie's the head sphinx. <laughs> Not no more, Leroy. I now the exhausted ruler of the pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> I've been promoted. Uh, yeah, I see. Uh, does that make you the uh, head man? No, sir. I was practically a stowaway on the royal barge of the ancient Nile. Yes. And ahead of me comes the major domus of the outer chamber of the inner sanctum. Yes. Then the, 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 the chief searcher in the bulrushes for the daughters of Pharaoh. Oh, yes. And above her comes the royal rejecter of delinquent daughters. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, isn't there a queen, Bertie? Uh, Mr. Gill's leaving our organization every gal's a queen. Oh, my pardon. Uh, <laughs> Well, what are you holding tonight, Bertie? An initiation? No, ma'am. It's the red, white, and blue fish fry in order of, uh, you know, to honor a group of our visiting soldier boys. Oh, yeah. The daughters of Clear Patriots are all 100% American. Well, that's a fine thing, Bertie, entertaining your uh, soldier friends. Yes, sir. We've even hired a military jitterbug band. Mm. The brown-skinned, boogie-woogie bugle boys. <laughs> well, <laughs> go right ahead. And if you want to take anything from the pantry for the fish fry, help yourself, Bertie. Yes. Yeah, you may want to broil a couple of cans of sardines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Gill. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Say, Unc, you know something? Leroy, I wish you wouldn't keep using that expression. Of course I know something. But what is it? <laughs> well, well, I was reading in the paper where there's going to be about a thousand soldiers in Summerfield over Thanksgiving. Yes? Well, let me see. Yeah, here it is. Well, uh, City will play host to 32nd Regiment Thursday. USO urges all citizens to invite Army men to dinner. That's what I mean. Can we have a soldier for our Thanksgiving dinner, Uncle Mort? Leroy, you sound like a cannibal. <laughs> Leroy, you mean can we invite a soldier to come to dinner? Yes, and I think it's a splendid idea. Oh, then we're going to have one? Why, of course. When I think of all those boys, many of them so far away from home, it takes me back to the lonesome Thanksgiving I spent in an army hospital back in 1918. Gee, Unc, I never knew you were wounded. Well, it's, it's something I never talk about. Well, what happened to you, Uncle Moore? I was kicked by a mule. <laughs> Where were you kicked, Uncle? It... In the customary place. <laughs> uh, that mule kicked me so high they gave me a pilot's license. <laughs> No, I spent three weeks in bed, flat on my stomach. In those days, I had a flat stomach. But remember, kiddies, never mention a word of this to anybody. It's still a painful subject. Even now, I twitch when I pass a mule. Gee, Uncle Mort, where did this happen? In France? Uh, no, Leroy, in Missouri. I was buying mules for the Army. Sort of talent scout for jackasses. <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I got 9,000 of them before one of them got me. Say, I never...
never knew you knew anything about mules. Oh, yes, Leroy. I had quite an asinine education. <laughs> yeah, but that was a long time ago. Let's forget it, children. Yes. Does that paper say how we go about inviting a soldier for dinner? Uh, inviting? Let me see. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. Uh, patriotic families who wish to share their Thanksgiving dinner with members of the Army are requested to be at Bacon Square, opposite the City Hall, before noon Thursday to pick up their dinner guests. The Army men will be uh, bivouacked at the Square. What's bivouacked, Uncle? Uh, a, big wa- a bivouac is a place where barking dogs are cooled off in pup tents. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I gotta remember that. <laughs> also, that word. <laughs> well, then it's very simple. Huh? Just one more for dinner, sir. Yeah. You can drive down in the morning and pick up one of the boys, Uncle. Gee, that's gonna be keen. Yeah, we better ask Bertie if it's all right with her first, though. Uh, oh, Bertie! Yes, it's all right with me. You... <laughs> uh, that woman's wasting her time as a cook. She'd get a job as an airplane detector. <laughs> Say, I have a better idea. Let's have a real celebration. We'll get a couple of extra turkeys and invite eight or ten boys. Eight or ten? Won't that be too much trouble, Marjorie? Oh, no. I'll ask some of my girlfriends to come over. Uh, Girlfriends? Oh, uh, by all means. That'll be jolly uh, for the soldiers, too. (laughs) Oh, gee, Unc, the whole idea sounded great till you brought in the girls. Do we have to have girls? Why not, Leroy? Yes, what's wrong with them? Jeepers, don't you think those soldiers are doing enough for their country as it is without wasting their day off with a bunch of silly girls? And in conclusion, fellow citizens of Summerfield, let me urge you once more on the eve of Thanksgiving... To open your hearts and your homes tomorrow to the soldiers visiting our fair city. Yep. Quit popping your bubble gum, Leroy. Especially while I'm rehearsing my radio speech. I'm sorry, Unc. I'm doing it unconscious. Yes, I'm sure you are. (laughs) Young man, if you keep playing with your gum that way, someday you're going to have a blowout. And remember, you haven't got a spare face. (laughs) Finish your talk, please, Uncle Moore. Well, I don't need to rehearse it anymore, Marjorie. I know that speech backwards. You do? Let's hear it. I bet it sounds even better backwards. Yep. <laughs> Leroy, you keep that up and you're going to get some applause backwards. <laughs> you know, I think it's wonderful of you, Uncle Mort, to go on the air tonight and urge everyone to entertain the soldiers. Well, people have always told me I should be on the radio. They say I sound just like that fellow who used to be with Pipper McGee and Molly. <laughs> <laughs> Probably some of the girls now. Oh, wonderful. Hello, girls. Oh, yeah. Oh, pleasure, darling. You're a pleasure, darling. Cute, aren't they? Well, come on, I want you to meet Betty Wilkins and uh, Mildred Sherman. Hello, Mr. Well, 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 what lovely you? friends you have, Margie. You should invite them here oftener. <laughs> Much oftener. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, not at all, my dear. I've always had an eye for redheads. <laughs> But Uncle Mort, last year she was a blonde. Yeah. I see. She's got a convertible top. <laughs> oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, huh? all of us girls think you're simply too tremendous starting these soldier parties. Uh. Oh, he ain't so tremendous as that suit he's wearing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like him just the way he is, especially that straight military bearing. Yeah. After all, he was an army man, you know. He was? Mm-hmm. What branch of the service were you in? Uh, you flew, didn't you? Uh, for a short time. <laughs> what kind of a plane did you use? A plane? It's a, an old Jenny. <laughs> and, and you were wounded, too, weren't you? Uh, oh, dear. Whereabouts were you wounded, Major Gilbert? <laughs> At the front? No, it was in the... Leroy. <laughs> That's right, in Jefferson City Mole. <laughs> but even so, you were lucky to have recovered. Yes. Everybody said I had a horseshoe in my hip pocket. <laughs> I didn't get rid of it either till they operated. Well, what were you doing in the Army when you weren't flying, Major? Well, I, I was sort of a recruiting officer. Yes. I brought more than 9,000 uh, recruits into the field artillery alone. Uh, I got a kick out of it, too. <laughs> I imagine that must have been a lot of fun. A fun? Well, uh, only at the beginning, my dear. I got awfully tired in the end. Hey, um, Uncle, 
Huh? Isn't it time for you to go to the radio station? By George, you're right, Marjorie. Leroy, you want to come along? Well, I'd like to, Uncle, but I got a little surprise of my own for tomorrow. I'm going over to Piggy Banks' house. Oh, oh say, while you're there, Leroy, remind Piggy's sister Penny about coming tomorrow. If you mean that Piggy Banks has a sister named Penny Banks? Yes. Uh huh. She was named after her Aunt Penelope, who lived in Indiana. Auntie is one of Just the. Don't tell me, Marjorie, I know. One of the banks of the Wabash. <laughs> Me your bugle. Oh, I don't know, Miss Ball. What you want with it? I need it for Thanksgiving tomorrow. Oh, you got the wrong instrument. On Thanksgiving, you play with drumsticks. Uh, now beat it. Oh, for corn's sake. Look, Pig, the reason I want it is because we're going to have a lot of soldiers for dinner. So what? We're having our cousin Rockwell. He's a city alderman. Oh, what's a measly old alderman? My uncle used to be a big shot in the Army. A major in the Missouri Mules. <laughs> what you mean? Oh, well, that, that's what they called his outfit. Say, he recruited the toughest, meanest, fightingest outfit that ever come out of Missouri. What kind of outfit was it? Uh, a field artillery. You know, the cannoneers with hairy ears. <laughs> Did they really have hairy ears? Oh, brother. I still can't see that this got anything to do with borrow my bugle. Gee, you're dumb. I gotta make these soldiers feel at home so they can enjoy the turkey dinner. I'm gonna blow mess call on your bugle. Oh, I get you. That's a keen idea, Meepo. Now will you lend it to me? Sure. Swell. Now, there's only one thing I gotta do. What's that? I gotta learn how to play a bugle. My, those turkeys sure look good, Bertie. You don't happen to have a spare leg, do you? No, sir, but I sure could use one with all the running around I've got to do. <laughs> Uh, no, Bertie, I mean a spare turkey leg. No, sir. I ain't going to subdivide none of them birds before the zero hour. Oof. And when I serve them, they're going to be intact, a thing of beauty, and a joy for about two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about some stuffing, then? Nobody's going to do no stuffing no how till everybody does. Yeah. And that includes stuffing yourself with stuffed olives, too. Oh, yeah. You're talking to me? Yes, sir. I've hardly got enough olives now to spell out welcome... 32nd Regiment in the mashed potatoes. Huh? You know, people have been coming to the door all morning asking for soldiers for dinner just because you went on the radio last night. Yeah, but I told them to go down to Bacon Square. Jumping Jeeps, what's that? Oh, it sounded like it came from the living room. Well, it can't be anything serious. Then again, maybe it can. I'll find out right away. Leroy! Yo. What are you doing? Learning how to blow mess call, Unc. Was that mess call? It sounded more like a moose call. Boy, won't those soldiers be surprised when they hear me blowing the bugle? Yeah, and won't you, too. <laughs> Oh, gee, give me a little time. All I need is practice. Yeah? I heard in school that Grace Moore practices six hours a day. Yeah, a lot of good it does her. I bet she still can't play the bugle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a sweet thought, Leroy, even if your music is sour. Oh, there's a doorbell. I'll get it, folks. Yes? Yeah? Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, is this the gentleman who was speaking last night by the radio from Soldiers for Thanksgiving? Uh, yes, madam. Well, uh, permit me to introduce myself. Uh, Mrs. Sapiro, glad to meet you. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Sapiro? Glad to meet you. What can I do for you? <laughs> well, I got right now in the oven a nice young kosher toiki, and I am wanting a soldier who is likewise. You. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Sapiro, but I haven't anything to do with these soldiers officially. You'll find them down at Bacon Square. Please. If the soldier boy I'm looking for is at Bacon Square, then he's not the soldier boy I'm looking for. Uh. Goodbye. <laughs> Boss, huh? have you started downtown yet? You better get going. It's almost 12. Oh, all right, just as soon as I get my coat and hat. And Leroy. Uh, Leroy, come on if you're going downtown with me. Okay, I'm here I come. Yeah. <laughs> oh, stop that for a little... Young man, what are you doing swimming around in my old army uniform? Gee, Unc, that's part of the surprise. How do I look? You and the mothballs look fine. Oh, 
girls, come in here and see Leroy. Yeah. <laughs> really, look cute at that. <laughs> look, he's got Uncle's uniform on, and it's all pinned up. Isn't it cute the way the britches almost reach to the floor and back? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, girls. But I couldn't get into that uniform if it were three times as big as it is now and I was twice as small as I am. <laughs> which would still be half again as large as the suit would be if it were double the size of what it is now, which it isn't, thank goodness, because if it was, I'd have to wear it and I can't because it doesn't fit. <laughs> all those girls coming over to our house this afternoon, I'm going to have to ask for about 12 soldiers instead of eight. Oh, that'll be super, Unc. Huh? Say, look at all those tents. Gee, where are all the soldiers? Oh, they must be inside. Say, you don't think they've all been invited out already, do you? <laughs> Leroy, you get the most fantastic ideas. Uh, hello, uh, where is everybody? Uh, how do you knock on a pup tent? <laughs> There's nobody in here, Unc. Oh, my goodness, nobody home. Uh, Leroy, get away from that cannon before it goes off and takes you with it. Why did we wait so long? If all these pup tents are empty, I'm certainly going to be in the doghouse. Hey, Uncle Mort, here comes a soldier. Shall we invite him? Uh, yes, of course. Oh, uh, a soldier? Yeah? Uh, how would you like to come over to my house for dinner now? Well, I don't know. Uh, we're going to have a... Hey, one... wait a minute. You leave this boy alone. He's coming home to dinner with me. Is that so? Don't you try to rustle my recruit. I saw him first. Oh, no, you didn't. I saw him first. You did not. I saw him at least 20 seconds before you did. Mister, I saw this boy 20 years before you did. He's my son. You... <laughs> Come on, boy. Mom's waiting. Yeah, Mom's waiting. Oh, my goodness. Leroy, if I don't bring back a bevy of boys for that gang of girls, my goose will be cooked instead of my turkeys. Hey, let's look in this big tent. Maybe somebody's here. Huh? Oh, hello, mister. Hello. Uh, 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 this is the mess tent, Leroy. Hello, Sergeant. Leroy, this is the mess, Sergeant. Uh, where can I find some of your boarders, Sergeant? Uh, they've deserted me. And after I've been working my fingers to the bone over a hot stove all morning. Oh. You, you mean they've all been invited to homes already? Everybody, including my dishwasher. Oh, Leroy, we're sunk. You're sunk? What about me? Fifty gallons of the finest turkey a la king made from a special recipe created by Prudence Penny. <laughs> Twenty dozen dainty Parker House rolls that couldn't be topped by Parker House himself. And 32 mince pies made out of the tenderest part of the mince. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can sympathize with you, Sergeant, but maybe you can help us. How? Well, it, it just so happens that we've gotten ourselves in something of a mess, Sergeant. Uh, we have three turkeys and almost a dozen beautiful girls at our house just waiting to entertain some soldiers. Yeah, you should see the cookies that are waiting for the rookies. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have a wonderful time at our house, Sarge. How about taking off that apron and coming with us? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm on duty. Yeah? Like the captain of a ship, everybody else can leave. But I got to get down with me pot. <laughs> Gee, that's too bad. Come on, Uncle. Uh, before you go, I got just one slight request I'd like to make. Uh, would you please take a taste of my turkey a la king? Well, I don't think I... Oh, come on. Huh? Just one teensy-weensy little taste. Well, just so I didn't labor all morning in vain. Uh, Here. It's conscientious, isn't it, Leroy? Well, thank you. Uh, you have some, son? Thank you, but it has spoiled my appetite for dinner. And I've been saving this appetite for a week. How do you like it, mister? Well, I think I'll have a little more. Oh, no, 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 Uncle huh? Mort. Come on, we got to dig up some soldiers. Uh, you're right, Leroy. Are you sure you won't come with us, Sarge? No, buddy. Duty is duty. And besides, the colonel would be sure to catch me if I sneaked out. Oh, the colonel? I'll bet he's got a few soldiers up his sleeve. Where can I find him? Way over there at the other end of the square, sitting in his tent. Yes, sir. Well, come on, Leroy. We'll lay our troubles in his lap. Yes, yes, I'm Colonel Atterbury. What can I do for you? Uh, Colonel, my name is Gildersleeve. Oh, yes, very unusual name. What can I do for you? Uh, 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 Colonel, uh, Colonel? <laughs> I... I have a lovely big home, a wonderful cook, and a dozen of the sweetest girls in Summerfield. What? No boys? Uh, no. That's the trouble. No boys. We get all prepared to entertain 10 or 12 soldiers at dinner today, and when I come down to pick them up, what do I find? No soldiers. Not a single solitary rear rank third assistant buck private. Well, I, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, he gargles. <laughs> By George, this is a pretty pickle for our army to get itself caught over a barrel into. Yeah. And after I've been practicing mess calls all day, too. Yes. The poor little fellow almost blew his brains out. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Gildersleeve. Gildersleeve. So I think I know you from someplace. Huh? Yes? 
Yes, I can't place your face, but your manners are awfully familiar. Yeah. <laughs> well, never mind. As soon as some of our men return, I'll send them out to your house. Yeah, huh? That's just the old brush off. I'm just stubborn enough to stay right stubborn. here. Stubborn? That's it. I've got it. Huh? You. <laughs> that's where I know you from. You were stuck again, Gildersleeve. The officer who bought more bad mules than the whole artillery could shake a stick at. Why, you... <laughs> Don't pay any attention to the way he jokes, Leroy. Great kidders, these army men. Well, Colonel, now that you recognize me, I hope you'll trot out some suitable recruits for us to take home. Gildersleeve, I've got just the right detachment for you. Yeah, wonderful. Who are they? Some old friends of yours. Huh? Whole corral full of mules. They just love to be your guest. Uh, <laughs> Whoa. Come on, Leroy. Whoa. Let's get out of here. Uh, uh, what am I laughing at? Donna, wish you'd invited me to go to dinner today. Uh, Leroy, you better run along home now and tell the girls I'll bring back some soldiers if I have to call out the Marines. Okay, Uncle. Where are you going now? I'm going to try the USO headquarters. And if you see any soldiers on the way home, grab them, even if they're wearing Civil War uniforms. I'll do my best, Uncle Mort. See you when you get home. Yeah, all right, Leroy. Oh, uh, look who's standing on the corner. Well, hello, Judge Hooker. Hello, Gildersleeve. Uh, what's wrong? You look as though you've lost your last friend. But, of course, I know that happened years ago. <laughs> Gildersleeve, I'll thank you to keep your nose out of my business. I'll be only too glad to. Uh, what are you doing hanging around street corners? I'm... Well, it's a long story. Huh? I happened to turn on the radio at home last night, and there was a fellow urging everyone to invite a soldier to dinner. Oh, 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 he did. Ah, um, that speaker. Uh, There's a man. Uh, the way he told every citizen to do his duty by our new army was stirring and inspirational. It's, it was, eh? Yes. Why, the first thing I did this morning was phone the best restaurant in town and order the most expensive turkey dinner out to my house. Uh, I was going to invite a soldier to share it. That's the effect that speaker had on me. Well, uh, where is your soldier? Well, that's where the trouble comes in. Huh? People at the USO headquarters tell me that there would have been plenty of them to go around if this radio speaker hadn't wrecked all their plans by urging everybody in town to come down after a soldier. Oh, my goodness. So that was it. Of all the numbskull notions... Not I... a word against that man, Gildersleeve. Huh? He made a wonderful impression on me. Uh... Clean-cut, vibrant personality. Uh -huh. One of nature's noblemen, I should judge. <laughs> Wish I could meet him someday. Would you really want to? Yes. Well, then shake hands. Oh, you'd like to meet him, too. Good gracious, no, I am him. <laughs> what? Yeah. You? Why, you hypocritical hippopotamus. What? <laughs> no. No, that's wrong with me. I've misjudged you, Gildersleeve. Well, I guess I've misjudged you, too, Judge Hooker. I never thought you had a heart under that old thick hide of yours. No? No. I just thought your blood circulated because you brought it to a boil so often. <laughs> what are you doing roaming the streets on Thanksgiving afternoon, Gildy? Yeah, same thing as you are, Hooker. Looking for some military men to fight their way through a couple of 20-pound turkeys. Well, I suppose we do our hunting together, Gildy, old pal. Why not, old chum? After all, this is Thanksgiving Day, and we should treat each other like human beings for change. Splendid. That goes for me, too. At least for today. Yeah, well, come on, come on, come on. You work this side of the street, and I'll take the other side. All right. Oh, boy. Wait a moment. What is it? Look, here comes the young fellow in uniform now. And I saw him first. Yes, that's so. Hey, hey, son, come here, come here. Uh, stop that, you double-crossing little bot fly. Young man, how'd you like a delicious turkey dinner? Huh? Who, me? Yes, he wants you to come up to my house. I don't either. I'm in my house. I've got a great big turkey just for two of us. Uh, we got four turkeys at our house, and we'll give you a whole one for yourself, son. Oh, gee whiz, I couldn't eat that much. And besides, I'm supposed to report to USO headquarters. Uh, They're closed for the day, uh, Corporal. Come on out to my house. Oh, but I'm not a corporal. Of course not, Sergeant. Now, my car's right over here. <laughs> so if you'll excuse us, Judge... No, come this way with me, Lieutenant. <laughs> You wouldn't like it at his place, Captain. Oh, now, gentlemen, please. please let go of me. Hey, you're tearing my uniform. Let go of the Major's uniform. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's trot along. Let's trot along. Okay. If you want to get indigestion, now my turkey is... His turkey is as old as he is and just as tough. Hey, I wish somebody would tell me what this is all about. Don't let him confuse you, son. I'll take you to a movie after dinner. A movie? Uh, we're going to have dancing at our house. You'll have 12 beautiful hostesses to dance with. Oh, who wants to dance on a full stomach? You do, don't you, son? Oh, gee, I don't know. I never learned. No time like right after dinner. 
Come on, that's my car, right over there. Of all the low-down, backbiting, double-dyed, unscrupulouses, I've had enough. Come back here, young man. Who, me? Yes, you. I'm going to start off entertaining you this afternoon by making this fat worm fold up like a road map. Uh, here, hold my coat. I'll be very glad to. No, I won't. Now, see here, Hooker, you point a pinky at me, and I'll beat the daylights out of you and then back in again. Uh, gee, aren't you two fellas a little too old for this sort of thing? If you keep out of this, who invited you to... Say, I invited you. Come on, let's go home. No, you don't, Gildersleeve. I'm going to knock you colder than an Eskimo mother-in-law's kiss. Why, you old... You... Oh. <laughs> What's the use of quarreling like this? If you've got your heart set on taking this young man home, Judge, I won't stand in your way. Yeah, but haven't I anything to say? No. Gildersleeve, do you mean this? Yes, Judge. Go on, get your car. Hurry up now before I change my mind. All right. You just wait right here, soldier. I'll be back in a jiffy, and then we'll have a wonderful dinner. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, Gildy. Yeah. Yeah. Gee whiz, mister, you got me all confused. Do I have to have dinner with that other gentleman? With that old goat? Of course not. Huh? Wait till he turns the corner. All right, come on. I'll run like anything. But, but the judge went that way. I know that. My car is this way. Hurry up, boy. Huh? There they are now. Come on, girls. Let's go to the front door. Come on. Bertie, get things ready. Leroy, there's your cue. Well, well, well. Here we are at last. Step right in, son, and meet everybody. Mm, gee, thanks. Yeah. Hey, girls, this is Jerry Arnold, Private Jerry Arnold of the United States Army. Oh, no, sir. Oh, you're not a private? Oh, no, sir. I'm not even in the Army. What? You're not? I know, sir. I'm a Boy Scout. Oh! Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, whether you celebrate Thanksgiving next Thursday or the week after, there's one thing that's the same everywhere. Yes, that turkey's going to taste mighty good with all its trimmings and fixings. And we all want to remember that we Americans still have plenty to be thankful for. And another thing that's certain... If you make your Thanksgiving cakes and pastries and cookies with parquet margarine, you're going to get plenty of compliments on their downright good taste. You see, the delicious flavor that makes parquet margarine so popular for table use makes it wonderful for baking, too. Yes, as sure as parquet is a delicious spread, it's a genuine flavor shortening, too, not a bland, tasteless fat. Parquet adds flavor to pan-fried foods, too, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. So serve parquet margarine at the table... Use it for baking and pan frying, too. Remember, you can use all you want because parquet margarine is economical and good for your family. Yes, parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing energy food and a reliable source of vitamin A. So right now, add parquet margarine to your shopping list. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Sorry, our time's up. Happy Thanksgiving, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gilders League. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 Kraft presents the Great Gilders League. <laughs> <laughs> week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, is your family the hard-working, hard-playing kind? Of course, most of us are these days. Increased effort is expected of every one of us. And that's why plenty of wholesome, nourishing energy food is so vitally important. The kind of food that replaces the energy we use up every day. Well, one of the best energy foods you can serve is delicious parquet margarine, 
made by Kraft. Yes, parquet margarine is an economical source of nourishment and energy your whole family needs. You'll be glad to know, too, that every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. What's more, parquet margarine is so downright good-tasting, your family will eat all they need. Yes, parquet margarine's delicate, satisfying flavor is sure to make a hit, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. So why not give your family the benefits of this delicious, nourishing food and start serving them parquet margarine tomorrow? Yes, when you order, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. In the attic, yes. What about it, Leroy? Well, look what I found up there. An old family album. An uh, album? Oh, is that so? Any pictures of me in it? Ah, there. You're number one of the Port Parade. Yes. Yeah. Leroy. May I look at it, Uncle? Uh, sure, Marjorie. Go ahead if you want to. Thanks. Oh, look at this one. Huh? Oh, what a beautiful baby. Yes. Yeah. Say, who is she? Well, if you must know, she's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mean you didn't always have that mustache? Yeah, well, not as a little shaver. <laughs> Turn the page, Marjorie. Huh? Oop. <laughs> Forgot about that one in the little Lord Fauntleroy outfit. <laughs> Wish I had those beautiful curls today. For corn's sake, look at the lace on your pants. <laughs> Leroy, at that age, did I know what I was doing? Oh, Uncle. Look, here's one where you're a little older. Huh? With two pretty little rabbits. Oh, yes, my rabbits. Those are my pets. I call them Flopsy and Mopsy. I intended to raise them and make enough money to pay my way through college. What happened, Uncle Mort? Nothing. I paid two bucks for those rabbits. <laughs> what was the matter? That was it. Two bucks. <laughs> Huh? Are these your first long pants you're wearing in this picture? Yes, uh, tight, weren't they? When people saw me wearing them, they just split. Who are the people or the pants? Yeah. First the pants, then the people. <laughs> Here's a picture taken not so long ago. Well, How can you tell? Well, Uncle Mort is almost as fat as he is now. Leroy, the bathing suit he's wearing. Yes, that suit was all wool and a yard wide. <laughs> What's that thing you're eating, Unc? Uh, let me see. Eating? Oh, uh, I wasn't eating anything. I was just blowing up my water wings. <laughs> Say, I feel kind of chilly. Uh, Bertie, uh, shut the front door. I can't. It's stuck. Oh, probably the change in the weather. I'll take care of it, children. Yeah. Now, what's the trouble, Bertie? But no wonder that door is stuck. There's a man's foot caught inside. I know that, and he refuses to take it out. Oh, well, let him in. He's probably a visitor. Say no visitor. It's a salesman. Salesman? How do you know? Cause the hot air's coming from the outside inside. Oh. <laughs> Mister, get your foot out this door, cause we ain't in the market for none. Yeah. Well, let me handle him now, Bertie. I'll brush him off quickly. Now, don't you go buying any foolish, worthless stuff like you did last time. Huh? That perfume was nothing but water. Well, how did you know, Bertie? Did you open the bottle? <laughs> no, sir. But the salesman come round to the back, and I bought some myself. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you run along back to the kitchen. I'll get rid of this chap. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ah, good afternoon, sir. My company is introducing a new cigar. Well, I don't want it. And I'm giving out a few boxes to discriminating judges of tobacco as free samples. I said I... Uh, oh, uh, free? Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> well, let's step in out of the cold, sir. Oh. Here, let me help you with those big, heavy boxes. Oh, thank you. You're thank such a little fellow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was always considered quite an authority on good cigars. What's the name of this new brand? Mister, these are the genuine made in Havana, aged in the wood, soaked in the New England maple syrup La Rumba Panatella cigar. Yeah. Once you get the La Rumba habit, you can't shake it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they certainly sound good. Oh, and they smell good, too. Huh? Now, just sample the delicious aroma. Hmm? Go ahead. Let your nose run riot. Oh. Uh, 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 let me see. Uh, 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 <laughs> Clears the head, doesn't it? Practically clears the room. <laughs> I'm afraid these are rather strong for me, young Oh, man. yeah, and after you've smoked a few, you'll be strong for them. I'll have to be, to be. 
Now, in consideration for advertising these wonderful cigars among your friends, we make absolutely no charge for them. Oh, you don't? Well, with Christmas coming on and everything, I think I could manage to get rid of five or ten boxes for you. Oh, it's splendid, splendid. I might add that while we make absolutely no charge for the cigars themselves, we ask you to pay for cellophane, band, and the box. That's yeah. only to be expected, of course. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> What does that amount to? Oh, I hate to even mention it. So do I, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> let me see. Yeah. Four and two. Four and two. Eight and six cents. Huh? Well, that comes to a total of a dollar and ninety-eight cents per box. A dollar ninety-eight. Well, is that all? Oh gosh, I forgot taxes. What's the matter with me? Shall I tell you? <laughs> But you wouldn't expect us to lose money, now, would you? Oh, no. I'd hate myself if you lost money. (laughs) How much are the taxes? Only 50 cents a box. Now, are you taking five or ten boxes? Well, come to think of it, I don't know an awful lot of people here in Summerfield. Hardly more than a box full. (laughs) Well, now, our company doesn't think it's worthwhile to send me all the way out here on a cold afternoon for just one lousy... I mean, one box, mister. (laughs) I'm afraid that at least uh, they'll let me give away free to you is uh, four boxes. Uh, no, thanks. Maybe I'll take more the next time you come around. Mister, with these cigars, there won't be no next time around. Uh, well, for the most I could accept is it, two boxes. Well, uh, I can't force you to take more. All right, here's your two free boxes. Now, that'll be $4.96. Yes, uh, $1.98 for two boxes. Four ninety six. yes, you're right. <laughs> I was always good on arithmetic. This is re- You're very generous, really. Here's a $5 bill. Oh, thank you. Now... Wait just a second. You've Uh, got some change coming. Oh, yeah. Four cents. Four cents. Yes. Funny, it's Uh, lots of silver here, but no pennies. Oh, that's all right. You can forget it. Oh, no, no, no. I'll get it for you somehow. Uh Oh. Oh, here we are. Yes. What's this? Your change. Your one cent stamp and three sticks of chewing gum. Goodbye. Oh! in the living room, Piggy. We got the whole house to ourselves. Say, is there any more candy around? Nope. We ate all the cookies, too. Too bad. Nothing sweet left, huh? Nothing unless you want to try these new cigars of my uncle's. They're soaked in maple syrup. You mean these? Yeah. Let's see them. Lomba Panadolas. Say, I-, I wouldn't open that box if I were you. Oh, it was open already. See? Some have been taken out. I bet no one would miss this one. Hey, what do you think of the doing? Smoking us? Maybe. What if I am? Oh, I bet you wouldn't dare. Is that so? Bet you I would, too. Only it's so long. I bet you'd be scared to go havers with me. Who, who, me? Smoke a cigar? Yeah, I knew you'd go chicken. I won't either. I ain't afraid of doing anything you ain't afraid of doing, I ain't. All right, let you smoke it, then. All right, give it here. Here. Bet you don't even know which end to put in your mouth. I do, too. Only I forgot. <laughs> which end is it? Ah, oh, the one you don't like. Oh. My pa always bites off one end first. Like this? Uh-huh. What does he do with the end he bites off? I don't know. Swallows it, I guess. Boy, he does? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Oh, boy, it tastes terrible. Want me to light it for you? Sure, I guess so. No fun smoking an unlit cigar, is there? Nope. Hold still and puff. No, puff in, not out. Oh. That's better. How's it taste? Well, <coughs> it's pretty hard to describe. <coughs> here, here, you try it a while and find out for yourself. Look, I can exhale every puff. Well, don't hog it all day. It's my turn again. Well, I try blowing smoke through my nose. <laughs> uh, okay, you can have it now. Gee, you got it all unwrapped. Uh, I'm sorry. You want me to tie a piece of string around the outside cover? <laughs> or a rubber band? No, I think it'll be all right. Now watch me. What's that supposed to be? I'm blowing smoke rings. You ain't either. Them's clouds. <laughs> Heck, I can do better than that. Okay, here, you take it. Oh, no, I didn't mean for you to do that. You can keep it as long as you want to. Oh, that's all right. I'm not selfish. Well, all right. How's this? (laughs) You better puff on it a while, pig. (laughs) Smoke gets in my eyes. (laughs) Well, 
Okay. It sure is a strong cigar, ain't it? Yeah, as strong as I ever smoked. <laughs> oh, what's the matter, Leroy? Don't you feel well? Well, there's been times when I felt better. Here, ready for another drag? No, no not just yet. I, I think I'd better sit down for a while. You mean you're, you're dizzy? Yeah. Well, sitting down won't help. I know I'm sitting, and I'm dizzy, too. <laughs> I, I, I wonder what's wrong with us. I haven't any idea. Do you think it's... Say, Pig, sit still, will you? I ain't moving. Except my head seems to be going around. Gee, that's funny. you got two heads. <laughs> and they're both kind of green. <laughs> two heads, huh? Well, that accounts for it, then. Counts for what? I can see two whole rooms. You know, I don't think I feel so good. Do you do you think it could possibly be the, the cigar? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Here, Leroy, you can have it. No, 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 you go ahead and keep it. Keep it. There's lots more where that one came from. Oh, my goodness. Now my stomach's starting to go around, too. Yeah, I know just how you feel. If it's all right with you, Leroy, I think I'll go now. You're not mad or anything. Oh, no. If you want any more of the cigar, it's right here on the fern stand. <gasps> See, he, he, don't hurry off. I better go or you might be sorry I stayed. <laughs> oh, gee whiz. No, I'm beginning to see what you mean. I better get some fresh air, too. Hey, Peggy, wait for me. <laughs> Wowsy than woozy. How about you, Leroy? Oh, I'm all right, except for my head, which is awful light, and my feet, which are awful heavy, and my stomach, which is awful. Awful what? That's all, just awful. <laughs> Gee, I don't think I've got a stomach anymore. Boy, are you lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy. Just close your eyes. No, no, no. Every time I close my eyes, tapioca keeps floating in front of me. <laughs> tapioca with me on life. Do you think we should get up and walk around a while? No, no, no. Let's stay here in the garage until it stops going around. Darn the guy who invented cigars anyhow. Who was he? I don't know. Some Indian named Corona, I think. <laughs> I can't see how Uncle Mort can keep smoking them all day long without falling over. Imagine going around like this all the time. Gee, I just thought of something. Do you think we're going to stop growing now? Oh, gosh, I don't know. We should have thought of that before. But suppose we do. How am I going to play football in college? I just weigh 97 pounds. Uh, are, are you sure that one cigar will stop you from growing? Since I started smoking, I ain't been sure of anything. I'm awful glad I stopped. Me too. Why, I would never smoke another cigar. Oh, it makes me sick even to mention cigars. Oh, gee whiz. What is it now? What's going to happen when your folks come back and find a living room full of smoke? Jeepers. Uncle Mort will send me to Alcatraz. <laughs> oh, we, we better sneak back and open all the windows so the place can air out. Not me. I'm going home just as soon as my legs will cooperate with each other. Ah. <laughs> Ah, oh, Piggy, you can't run out on me now. Not now, but just as soon as I can stand up, I will. But how can you? Help, I didn't want to smoke a cigar. Help, back in the water. It was you. Back in the hey, hit us all like Bertie. Come on. Look, smoke coming out of the living room. Gee, it's lucky we got out. There's a fire. Good, now nobody will notice the cigar smoke. <laughs> cigar smoke. That's it. Piggy, where'd you throw that cigar we were smoking? In the front stand, why? I bet that's what started the fire. Come on. Get the water. We're coming, Bernie. Oh, there's the garden hose. Piggy, run and turn the water on. Here I come, Bernie. Put on the fire. Put on the fire. I will if you get away from the window. I want to climb in. What'd you say? Get away from the... <laughs> get that out. I'm not on fire. Sorry. I, I warned you. Levi, what you doing? Climbing in the window to water the Oh, say, this is only making the smoke worse. Well, keep it up, Leroy. You're putting it 
the water, Piggy. Yeah. Turn off the water out there, boy. Oh, I don't feel so good. Leroy, you're the hero. Oh. Leroy! Turn off the water again, boy. Leroy's not faded. Marjorie, are you sure we've ordered all the candy we need for Christmas? Oh, yes, Uncle Lloyd. My, you've been buying like Santa Claus with a sweet tooth. Well, why not? No matter how many Thanksgivings we have, Christmas comes once a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's run along home now, Uncle. All right, my dear. Say, let's get something for Leroy to have this afternoon. I see just the thing he's going to enjoy. You do? What is it? Oh, something that every boy likes. Wait till you see Leroy's face when he opens these chocolate cigars. <laughs> see what I tell you, Bertie? He's opening his eyes. Yeah, but he don't look like he's seeing anything. Leroy, honey, is you all right? Oh, oh, me? Oh, yes, I'm all right. And you just lay there on the sofa whilst I try to clean up this mess in the living room. I can't figure out for the life of me how that fire starts. Hey, Piggy. Yeah? Gee, what are we going to say when Uncle Mort comes home and asks us how the fire started? Well, we could say it was a spark from the fireplace if there was a fire in the fireplace. Except there's no fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, if they ever find out how that fire really started, I'll be cooked. Haven't you got a good idea? Yes, I'm going home. So long, Leroy. See you in school. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, hello there, Piggy. Oh, now I'm really going to be sick. Uh, 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 say, what's that I smell? Did Bertie burn something? Yeah, the living room. What? Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, come back here a moment, young man. Uh, where is Bertie? She's mopping up the water on the carpet. Look, what water? The water Leroy squirted on the fern box just before he did a nosedive onto the floor. Oh, my goodness. Uncle, what's happened around here? I don't know for sure, Marjorie, but the way I understand it, Leroy was watering the fern box in the living room. After flooding the floor, he tried to dive on it while Bertie was cooking the rug. <laughs> that couldn't be. Well, that's Piggy's story. Yeah, well, it, it was nice visiting you. Here, here, come along with us, young man. We're going to get to the bottom of all this. Dear. Huh? Oh, look at Leroy on the sofa. Yeah. Are you all right, Leroy? Oh, hello, Marge. Hello, Uncle Marge. Well, by George, he does look all washed out. Oh. Young man, what do you mean by diving on your nose in the carpet? You leave that poor little boy alone. He's a hero. Just like Dewey at Vanilla. Vanilla. <laughs> what do you mean, Bertie? Why, there was a fire and Leroy ran in here with the hose and saved us all from being a lot of clinkers. Well, you're a brave boy, Leroy. By the way, Bertie, how did the fire happen to start? Oh, oh my huh? head. Oh, oh, my stomach. Yeah. Oh, oh, my. What's wrong? Oh, I know. He's inhaled too much smoke. Yes, that's it, Uncle Morse. Well, we're going to get you well in no time at all. No time at all. That's good. Yes. Marjorie, what's the office number of Dr. Shilsby? Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't need a doctor. It's uh, Rosebud 2212. Uh, thanks. Uh, hand me that phone, please, Bertie. Uh, thank you. Now, don't try to get up, Leroy. Just relax like a piece of liver. No! Uh, hello, Dr. Silsby? Uh, this is Brockmorton P. Gildersleeve. I want you to come right over. There was a little fire at our place. I know you're not a fireman. My nephew, Leroy, put it out, and now he isn't feeling so hot. Yeah, get over here as quickly as you can, Doctor. <laughs> in the world keeping that, Doctor. Oh, uh, while we're waiting for him, Leroy, here's a little surprise I brought to you from downtown. Here. It's some chocolate cigar. No. Yeah. <laughs> Quick, somebody water. He's going to paint again. No, no, I'll, I'll be all right, Uncle. Oh. Chocolate and cigars. I couldn't take it. Oh, well, I'm sorry, my boy. Uh, but you won't refuse a nice big chocolate cigar, will you, Piggy? Uh, yes, Mr. Ulysses. I couldn't. Huh? That is, Leroy might feel bad if he saw me eating it. Oh, yes. Well, that's very considerate. We'll save them for later, then. Uh, by the way, uh, how did this fire in the living room start, Piggy? You mean the fire from the cigar in the fern stand? Oh! oh, oh, oh. Well, what's wrong, my boy? It hurts. The scar I got from the fern stand that was on fire. Oh, yes. 
Peggy, isn't it time for you to go home? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I gotta be going now. Yes. Well, it gets me. How a fern stand can suddenly, without any cause, burst into flame as one for Ripley. Maybe it was spontaneous compulsion. You... <laughs> I suppose we'll never know. Yeah, let's let sleeping dogs sleep. Excuse me, Mr. Gillespie, but look what I found in the ruins of that there fernery that was on fire. Well, looks like remnants of a cigar. Why, this could have started the whole thing. Well, folks, now I really got to go. So long, Roy. Good night, Mr. Gillespie. What's bothering that young man? Well, that's Piggy's way, Unc. Here today, gone tomorrow. (laughs) Well, son, you rest till the doctor gets here. I'm going to look into a few matters. Come on, Bertie. Let Leroy sleep. I can't understand. How did a cigar get into the fern stand? Oh, talking of cigars, Bertie, did anything happen to those two new boxes of La Rumba's? They putting them in boxes now? No, I'm, I'm talking about my cigars. Oh, yes, here they are. Let me see. Uh, six missing, and I only took out five. Bertie, have you been putting the snatch on my stogies? Yes, sir. Aha! Uh-huh. I snatches them off the furniture, and I put them in the ashtray. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, if you've been smoking my cigars. Me? Oh, I should say not. I ain't one of them society ladies. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody took one. Uh, Marjorie? Yes, Uncle Mark. Uh, I've been doing a little detective work about that fire. You know, I've always fancied myself as another thin man. <laughs> 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 and uh, I have a pretty good idea how it started, too. How, Uncle? Well, I think I know who dropped the cigar into that fern stand. Now, don't look at me with that sealy glint in your eye, Sherlock Holmes. I haven't smoked a cigar since last election. Oh, yeah. Oh, be serious, Marjorie. Uh, did you notice how evasive Leroy and Piggy Banks were when I questioned them just now? No, I didn't. Oh, no, of course not. You weren't even there. But they were as hard to pin down as a baby on a roller coaster. But Leroy, smoking a cigar. Didn't you notice their appearance? They were both as pale around the gills as a whitefish. Did smoking a cigar have that effect? I should say. I'll never forget my first corn silk corona. <laughs> I was weak for days, and in the days for weeks. Uh, and besides all this circumstantial evidence, there's one real incriminating clue. What's that? Leroy's little finger. What's wrong with his little finger? He's wearing the cigar band from that missing cigar. Ah, uh, at last, Doctor. What delayed you? Did you stop on the way to cure a couple of hams? Fine thanks for rushing away from an office full of patients. Well, where's the sick boy? Show me to him. Oh, yes, just a second, Doc. Uh, Since I phoned you, I found out a few things. I think Leroy is sick because he smoked one of my cigars. Well, I can understand that. I smoked one of them, too. Yes, but I I can't get him to admit it, Doctor. He just keeps groaning and changing the subject. Now, I've got an idea how we can smoke out this whole cigar business. Uh, what's that? Uh, what kind of sickness would have the same preliminary symptoms as smoking a cigar, Doc? Oh, almost any of these juvenile illnesses. Yeah. Measles, chicken pox, or mumps, say. Say, mumps will do. You examine Leroy, and you tell him he's got the mumps. That'll bring the truth out of him. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, you and your scheme. Yeah. Remember what to do, Doc. Ah, Leroy. Uh, here's uh, Dr. Silsby to take care of our sick little boy. Oh, suffering stuff. Yes. You didn't need to bother uh, Dr. Wunk. I'll be all right in a couple of hours. Well, now that I'm here, boy, I better give you a quick once over. You see your tongue? Mm hmm. Now, uh, say ah. Ah. Yeah. I better take your pulse. Keep your dum 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 dum. Now, you can put your tongue back in now. Thanks. <laughs> Now, tell me, after you inhaled this smoke, did you suffer any attack of vertigo? No, I was just dizzy. Oh, yeah. And uh, this was accompanied by acute nausea? It was nausea, all right, but there was nothing cute about it. <laughs> well, that's just as I thought. Let me feel your jaws. Oh. Hey, what are you talking about? Mr. Gildersleeve, has this boy ever had the mumps? Uh, mumps? I don't think so. Have you ever had the mumps before, Leroy? No. Say, you don't think I got them now, do you, Doc? Well, it's a little early to say for sure, but the indications point that way. Oh. Yes, isn't that too bad? Looks like you'll have to stay in bed instead of going to that big football game, Leroy. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Gee, Doc, maybe you're mistaken. Maybe if you knew what really happened, you wouldn't call it mumps. But what do you mean, what really happened, Leroy? Oh, gee, I, I should have told you before. I'll go more at the reason I got sick and looked so pale and everything is... Well, it's... Gee, I hate to tell you, but... Oh, why did I do it? 
Why did you do what, Leroy? Why did I smoke one of your cigars? Ah, at last. Now we're getting the truth. Young man, I'm surprised at you. Oh, gee, I'm, I'm sorry I ever did, Uncle Moore. Sorry as I can be. Yes, I think you've learned your lesson, Leroy. I have, Uncle Mort. I really have. I don't know, maybe Dr. Silsby can see it's the cigar that makes me look this way and, and not much. Well, Leroy, that was just a little put-up job. A little scheme to get the truth out of you. <laughs> you, uh, you really haven't got the mumps, has he, Doctor? No, he hasn't, Gildersleeve. But according to his pulse and his temperature and these spots on his chest, he has got the measles. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, do you grown-ups remember the old-fashioned kitchen on baking day? Mmm, what fragrance with cakes and pies and cookies in the oven. Why, everything smelled so good, my mouth barely watered in anticipation of all the good things to eat. And nowadays, lots of up-to-the-minute housewives are learning the modern secret of that old-time home-baked flavor. Yes, more and more good cooks are insisting on a real flavor shortening for baking, instead of bland, tasteless fat. That's why so many good housewives are using parquet margarine for baking. For a flavor shortening is just what parquet is. You see, the delicate taste that makes parquet so delicious for table use gives extra flavor to baked foods, too. Yes, and that's the secret of foods pan-fried in parquet. They're tastier, too, and parquet doesn't batter or stick to the pan. And remember, parquet margarine is good for you. Yes, parquet is a wholesome, nourishing energy food that contains important vitamin A. But why not try delicious, economical parquet margarine and find out how good it is yourself? Just ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. That's part of the cure for measles, you know. Who's that? Leroy, it's me, Piggy. I just sneaked back to see if they found out. Yeah, they did. Gee, did you catch it? I'll say I did. Yeah. Looks like you're going to catch it too, Piggy. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week for the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. And reminding you that every one of us can help in the nation's defense program by joining the Red Cross during its annual roll call, November 11th to November 30th. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, even though winter doesn't officially begin till December 22nd, it's here right now for most of us. Yes, and on cold, blustery days, plenty of good, nourishing food is all important. I mean food that supplies energy, food that produces body warmth, food that keeps us going despite the weather. Now, parquet margarine, the delicious vegetable margarine made by Kraft, is just such a food. Parquet margarine is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And that means it's tops in producing body warmth, too. And equally important in wintertime, parquet is rich in vitamin A. Yes, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. 
But parquet margarine isn't just good for you. It's mighty good tasting, too. Whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. So for all these reasons, wholesome, economical parquet margarine deserves a place on your shopping list. Why not order a pound or two tomorrow? Just ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's the margarine that's made by Kraft. And now let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. Those certainly were two swell movies. Yes, thanks for taking us. Did you enjoy them? Well, Marjorie, I'll have to confess I fell asleep in the middle of the first feature and woke up toward the end of the second one. You did? Yes, Leroy. Those 65 cent seats are too darn comfortable. Now, tell me, did Betty Davis finally marry Hopalong Cassidy? <laughs> Uncle, they weren't even in the same picture. Oh, they weren't? Well, then he must have been singing to a blonde horse. <laughs> now I'm all confused. Uh, who was it that defeated Notre Dame in the newsreel? Tarzan or Popeye? <laughs> it was Charlie's aunt. Yes. And he wasn't in the newsreel. He's in the picture coming next week. Oh. <laughs> That's the trouble with the movies. You can't sleep there in peace. But they need her more actresses like Betty Grable. Yes. Now, there's a girl with beautiful possi- potential. Uh, she'll get somewhere, that young lady. <laughs> well, it's almost midnight, so we'd all better get... Well, look at that. A bird cage. Yeah, where did that come from? It, there's a canary inside. Well, I don't understand it. This wasn't here when we left. Maybe Bertie brought it in. Yes, let's find out. Oh, Bertie. Yes, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yeah, Bertie, whose canary is this? It's yours, Mr. Gillsleeve. It, it is? Yes, yeah, so you just won Napoleon in a rap. Oh, Napoleon? <laughs> I did? When did it happen? While I was asleep at the movies? No, sir, at my lodge. This is the night the mysterious and bewildering order of the daughters of Cleopatra hold their weekly business meeting and shag contest. <laughs> but I couldn't have been there. He was with us. Yes. Well, your uncle bought a ticket on our big raffle. Oh, yes, now I remember. But I thought you said the drawing was for a beautiful big set of dishes. No, sir. The lodge is raising money to buy itself a set of dishes, but the prize they're giving away is a canary bird. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is mighty nice to win on a 50-cent chance. First time I've won a prize since I wore my woolen underwear to that rumba contest. <laughs> Uncle. <laughs> I'd like to thank whoever it was that drew out the lucky number, Bertie. <laughs> well, it just so happens that the drawing was done by the grand exhausted ruler of the pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> and it also just so happens that that happens to be me. Yeah. <laughs> Why, Bertie. Of course, it was just a coincidence, but did anybody say anything? No, ma'am. But the show was a lot of black looks. Yes, I guess they were. Say, yeah. this Napoleon's a pretty feisty little bird. Will he sing? Of course he will. Only the man we brought him from says that in two, three days, he's got to get customized to his new surroundings. Uh, and after that, he'll sing just like this here Eddie Nelson. Uh, Eddie Nelson. Oh, I see, yes. Well, it's time for all of us to get to bed. You better find a cloth someplace, Bertie, and drape Napoleon for the night. Oh, we don't have to do that, Mr. Gillsleeve. This is a special newfangled kind of cage. Look. Yes, yes. Well, imagine that. A bird cage with Venetian blinds. Uh-huh. <laughs> when the daughters of Cleopatra do something, they don't mess around by half. Uh, that reminds me of something I kind of hate to bring up. Uh, what's that, Bertie? Well, speaking of halves, you never did pay me them four bits you owed me for that raffle ticket. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll see here, Napoleon. You've been a free boarder around here for a week now, and you haven't sung once. Not one single solitary... Stop eating a moment, Napoleon, and listen to me. <laughs> oh, now I've frightened you. Hey, what's the trouble, old man? Haven't I tried to be a pal to you? Haven't I? By George, look me in the eye when I'm talking to you. <laughs> You've got to do something around here to earn your keep. You think bird seed grows on trees? You better find your voice, little chum, or you'll find yourself directing, decorating somebody's hat. Hello, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yeah, hello. Is Napoleon worked yourself into a vocalizing mood yet? Yeah, not yet. You know, Bertie, I'm not one to look at gift bird in the bill. 
I'm afraid the cat's got this canary's tongue. No, sir, the cat was after this morning, but I chased him away. Oh, uh, well, I don't know much about birds. But if I, if, if ever I saw a moody mudlark, it's this jaundiced little jaybird. <laughs> you know, I can't understand it, Mr. Gillsleeve. This canary bird was not only guaranteed to sing, but the man said positively. If, well, maybe we better take Napoleon back to the store and get the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> well, there was no store. No. You know, we bought that dicky bird off of a man that was selling them off the back of a truck. But, but if he guaranteed them, he, he must have some permanent address. Well, he said something about if everything wasn't completely satisfactory to write him in care of the Canary Islands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only he didn't say which island. Oh, uh, well, I suspect he was selling hot canaries. Only this one is not so hot. <laughs> Good evening, Uncle Mort. Oh, good evening. Oh, is Napoleon still sulking? Well, I can't tell from the expression on his face. The only expression he's got. So what do you think, Bertie? I don't know nothing about canary birds. The only birds I've ever associated with is chickens. Yep. And even then only to the extent of southern frying them, you know. Yeah. Well, we, we may turn Napoleon into chicken a la king yet. Hi, <laughs> folks. Huh? Is that dumb bird still dumb? Yes, Leroy. We better get some advice from an expert. I think I'll go to a pet store or an aviary. Oh, you better try a pet store, Uncle Mort. Those aviaries are too busy these days with defense work. Oh, oh D-Roy, an aviary isn't a place where they work on aviation. Well, I know. It's a place where birds of a lot of different feathers all flock together. <laughs> Say, Uncle, why don't you come down to the library with me? i got to take a book back, and you can find out a lot of things about canaries there. That's an excellent idea. The bird stores are probably all closed, and... This way I can get the information I want tonight. Okay, but I can tell you one thing about that bird right now. What's that? He's no stool pigeon. What do you mean, Leroy? He won't sing. Uh, Here's the 88 cents for your fine, Leroy. The next time you want to use a dictionary, we'll buy one. Uh, turn it in while I find where the canary literature is, will you? Here's the information desk. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. Uh, 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 excuse me, young lady. Shh. Not so loud, please. Won't you step closer? Uh, closer? Oh. Hmm. Uh, I must come to the library oftener. <laughs> what can I do for you? If my canary refuses to sing. What? My canary, my canary won't sing. And I wonder if you could help me. I'd be glad to. Only I don't sing either. <laughs> <laughs> You don't, eh? I'll bet you... uh, Have you got any books for a canary in that condition? Well, the music department has some volumes with bird calls. Oh, I don't think that would do. You see, my canary can't read music. Well, uh, how about a book that you could read? Oh, that'd be splendid. Something that would tell me the cause and cureness of curtness or coyness in canaries. You'll find that under C over there in the reference room. Uh, You'll have to hurry now. We're closing in just a few minutes. Yeah, thanks. I will. Oh, dear... uh, Leroy, come along with me. I'm coming. Well, you better make it snappy, Unc. It's almost 9 o'clock. Oh, it won't take me long. Is this the reference room? Yeah. So let's see. Somewhere along here. The canopies. The canaries. The canaries. Oh, canaries. Ah, here's what we're looking for. Almost missed it. <laughs> Native birds of the Bronx and how to get the most out of them. <laughs> uh, what to do till the bird doctor comes. You're getting warm, Unc. Yes, I know I am. Here, hold my overcoat, will you? <laughs> There are 44 famous formulas for feeding our fine feathered friends by F. McGee. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like it. I don't think you'll have time to read much, Unc. Here's what we're after. A list of different feeds to food. I mean, uh, foods to feed Napoleon. You want to read them off, Unc, while I take them down? Oh, a splendid idea, young man. Ready? Sure, go ahead. Shoot the junk to me, Unc. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, watercress. Watercress. Uh, nasturtiums. Nasturtiums. Uh, dandelions. Dandelions. Uh, marigolds. Marigolds. Uh, what's happened to the lights? Gee, they put them out. It must be nine o'clock. Come on, Leroy. Let's get out of here before they lock us in. Okay, but I'm sort of mixed up. Which way is out? Uh, I think it's right over here. Oh. Not that way, Leroy. Here, take my hand. Oh! Ooh, an avalanche! Oh, my goodness. Oh! Two! <laughs> Leroy, where are you? Right here, under the book. Oh, are you hurt? Gee, my, my head feels funny. Say, your head does feel funny. I can feel it going around and around. That's not me, Uncle Mort. I'm over here. What, what am I touching, then? Oh, it must be that globe of the world. <laughs> Let's see if we can grope our way out into the other room. All right, take my hand. Oh! 
Oh, oh, to think of it, trapped in a public library at my age. Gee, Uncle Mort, everybody must be gone. How are we going to get out of here? Uh, we'll find some door we can open, Leroy, or else I'll locate a window big enough to crawl out of. Yeah, a bay window. If... <laughs> Never mind, young man, I'll stay close to me, so we won't get... Oh, 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 oh. Where are we now, Leroy? We're in the juvenile department now, Uncle. Uh, juvenile department? How do you know? The book's falling down and getting lighter. Oh. Good morning, Uncle Moore. Good morning, Leroy. Uh, good morning. My, but you two look pale and tired. You shouldn't stay out so late night. I kept you up so long. Well, it was like this, You better eat your breakfast, Leroy. Oh, oh, yes. Say, did you see the morning paper? There's the most mysterious story. Listen. Prowlers turn library topsy-turvy. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, my coffee went down the wrong way. <laughs> oh, gee, Uncle, we're sunk. Be quiet, Leroy. Let your sister read the morning paper. What else does it say, Marjorie? Oh, um, finding the door of the Summerfield Public Library open at 2 a.m. this morning... Patrolman Elmo Dunkel entered and discovered a scene of unparalleled confusion. Well, I wonder what that could have been. Gee, don't you know? <laughs> Thousands of books have been pushed from shelves, and the floor was, in some places, four feet deep in volume. That's an awful lie. I mean, it's awfully high, isn't it? <laughs> It was estimated by city librarian Helen Hunt Schultz... Oh, that, yes, Miss Schultz, yes. ...that the sorting and restacking of the books will require at least a week, during which the library will be closed. Boy, it's a good thing we got out our books last night. Yes. Shall I go on? Uh, yes, 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 very interesting, yes. very interesting, yes. Members of the detective squad who are investigating believe it to be the work of a gang known as the, the Laurel and Hardy Mob. Um, <laughs> led by a large, fat man and his skinny little lieutenant. Why, isn't it warm in here? <laughs> the detective discovered a clue in the form of a slip of paper reading, Watercress. Watercress. Nasturtium. Yes, oh. Uh, dandelions. Eat your dandelions, Leroy. Um, uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm really not terribly hungry. Yes. But incidentally, weren't you two at the library last night? Why, uh, yes. Come to think of it, we were, yes. Oh, I suppose you missed the fun. There was no fun while we were there. <laughs> we were looking for information about canaries. Did you find anything? Oh, we stumbled across a few books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, say, maybe we should give Napoleon a bath, huh? Uh, canaries are like people. They like to sing in the bathtub. <laughs> Shall we put the cage under the shower? He's... No, Leroy. Uh, Bertie, uh, you fill a soup plate with some tepid water, eh? Yes, sir. And if it'll help, I'll put some of my personal bath salts in it. Uh, they got the loveliest fragrance huh? called the last time I saw Harlem. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, thanks, Bertie. We can't take any chances in Napoleon singing Boogie Woogie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Yeah, all right. Maybe all he needs is a good wash job. Yeah. Now, here he is. I hope that canary bird can swim better than he can sing. Yes, thanks, Bertie. And now, you folks just go on with your breakfast. I'll handle this thing all by myself. Yeah, last time I saw Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, good morning, Napoleon. Uh, have a good night's rest? Yeah. Now, I've got a nice bath all fixed up for you. I'd better make you sing, brother. Gee, Uncle Mark, what are we going to do now? Uh, give this bird a ducky. No, no, I mean about the police and the library and stuff. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry, Leroy. They're not looking for us. They're after a couple of fellows who look like Laurel and Hardy. Oh, my goodness. They are looking for us. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes. Oh, let's not borrow trouble, Leroy. Let's forget the whole matter, huh? <laughs> Say, I'm afraid this plate is too big to get into your cage, nappy old chappy. Can I get a smaller dish? No, we'll leave it here just outside the cage and open the door. Yeah. There you are. Well, come on out, Napoleon. Nobody's going to bite you. Yeah, don't be bashful. Maybe you should prod him with your finger. Oh, that's an idea. Oh! He pecked me, the darn little dive bomber. 
I was afraid that'd happen. Hey, now he's going out. Yes, come on, Napoleon. Make it snappy. We haven't got all... No, 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 Napoleon. Stop flying around the room. Hey, there's your nice bath. Here. Look out. He's heading for a window. Window? Keep away from him. Uh, go back, you ding dong devil! Oh my goodness, he's gone! Yeah, he sure flew the coop. Oh come on, Leroy, bring the cage. We got to catch Napoleon before he heads for Florida. <laughs> I see him. Look, there he is on the branch of that tree. No, no, that's a yellow leaf. Oh, yes, I forgot it's November. I could have sworn it was Napoleon. <laughs> Say, don't look now, but what's that moving in the bushes? Where? Over there. Why, George, I think it's the bird, all right. Come on. Now, you head him off in the back, Leroy, and I'll sneak up on him from this side. Okay. Let me know if you catch him. Yes. Uh-oh. There he goes into that shrub. <laughs> now, where did he disappear to? He must be somewhere in here. Hey, Napoleon. Hey, nice Napoleon. Be a good boy and come back to Uncle Frockmorton, Napoleon. Hello there. Yeah, hello. Oh, oh, hello, officer. Excuse me, but what are you doing down there on your hands and knees, mister? Now, don't be stubborn, Napoleon. Uh, oh, say, you're a new man on the beat, aren't you? Yeah, what are you looking for in them bushes? Yeah, here, Napoleon, come out of there. Uh, what's that, officer? Oh, I'm I'm just looking for Napoleon. He's escaped. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. Aren't you a little late to look for Napoleon? Late? I hurried as fast as I could. He just flew out the window. Oh, he flew out the window, huh? Naturally. And did you fly out after him? Why, of course not. What do you think I've got, wings? I don't know. Have you? Uh, you can see that I haven't. Napoleon has, though. Oh, Napoleon has wings, has he? Yes. I was just trying to make him take his bath, but I guess he didn't want to, so he zoomed right out of the house. <laughs> well, didn't he wait to put on his clothes? Uh, why should he? Napoleon never wears clothes. Yeah. Here's Napoleon. Here, Napoleon. He uh, doesn't, huh? No. I'm afraid he'll catch cold in nothing but his feathers. <laughs> this is getting better by the minute. Say, are you sure you aren't Napoleon? No, see here, officer. Don't you stand there making jokes. If you want to be useful, come down here and help me find Napoleon. Here, Nappy. Here, Nappy. Here, oh, Nappy. fine. Huh? Hey, look, how small is this Napoleon you're looking for? Oh, he can't be over four inches high. Four inches high? Uh, okay, then, three inches. I thought I just saw him. Oh. Hey, look, uh, about how long have you been seeing this Napoleon? Oh, ever since I won him on a raffle. <laughs> you won him on a raffle? Yeah. Well, well I have a report to fill out. Uh, Napoleon! You see, all this happened because Napoleon refuses to sing. You think it's on account of him being in a strange house? I don't know. Do you live there? Yes. Then it's a strange house. Now, look, mister, let's walk over to the station where it's nice and warm and quiet instead of squatting in these bushes waiting for Napoleon to come marching out. Say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Now, look here, mister, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Napoleon's been dead already for close to 120 years. Oh, <laughs> I didn't mean that, Napoleon. Huh. The Napoleon I'm looking for is a bird. Yeah, well, he must be a cuckoo. Yeah. Now, look, are you coming along quietly, or do I have to... Sh Not a sound. There he is. You see him? Uh, here, Napoleon. Well, what do you know? It is a bird. Of course. Uh, Leroy, head him off. I am. Uh, Leroy, use your hat. Be careful you don't crush him. Hi, Bertie. Hop into your cage. There he goes in, Uncle Mort. I got him. Uh, you better take him in the house. Well, officer, uh, you satisfied? Yeah, but it's lucky that canary showed up when he did. Why? Well, <laughs> I, I was ready to run you in as one of them screwballs that busted into the public library last night. <laughs> That'd have been pretty silly, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> Just listen to that, children. Oui. Uh, beautiful, isn't it? He's sure on the groove, all right, all right. Oh, it's certainly worth a lot of trouble to get a bird to sing like that. You're right, Marjorie. Let's ask the clerk what kind of bird seed she feeds this canary and then buy some just like it for our Napoleon. Oh, miss, will you please come here? Uh, what can I do for you? Pleased to meet you. Uh, we have a canary and he refuses to sing, lady. Yeah, he won't give out with a jive. Leroy, he's not supposed to be a jitter bird. Yeah. Uh, possibly the boy needs a change from diet. Uh, what have you been feeding him this time, not too inquisitive? Oh, well, you're not. Uh, we tried everything the books recommended. Uh, Cuddlebone, watercress, bacon, vegetables, apples. Have you tried Boyd seed? It, uh, Boyd seed? Uh, of course. Uh, he's gotten so fat on seeds, he keeps falling off his perch. Well, for falling off the porch, we carry a special padded bottom. Yeah. 
What have you got for birds who won't sing? Velvy have a number of remedies. Uh, he is Marble's Vobel Goggle, guaranteed to make the saddest canary a Pollyanna. Yes. That sounds good already. And uh, you also might try our Melody Restorer and Vistle Food. Yes. <laughs> it's revived more songs than Bing Crosby. Yes. And this is a positive sure cure. A bottle from Philharmonic Symphonic Tonic for chronic lack of harmonics. Yes. <laughs> Which one would you care to try? Well, lady, we're in this thing so deep, we might as well go the whole hog. Please, not in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we'll take all of them. Are you sure they'll work? Oh, any one of them would work. But if you put them all together, the boy will simply whistle you out of house and home. Oh, well, that's all we need to do then, eh? Oh, yes. Uh, but just to be on the safe side, you might try singing to him. Oh. But the idea is to get him to sing to us. That I understand. However, if you sing to him, it is only natural for him to show you how much better he can do. Oh, well, then we're all set. Three different kinds of medicine and also singing. <laughs> now we can't fail, can we? Oh, no, not a chance under the sun. Uh, but you might take along this card just to be on the safe side. A card? Uh, what's this? Oh, uh, Dr. D.J. Roller, bird physician. If everything else fails, let me put your birds in a Twitter. Let's all sing like the birdies sing. Tweet, 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 tweet. Come on, Napoleon, sing like Bing. Tweet, 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 tweet. If we wobble, then so can you. Eight bars to the beat. Now, Napoleon, do. Or you'll meet Waterloo. Tweet, 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 tweet. tweet. Well, come on, Napoleon, sing. Oh, I guess it's no use, Uncle. Yeah. Shall we try another song, Unc? Uh, what other song, Leroy? Uh, how about that old one, uh, Just a Bird in a Gilder Sleeve Cage? Yeah. Oh, oh, brother. Yes. Say, Uncle, are you sure none of those remedies we bought at the pet store will work? How can they? Napoleon keeps kicking him out of the cage. Oh, all except the gargle, he sits in that. <laughs> what about that bird doctor? Why don't you try him? Say, I'd forgotten all about him. Dr. Ruler. Yes, I'll take Napoleon there. And if I won't bring him back singing, I won't bring him back, period. Uh, oh, oh, excuse me. Is Dr. Roller in? Yes, uh, we are waiting for him, too. Uh, we? Yes, me and Butch. Yeah, but... See? Oh. Uh, Butch is a little Yorkshire cinnamon buff copy. Uh, what kind of you? Oh, uh, just a plain sawed-off yellow sulker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think a doctor will be long? <laughs> well, I don't think so. He's doing a plastic surgery operation. Is that so? A plastic surgery, eh? Uh, yes, it's a nose-straightening job on a parrot. Uh. <laughs> Well, I don't think I'll say that'll take all week. I... Oh, no. Uh... You may have our place. We're in no hurry. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm just about ready to give up canaries altogether. Oh, uh... I wouldn't do that if I were you. Oh. Perhaps you don't realize all the joys and fun of owning a lovely little feathered companion. Do you have fun out of Butch? Udo. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll be very sorry to part with him tomorrow, too. Oh, uh, is something coming between you? Oh, yes. My mother-in-law. Yeah. She's coming back, you'll say. A butcher's really hers, you'll say. Only she doesn't call him butch. She calls him a fluffy raffle. Uh, well, that's too bad. Uh, about her coming back. Oh, yes. And just when I had him trying so nicely. Uh, trying? Yes. A butch, you'll say, is a fighting canary. Oh, yeah. Now, don't say a word of this to my mother-in-law, but Butch has kicked the living daylights out of half the canaries on the north side of town. Oh, well, I never knew people matched canaries in battles. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Especially a lonesome men that people leave canaries with when they go away someplace. Yeah. It's a lot better than just sitting at home and listening to the darn thing singing, you know. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, but why are you bringing him in here? Uh, well, sir, uh, before my mother-in-law gets home, I'm having the doctor do a little work on him. You see, likely he's developed something of a cauliflower beak. It, oh, I, I think I understand. Uh, yeah. Patient, please. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, here we are, doctor. Just bring the cage in here. Yeah, uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, that's a nice bird you have there. Huh? What seems to be the trouble? Well, Doctor, it's something like this. Oh, oh, excuse me. There's a $5 consultation fee in advance. Oh, well, isn't that a lot for such a little bird? Mister, the smaller the patient, the more difficult to treat. Yes. Hummingbirds are $15 and ostriches are a dollar and a quarter. Oh. <laughs> I see your point. Uh, harder to hold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here you are. Thanks. Uh, now, once again, what seems to be the trouble? Well, it's very simple. This bird, our Napoleon, doesn't sing. Well, that's a common affliction. Hmm. Especially in this particular species of bird. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes of course. Uh, turn the cage around. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, no question about it. That's it, all right. Mm-hmm. Knew it the minute I saw it. Well, for goodness sakes, tell me, what is it? Uh, mister, as you should know and apparently don't, there are two separate and distinct kinds of canaries. Uh, there are? Yes. The one kind, happy, gay, carefree, singing practically all the time. Yes. Yeah. Then the other kind, sad, always worrying, busy and distracted, hardly ever letting out a peep. Well, this is all news to me. What are the names of these two different kinds of canaries? The kind that sings is called the male. The kind that doesn't sing is known as the female. Is that so? Yes. <laughs> and this Napoleon you have here isn't a Napoleon at all. He's a Josephine. Oh! <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, let me ask you housewives a question. What is it that makes the difference between the meals prepared by a good cook and just an ordinary one? Well, in this man's opinion, it's flavor. Yes, it's that appetite-satisfying extra flavor that good cooks give to the dishes they serve. That's why so many good cooks are using delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. They've discovered, you see, this important point. That because parquet is so delicious for table use... It adds flavor in cooking, too. The extra flavor that makes the difference between a good and an ordinary cook. Yes, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening for baking, not a bland, tasteless fat. Parquet is a delicious seasoning for hot vegetables, too. And because parquet tastes so good itself, it makes pan-fried foods taste better. And it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Now, just because you'll be proud to serve parquet margarine at the table, don't think it's extravagant to use all you want in cooking. It isn't. Even though parquet is wholesome, nourishing, and perfectly delicious, it's so economical you'll be pleasantly surprised. So join the good cooks using parquet margarine and buy a pound or two tomorrow. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. <laughs> Christmas list is getting me down. Cigars for Judge Hooker, a necktie for the mailman, and then for Birdie. Let's see. Oh, Uncle Mort. Uh, what is it, Marjorie? Have you thought of anything to give Birdie for Christmas? Oh, yes, you bet I have. Good. What is it? Josephine. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randall. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>